There was a bloody mist and a blood sea. Destroyed weapons and banners were lying on the ground, and everything was covered in blood. One soldier, who was about to lose his consciousness, was telling his comrade to hurry and escape. The man he was looking at had a lot of weapons pierced in his body, but he still remained standing and he told a boy that the human race must survive, so he should save himself and escape. In the end, only one person was left in the battle. He was facing a lot of beasts, and the one with dragon wings told him that even the human martial gods were so weak. Therefore, he who didn't even know martial arts could only hide like useless waste. It was the demon emperor, Asura, and he asked the man standing below him, the pill emperor, King Feng, if he wished to fight him. King Feng gritted his teeth as Asura applied martial pressure to him. Tears were falling down his face as he said that he spent 100,000 years of his life as the Pill Emperor, but he couldn't even enter the first realm of martial arts. He took a step forward and said that he was only destined to helplessly watch his comrades fight that bloody battle. King Feng took a pill. A fiery aura surged out of him as he went into a stance and accepted his fate. King Feng charged forward and declared that he would put his life on stake to fight the beasts in front of him. King Feng jumped off the ground and directly went to attack Asura, and he declared that he would battle till the end. But in just a flash, King Feng was hit with a powerful force, and he thought that it was over. Asura's hand was filled with blood as he created a hole in King Feng's chest, and as King Feng fell into the ground, he thought that his body was already useless and he couldn't even refine pills, so there was no point in struggling anymore because, in the end, he turned out to be just a weakling. As he was losing his consciousness, King Feng thought that if he could start over in the next life, he would cultivate both pill refinement and martial arts, and he would conquer the heavens and reach the pinnacle of martial arts. Suddenly, his jade pendant broke. King Feng woke up extremely confused. His body was filled with bandages, and as King Feng looked around, he wondered where he was. Suddenly, he saw the jade pendant that was now intact. Memories came flooding into King Feng and his head hurt. While still struggling with the headache, King Feng realized that he must have been reincarnated, and he was currently at the time when he got crippled by Lin Xuan 10,000 years ago. Remembering his bloody state as he was asking Lin Xuan why she would attack him when he was her fiancé, and he had already won. Lin Xuan approached King Feng, and she told him that she only agreed to their marriage so she could rely on his family. But since she had joined the Moon Shacking Immortal Palace, which was one of the three major sects, she didn't need him anymore. Lin Xuan smiled cunningly at King Feng, and she asked him if he really thought that he was worthy of her. Pain and despair filled King Feng's eyes. Back into the present, King Feng meditated as he recalled that in his previous life, he settled for pill refinement after having his martial arts crippled, and he reached the pinnacle of pill refinement, yet he was still lacking a lot in martial arts. King Feng clenched his fist, and he thought that if only he could cultivate martial arts, he would have stopped the disaster of the demon clan invading the divine continent, and of course, the human race wouldn't have perished. King Feng looked at his jade pendant, and he thought that he had the chance to start all over again, thanks to that jade token. King Feng started to get dressed, and he thought that in that life, in order to stop the disaster, whether it was pill refinement or martial arts, he would achieve its pinnacle. Suddenly, a man was in a hurry as he called King Feng, and he told him that there was big trouble, so King Feng asked him what happened. The man was Kin Sangui, head of guards in the Kin family, and he was at the ninth level of Kai and blood cultivation. He told King Feng that Lin Lang broke into the medicine garden as he wanted to see him, and King Feng recognized that Lin Lang was Lin Xuan's brother. King Feng remembered that in his past life, Lin Lang came to take control over the medicine garden and humiliated him, and that made him really furious as the Lin family were a bunch of low-life snakes and rats. King Feng asked Kin Sangui to take him there, but Kin Sangui told him that Lin Lang was known for his sharp tongue, so he suggested that he handle him, but King Feng told him that there was no need as he got it. Meanwhile, at the medicinal garden, Lin Lang was calling King Feng a useless piece of shit, accusing him of being afraid of showing up and demanding that he hand the medicine garden to him as a P. Lin Lang, who was a first-rank alchemist, told King Feng that since his sister was in the moon-shaking immortal palace, if he didn't do as he said and listen carefully, kneeling and begging wouldn't do him any good. But King Feng confidently asked Lin Lang if he was a siskin, as he dared to take pride in a sister who uses underhanded tricks in a competition. Lin Lang was extremely surprised by what King Feng said. King Feng told Lin Lang that the Lin family got the medicine garden thanks to the marriage contract back then. But since he and Lin Xuan were not engaged anymore, he asked Lin Lang how on earth he thought that he would give it back to him. King Feng looked at Lin Lang condescendingly, 
and he told him that he was so shameless. Lin Lang trembled in anger, but he couldn't refute what King Feng said, and as the guards and Kin Sangui laughed at him, Lin Lang wondered why King Feng was so sharp-tongued that day. Lin Lang tried to compose himself as he told King Feng that he got defeated in the competition because he was no match for his sister, and if it weren't for his little sister honoring the engagement, he would have died a long time ago. Lin Lang told King Feng that he should have been grateful to Lin Xuan, but King Feng simply dismissed Lin Lang's refutation by telling him that he was always bragging about his sister, asking him if he was a siskin pervert, and that made Lin Lang tremble in anger. King Feng said that it looked like the Qin family's enforcement team had work to do, and immediately, the guards pointed their weapons at Lin Lang and his servant who were both surprised. As Lin Lang told King Feng to wait and reminded him that there was only one month left to collect the spirit medicine from the Qin family headquarters, he cursed in his mind, thinking that King Feng was usually so impulsive, so he wondered why it was so difficult to deal with King Feng that day. King Feng yawned as he told Lin Lang that he didn't care about it, and Lin Lang, who was containing his anger, asked King Feng if he was willing to make a bet with him. Lin Lang dared King Feng that if he managed to complete that year's collection target of spirit medicine, he would hand over his family's iron mine. But if not, he would get the medicine garden. Kin Sangui laughed silently as he thought that anyone with a bit of sanity wouldn't agree to that deal because a mere iron mine couldn't be exchanged for their medicine garden. But King Feng readily agreed and even suggested writing the deal down. Kin Sangui's eyes widened as he wondered how King Feng could agree just like that. On the other hand, Lin Lang looked a bit confused, but he was delighted, declaring that King Feng would regret that later on. As they put the deal into writing, King Feng laughed in his mind as he thought that it was as he expected. That Lin Lang was the same idiot useless waste as he provoked him so easily. Lin Lang happily walked away, telling King Feng that the medicine garden wasn't for someone like him to run, so he shouldn't beg for mercy when the time comes. And Kin Sangui was distressed, thinking that it was over for them as they gave the medicine garden away for nothing. Kin Sangui turned away, and he said that doing extra hazardous business was a grown-up task. But mentally, King Feng was still a child. But King Feng smiled with the smile of a 100,000 years old child when he heard what Kin Sangui said and he said that Lin Lang better not kneel and call him big brother. After some time, King Feng was meditating, and he coughed up blood. Wiping the blood off his mouth, King Feng smiled, and he thought that although his cultivation level was down to ninth Kai, in blood, thanks to cultivating the divine transformation art, he finally got over the Kai and blood. Martial arts have six realms, and Kai and blood were the lowest realm, followed by the body tempering realm. Grand Master Realm, Void Realm, Divine Realm, and finally, the God Realm. Each realm had nine levels, and King Feng recalled that in his previous life, he lost his cultivation base because of Lin Xuan's trick, so he couldn't practice martial arts ever since. Fortunately, King Feng preserved his cultivation base using the Divine Transformation Art, which was a unique technique he discovered in his previous life that enhanced the perception of the six senses, so he regained his cultivation base, and even though the Divine Transformation Art looked mundane, those who practiced it in King Feng's previous life all became prominent figures because he discovered the hidden power that lay beneath its mundane appearance. Although he couldn't cultivate it in his previous life, King Feng kept it in his mind, but he never thought he would be using it. Suddenly, Kin Sangui was in a hurry, and he called King Feng, saying that something bad had happened. A few moments later, King Feng was at the medicine garden inspecting the herbs and Kin Sangui was telling him that earlier. News came in that the collection time for that year had been moved up by half a month, so the enforcers would arrive in 10 days. Kin Sangui said that for some reason, all the herbs in the garden had withered, so they couldn't hand the herbs over like that even though they had enough time. Kin Sangui told King Feng that they couldn't harvest the herbs even if they were given more time. But to his surprise, King Feng was unfazed by his news and immediately used a magical technique. King Feng used the Eye of the Six to open his eyes. King Feng saw that there were evil spirit grasses beneath the sky snare fruit, so it was no wonder that the herbs had withered. But he wondered how they ended up there in the medicine garden. King Feng immediately thought that the only one who could have planted the evil grass there was Lin Lang. So, it now made sense that Lin Lang set up the bet with great confidence because he had tampered with the medicine garden during the collection. Instead of being furious, King Feng grinned, and he said that it was fine because Lin Lang had given him such a nice gift. 
Ten days later, the Qin family's enforcers were on their way for the collection, and Lin Lang was with them, asking where King Feng was and why he wasn't there to greet the enforcers. Qin Sangui knelt in front of them, trembling as one of the enforcers loomed over him, and he requested the enforcer to wait a moment as King Feng would be with him shortly. Suddenly, someone asked what the rush was when he had already come, and it was King Feng saying that it was still early in the morning and his rooster hadn't laid its eggs yet, so he didn't know what the rush was. Lin Lang egged on the enforcer's temper as he said that not only did King Feng not kneel before the enforcers, but he also dared to speak back, so it was nothing but disrespect. Kin Yulong, the Kin family's enforcer, got mad, but he told King Feng that he would give him a chance to apologize and kneel down before him. Kin Sangui and the guards kneeled on the ground, and they requested that Kin Yulang calm down. Kin Sangui told King Feng to apologize and kneel quickly because the last time they had angered the enforcer, the medicine garden had been punished for three years. But King Feng confidently gave Kin Yulang the middle finger and told him to piss off, as he would not kneel to him. Both Lin Lang and Kin Yulang were affected and pissed off by the piss-off technique, while Kin Sangui had tears in his eyes and was extremely surprised. Kin Sangui lost his soul when King Feng told Kin Yulang to just do his job because he was just a mere employee trying to act like an official who had no power over him, so he should stop that nonsense already. Kin Yulang got angrier, telling King Feng to watch his mouth, and he asked him if his arrogant attitude meant that he was able to meet that year's collection standards. King Feng said that everything was ready in accordance with last year's agreement, but Kin Yulang mocked him. Kin Yulang asked King Feng, who told him that the agreement would be the same that year, and as he informed King Feng that that year, they doubled the collection. He asked him if he didn't know. Kin Yulong threatened King Feng that if he couldn't meet the standards that day, his head would be the price. Kin Sangui was nervous as they couldn't even meet the previous standard, but now it was double the amount, and he thought that they didn't just lose the bet, King Feng's head was also at stake. Meanwhile, Lin Lang smirked as he thought that, of course, King Feng didn't expect him to arrange things out with Kin Yulang who holds a grudge against him. Lin Lang struck a deal with Kin Yulang that, as long as King Feng lost the bet, they would share the medicine garden 50 over 50, to which Kin Yulang agreed. Lin Lang smiled evilly as he remembered the reports he got about King Feng making a mess in the medicine garden, and he wondered what an ignorant brat like King Feng could achieve. But King Feng was unfazed, he just smirked when he heard that Kin Yulang was demanding double, and he asked them to follow him. King Feng led the way, and Kin Sangui nervously followed him, while Lin Lang and Kin Yulang followed him, thinking that he was finished. Lin Lang passed by the rotten herbs, and he was confused when he noticed them. Lin Lang laughed. He asked King Feng if that was the sky snare fruit that he grew and pointed out that it was as rotten as he was, while Kin Yulang told King Feng that he was bold for trying to deceive the main family with that trash, and since they were both from the Kin family, he would execute him there and now on behalf of the main family, and he was going to enjoy it. But King Feng blocked Kin Yulang's sword, and he told them that trash only sees trash. He pointed at the part of the garden that was filled with healthy sky snare fruit and told them to look over there and open their eyes. Healthy fruits and herbs filled that part of the garden. Lin Lang couldn't believe what was happening, as he knew that King Feng was not familiar with spiritual medicine, so he wondered how King Feng could control spiritual medicine of that quality when the liang grass he left behind was still there. King Yulang also couldn't believe what he was seeing, so much so that he lost his balance because the quality of the medicinal herbs was very good, and they were all top-notch, which was the quality that exactly matched the standards. In addition, the production was likely to be more than five times, so he wondered if he was seeing a ghost. Meanwhile, Kin Sangui looked so proud of King Feng, and he thought that it had been a few days since he saw him, so he wondered how King Feng managed to take care of the medicinal garden so well. Lin Lang threw a tantrum and asked King Feng how it was possible for him to take care of the medicinal garden so well. King Feng knew that the liang grass belonged to Yang, so if it was planted among the yin herbs, they would naturally wither. But no one in that era knew that as long as the liang grass was grown in a place where there was no direct sunlight, and with some formations, it could accelerate the growth of medicinal herbs. King Feng loomed over Lin Lang and told him not to worry about how he did it. Instead, he should get ready to take a gamble and accept defeat, and he asked if the iron ore would be delivered immediately. But Lin Lang said that he definitely wouldn't, and he taunted King Feng by asking what he was going to do with him in that case. King Feng proudly showed Lin Lang the document of their deal, saying that everything was written in black and white, so if he didn't deliver the iron ore, he would have to eat prison food for the rest of his life, which made Lin Lang curse in his mind, as he forgot that he signed the agreement, and he realized that he fell into the trap. 
Lin Lang turned to Kin Yulan, asking for help, but Kin Yulang wanted no part of it and told him that the bet he made had nothing to do with him as he was just passing by. Lin Lang coughed up blood as he said that he didn't want to accept. A few moments later, at the mine, King Feng was laughing, and he told his men that they should thank Lin Lang for giving them iron ore. Suddenly, someone told King Feng that his ability to win the iron mine was really great, but he said that he didn't understand why King Feng decided to risk the precious medicine field to earn an iron mine that wasn't worth it, so he wondered if there were long-term plans and calculations behind it. The one who asked was Kin Sangui, and he was so surprised when King Feng laughed and told him that it was nothing but a rush moment at the time. King Feng knew that an iron mine in a medicine field could not be compared at all, but in his previous life, he knew that the mine was not an ordinary one. It contained precious magical steel ore, so if he could use it, its value wouldn't be inferior to the medicinal field, but he didn't tell Kin Sangui that. Suddenly, one of the guards came running to King Feng, telling him that there was bad news and that there was a problem at the front mine site. The guard said that the iron mine suddenly collapsed, causing a number of miners to die there, and Kin Sangui was surprised, but King Feng seemed to be calm. Outside the cave, the families of the miners were grieving. King Feng was assessing the situation while Kin Sangui was in a panic questioning why the mine was destroyed as soon as they took over the management and saying that fate indeed wasn't kind to them. The workers' families quickly turned to blame the collapse on the Qin family. They said that the iron mine belonged to the Lin family, but King Feng decided to take it by force, so he angered the mountain god, which caused the crash. They all charged at King Feng, angry and demanding for him to give their family back. Qin Sangui was terrified, and he told King Feng that the place was very dangerous, and they should leave quickly. But King Feng told him that it wasn't possible, and he was thinking that it was such an incredible coincidence that there was a collapse immediately after they took over the management. While his guards were blocking the miners' families, he stood in front of the cave and used his impossibility spell hack. Inside the cave, King Feng saw that the miners were lying on the ground. King Feng found out that none of the miners inside were dead, and among the visible effects, it was evident that what happened wasn't a complete collapse of the mine. It was just a collapse at the entrance to the cave, which was clearly a result of a manual explosion. King Feng looked around. He saw Lin Lang watching them behind the rocks with an evil smile on his face, and almost immediately, King Feng knew that when he won the bet, Lin Lang blew the iron mine and hoped that anger would flare up against him over the deaths of the miners. King Feng thought that it was indeed a transgression of morals, and he yelled and told everyone around him to shut up. He urged everyone to listen. He told them that the workers inside were still alive, and once they removed the rocks from the entrance, they could rescue them. But they couldn't miss the best chance to save them, so they should save them all immediately. But the family of the workers said that what King Feng was saying was nonsense because the entire cave had collapsed, so it was not possible for the people inside to be alive. They claimed that King Feng was doing nothing but deceiving them, so he should die. Meanwhile, Lin Lang was laughing hysterically as he said that the situation had been settled as King Feng was going to die, and his companion agreed, saying that King Feng was really stupid. The family of the workers were all enraged, and they were charging towards King Feng. Kin Sangui and the guards who were stopping them told King Feng that he had to leave immediately because people were rushing in and they were really going to kill him. King Feng said nothing as he looked at the commotion below him. Everyone was surprised when King Feng ordered the Kin family members to stop resisting the family of the workers and asked that they should give them weapons. The families of the workers were moved when King Feng asked them what they would do if they had the chance to save their loved ones. With a determined look on his face, King Feng asked them if they really wanted to give up, and he swore by his life that the miners were in. As he stepped off the rock he was standing on, King Feng said that if the miners were found dead after digging, they could punish him. He offered his weapon to them and sincerely said that they should deal with the problem together. The families of the workers hesitated for a moment, and they said nothing as they looked at each other. While Kin Sangui was crying, telling King Feng that he couldn't die, the families of the workers discussed whether they should trust King Feng, and they decided to do so in the hopes that their family was still really alive. Everyone hurried up to save their loved ones by digging and moving the stones, and the guards stepped up to help too. Meanwhile, King Feng ordered Kin Sangui to help him with something, which surprised Kin Sangui, and he wondered if King Feng was crazy as he asked him to do something in secret. On the other hand, Lin Lang was still observing everyone from a distance, and he laughed evilly as he asked what would happen after they dug. Lin Feng grinned sinisterly as he thought Kin Feng would see the consequences for daring to speak arrogantly because he had already put an incurable swamp inside the mine tunnel. So even if the people inside were not crushed, they would still be poisoned to death. 
After two hours, the families of the workers were still digging. They finally dragged their way through the entrance, and they immediately called for their loved ones, asking where they were. To their surprise, the miners were all lying on the ground, unconscious, and they looked like they were dead. The families mourned, saying that King Feng lied to them and it was all his fault. Everyone was surprised when Lin Lang barged in, and he acted like he was in disbelief and pointed out that there were people bragging earlier. Lin Lang said that since promises had not been kept, some people should pay the price with their lives, and it triggered the families to pick up their weapons and agree with him, saying that King Feng should pay with his life. Lin Lang grinned as he saw King Feng with his guards that were carrying the miners' bodies, and he laughed in his mind as he knew that King Feng suspected that he did it. But without evidence to convict him, no matter how hard he searched, he couldn't prove that he had anything to do with what happened. Lin Lang thought that King Feng must have been afraid and would run home for his life, but to his surprise, King Feng didn't run away, and he even dared to go next to the corpses, instructing Kin Sangui. King Feng was chewing sky snare fruit, and he was ordering Kin Sangui to put the chaff in the miner's mouth quickly, praising him for doing a good job. Kin Sangui looked horrified when King Feng told him that he could use his mouth if he couldn't stuff the fruit, but he still agreed. Kin Sangui went ahead and stuffed the fruit into one of the miner's mouths using his mouth, and Lin Lang was so surprised wondering if King Feng had gone mad and was venting his anger on the dead bodies. Lin Lang said that some people took out their anger on the dead when they were on the verge of death. He offered to help the families close the entrance, so he urged them to go ahead, and the families were now enraged, determined to kill King Feng for daring to insult their family. On the other hand, King Feng was still chewing on the fruit and stuffing them in the miner's mouth while he told Kin Sangui not to be afraid and just continue what he was doing. Kin Sangui was crying as he wondered if they were really not flirting with the dead by what they were doing, and he was complaining in his mind that it was his first kill. Suddenly, one of the miners woke up. The miner blushed as he sat up, wondering how he slept, and he said that it looked like he had a romantic dream. Everyone, including Kin Sangui, was so surprised that they couldn't help but exclaim that the dead came back to life. The miner's name was Zion Gong, and his family immediately approached him with tears in their eyes saying that they were glad that he was still alive, as they almost thought he was dead. King Feng wiped the sweat off his face as he asked the families who said that the miners were dead, and King Feng thought that swamp was an incurable condition that was very toxic at present. However, as long as one immediately ate the fresh peel of the sky snare fruit, it could be cured. Therefore, King Feng told Kin Sangui to go home to get the fruit and make the miners eat it, but in that era, he was the only one who knew about that remedy. King Feng approached Zion Gong and asked him how he had got poisoned and passed out, but Zion Gong was still confused as he was surprised that someone fainted. But Zion Gong quickly remembered that it was Lin Lang who blew up the mine entrance, locking them inside the cave, and he said that after that, Lin Lang was afraid that they would run away, so he released swamp poison gas to try to kill them, and he was so evil. Lin Lang was surprised when each of the miners agreed and pointed at him, saying that it was him who did those things. King Feng acted surprised, saying that he didn't expect it to be Lin Lang, and as he pointed out that the truth was finally revealed, he urged everyone to seek revenge on those who have wronged them and bring justice to those who have been wronged. Lin Lang and his companion were both horrified as the people started surrounding them, and he peed himself as he asked them what they wanted to do. Lin Lang's scream could be heard outside the mines, and the birds around the mine flew away as they got startled by it. Inside the mine, Kin Sangui looked so confused as King Feng looked all over the place for something, saying that it was illogical as the thing he was looking for must have been there, so he asked how he could find it, and according to King Feng's previous memories, Lin Lang must have hidden the mysterious iron ore inside the iron mine, so he wondered how it could disappear. Suddenly, Zion Gong approached King Feng and thanked him for saving his life. King Feng was surprised when the miners and their families bowed down to him and told him that they would never forget his kindness. King Feng told them that they had worked so hard that day so they should close the mine for a few days because when they resumed work, he would need all of their help, to which the miners agreed, saying that as long as King Feng ordered it, they would serve him without hesitation. And King Feng remembered that in his past life, he didn't seem to be accepted by the townspeople. King Feng remembered to ask where Lin Lang was, to which Zion Gong told him that they had surrounded and beaten Lin Lang, and when his heinous deeds were exposed, everyone kicked him out of Shadow Cloud City. King Feng asked if Lin Lang had run away, and Zion Gong, while giggling mischievously, told him that Lin Lang did run away. 
but before Lin Lang left, he had shown him some affection, and King Feng thought that it seemed that Lin Lang had hidden the mysterious iron ore on purpose, so if they had known, they would have interrogated Lin Lang first about the location of the iron ore. As King Feng stepped out of the mines, Kin Sankui was already waiting for him with his horse and told him that since the mine had been settled, they could go back. King Feng was riding his horse when he remembered to ask Kin Sankui if he knew about the high interest loans in Shadow Cloud City, asking if he thought that it was terrifying. And Kin Sankui told him that he knew about that, saying that the high interest loans in Shadow Cloud City were known to be terrifying because borrowing money was easy but paying it back was hard. Imagining a horrible scenario, Kin Sankui said that if people couldn't pay their loans, the creditor would pillage their house and hurt them. But because of the very high interest rates, only desperate fools sought loans from those creditors. Kin Sankui asked King Feng why he was asking about it and jokingly asked to confirm if he wouldn't borrow from those creditors. But King Feng awkwardly laughed and said that he did borrow 500 gold coins, to which Kin Sankui laughed as he thought that King Feng was kidding him. But King Feng told him that he was serious. There was an exchange of awkward laughter until Kin Sankui was able to process the information and he was extremely surprised, saying that ordinary people only spent 20 gold coins a year, but King Feng borrowed 500 golds from those creditors. King Feng said that there was no other place where he could get the money to take care of the medicinal garden so well, and Kin Sankui told him that they were finished because the revenue they could get from their medicine garden was 100 gold coins at most, so there was no way they could pay back 500 gold. King Feng was deep in thought, as he originally thought that if he took the iron ore, he could use the mysterious iron ore to pay back the money. But since Lin Lang had escaped and the mysterious iron ore had not been found, he was thinking where he would get the money from. Meanwhile, a mysterious girl was observing behind King Feng and Kin Sankui while Kin Sankui was in a panic, saying that it was over for them because if the creditors found their medicinal garden, they would be ransacked and they would all be finished. A few moments later, while King Feng was still riding on his horse, someone was laughing and calling him Dear Feng. It was Kin Wanli, the guardian of Shadow Cloud City and King Feng's father. He looked so happy as he told King Feng that he hadn't seen him for a long time that he felt like a different person. And as he asked King Feng if he had recovered from his injuries, King Feng was surprised, asking Kin Wanli when he had come back. Kin Sankui tried to report to Kin Wanli that King Feng borrowed from the creditors, but King Feng covered his mouth and ordered him to be silent in a whispering manner. King Feng thought that in his previous life, Kin Wanli worked so hard for him all his life that he even fought to the death. So in his current life, he would never let his father worry about him again, and he would never let his father suffer again. Kin Wanli asked King Feng if his body was okay, and he told him not to worry because when he came out, he spent a fortune to buy two pills for him to get well, and thanks to those pills, he would definitely be able to restore his cultivation. Kin Wanli grabbed King Feng's arm as he told him that he was waiting, asking him how his cultivation level had fallen to the first level of Kai and blood, and King Feng told him not to worry because he would explain everything when they got home. A few moments later, Kin Wanli and King Feng were already home, and Kin Wanli was confirming with King Feng that what he was saying was that he had trained under a master alchemist. Kin Wanli looked excited as he asked King Feng if he could actually be an alchemist, which King Feng confirmed and said that his master told him that he was an unparalleled alchemy genius. Kin Wanli laughed as he said that he had always known that King Feng was a naturally gifted genius, so no one could destroy his future, and he asked where the master lived because he must visit him. King Feng told Kin Wanli that his master didn't like meeting strangers and preferred to keep his existence a secret, to which Kin Wanli said that it was logical as most experts didn't like meeting people. And King Feng was thinking that although it was not right to deceive Kin Wanli, he couldn't explain his sudden knowledge of medicine, so it was best to create a story about an alchemy master to put Kin Wanli's mind at rest. Kin Wanli remembered something and he told King Feng that he had to go again soon while reaching into his pockets. Kin Wanli handed him an item and instructed him to keep it because, in the future, if he was not by his side when he encountered any dangerous situation that he couldn't handle, he could use it. King Feng quickly recognized that it was the Kin family's battle matter, and he was surprised that Kin Wanli entrusted him with such an important thing. Kin Wanli told King Feng that although they hadn't seen each other for a long time, he had to leave again so he would leave their family in his hands, and King Feng reassured Kin Wanli that he understood him. Kin Wanli patted King Feng on the head while King Feng thought that Kin Wanli had entrusted him with such an important matter, the Kin family's battle, so with that level of confidence, he definitely wouldn't let his dad down. 
The next day, at the medicinal garden, someone was calling for King Feng, and it seemed urgent. It was Kin Sangui, and he informed King Feng that there were people out there who wanted to see him, which he suspected were the high-interest lenders, and King Feng panicked as he didn't expect them to be that fast. While he nervously dressed up, King Feng instructed Kin Sangui to quickly order all the guards in the medicinal garden to take up their positions and guard the entrance, to which Kin Sangui agreed. King Feng thought that it was the day of the deadline to pay the high-interest loan, and just yesterday he wanted to borrow money from his parents. But they used the money to buy him a cooling pill, and he had already spent most of his money. Someone was knocking on the door as King Feng arrived, and he thought that if he couldn't repay the money, debt collectors would come to seize their house. The guards were standing ready by the door as King Feng gave orders to open it. King Feng was thinking of preparing for a desperate battle. But to King Feng and Kin Sangui's surprise, standing in front of them was not an intimidating person, and the person even greeted them politely. It was a beautiful girl, and as King Feng wondered if she was there to collect debt and if there was a debt collector as attractive as her, she introduced herself as An Houchen, stating that she was there to thank King Feng for saving her life. An Houchen was a girl who disguised herself as a man in the mine, so when King Feng asked her if she was not there to collect debt, An Houchen said that she was not there to collect debt as she was a miner and she was one of the men who King Feng rescued in the mine the other day. King Feng pretended that he believed that An Houchen was a man, but as he saw her big chest, he questioned if those were muscles, and he wondered why that girl was interested in him. Horror filled King Feng's face when he remembered that An Houchen was the only worker he fed with his mouth. Remembering what he did, King Feng wondered if he took advantage of An Houchen's innocence by accident. King Feng waved off the guards, including Kin Sangui, and said that they should all step back, to which they hesitantly agreed. As King Feng asked An Houchen if she came to repay the favor, he was thinking that her repaying the favor didn't mean offering herself, as he had unfulfilled ambitions and he was not ready for marriage yet. An Houchen told him that to repay the favor by saving her life, she could tell him where the dark iron mine Xu Wenti was located, and King Feng was surprised, so he asked her how she knew where the dark mine was when she was unconscious at that time, and he also asked her how she knew that he wanted the dark iron mine. An Houchen said that she didn't lose consciousness immediately because, at that time, she took a detoxification pill which made her more alert than others for a moment, so she heard Lin Lang mention the location of the dark iron mine Xu Wenti. King Feng looked excited as he grabbed An Houchen's hand, saying that they should forget about the dark iron mine at the moment, and he asked An Houchen if nobody taught her, and she learned to make detoxification pills by herself. An Houchen said yes, and she told King Feng that she studied on her own by reading books. King Feng looked amazed when he heard that An Houchen prepared the pill herself, and he thought that despite some flaws in the pills, An Houchen managed to figure out how to make them without a teacher, so she had a talent for becoming a chemistry expert. King Feng quickly asked An Houchen if she wanted to become a chemistry expert, but An Houchen hesitated, and she said that she came from a poor family, so she needed to support her parents, which is why she would be content to be an honest miner. King Feng told An Houchen that it was fine because her parents would trust him because he also had some knowledge of chemistry, so he could personally teach her how to become a chemistry expert. Consequently, all she needed to do was just follow him, and so he asked her if she would agree or not. King Feng grinned as he thought that in his previous life, he focused on chemistry, but in his current life, he wanted to develop self-defense skills, so he didn't have time for chemistry, so at the right time, he would take on an apprentice so he could free up time to train in martial arts. King Feng was being manipulative and unscrupulous when he told An Houchen that her parents would trust him because he was just thinking about taking care of workers. He told her that hand in hand, he would teach her, but he was just thinking about training workers. And lastly, King Feng told An Houchen that she just needed to follow him, but he was just thinking that a loyal worker won't jump. On the other hand, An Houchen completely misunderstood when King Feng said that her parents would trust him, and she took it as him saying that they would become one family, him saying that he would teach her step by step, and she took it as him saying that they would be in sweet double cultivation with Dan Companion, and lastly, him saying that she just needed to follow him as him asking her to marry him. So An Houchen blushed as she concluded that King Feng wanted to marry her, so she stuttered as she took him on his offer. King Feng laughed as he told An Houchen that in that case, she must study hard from that day forward. Thinking that he had found a good worker, on the other hand, An Houchen was blushing as she agreed, thinking that she had found a good teacher. After a few days in the city of Fengaming, Kin Sangui was following King Feng, 
asking him how much they intended to sell the Dark Iron Mine in Fanaming City. And King Feng told him that they shouldn't sell too much because they intended to sell the Dark Iron Mine primarily to repay the high interest loan. King Feng raised his index finger and said that they would sell that amount, and Kin Sankui, along with the guards, were surprised that they were selling for 1,000 gold. Kin Sankui looked worried, but he said that although it was very little, Lin Lang had hidden a lot of dark iron mines, so if they found some generous shop owners, they could sell them, to which the other guards agreed. But King Feng told Kin Sankui that he was wrong because he meant that they should sell the dark iron mine for a minimum of 10,000 gold because, in the past few days, they had been relying on the dark iron mine they found, but they still needed to repay at least 10,000 gold at the moment. Kin Sankui was surprised, as 10,000 gold was too much, and the guards were also surprised, questioning who would buy a black iron mine with 10,000 gold because the mine was worth at most a thousand gold. So as they wondered how they could manage to repay the debt, they concluded that they were at a dead end. But King Feng told them not to worry because the black iron mine couldn't go unsold. King Feng confidently told his guards to trust him while he thought that the current batch of dark iron mine was made with his and Anne Houchen's effort over several days so it was not a shoddy commodity, and he was not saying it lightly. Remembering their efforts, King Feng was so confident that people would want to get his black iron mine. But a few moments later, King Feng was petrified when a merchant questioned his price of 10,000 gold and told him that he wouldn't pay him more than 100 gold for his dark iron mine. Some time later, at Chang Feng, the largest store in the city, a merchant was saying that everyone knew that black iron ore was precious and transparent like gemstones, and he looked disappointed as he inspected a really black rock, reprimanding the person who dared to claim that it was black iron ore and saying that he was not a three-year-old child. The merchant was talking to King Feng, who confidently claimed that the merchant didn't understand that what he was holding was a black iron ore. But the merchant argued, saying that those couldn't compare to his Yin Guang stones, so if King Feng's stone was indeed a black iron ore, he would raise his head and bow to him with both hands. And as the two of them were about to compare ores, someone told them that it was enough arguing as Shang Feng was a place for trade. It was Jiao Zhanju, the Shang Feng store owner, and he asked what was going on there. The merchant quickly told Jiao Zhanju that King Feng and his men tried to sell them fake ore. And when he said that he wouldn't buy it, King Feng even became aggressive. King Feng and Kin Sankui were kicked out of the store, and as they stood in front of the door, Jiao Zhanju told them that they wouldn't accept fake goods in Shang Feng. King Feng snatched a broadsword from one of his guards, and he was so enraged that the merchant dared to say that his black iron mine was fake and worthless. He was ready to charge into the Shang Feng store, but Kin Sankui stopped him because Jiao Zhanju had a powerful background, so they couldn't get involved with him. King Feng calmed down when he realized that the power behind Jiao Zhanju was no less than their family, and Kin Sankui was relieved. But King Feng thought that Rohan Jiangguo needed that batch of material, so if they went elsewhere, they wouldn't be able to pay off the debt in time. Meanwhile, inside the Shang Fan, Jiao Zhanju instructed the merchant that if he encountered those swindlers in the future, he should just drive them away because arguing with them would only diminish their presence to which the merchant agreed. Suddenly, Jiao Zhanju noticed the black rock on the shelf, so he asked the merchant why it was there when it was dirty, and the merchant told him that it was the black iron ore from King Feng, which he forgot to get rid of. Jiao Zhanju asked the merchant if it was a kind of black iron ore mine, and the merchant confirmed, saying that the ordinary black iron ore was crystal clear. But King Feng wanted to sell him that shoddy rock for 10,000 gold, thinking that he was a fool. Suddenly, the black iron ore in Jiao Zhanju's hands cracked. A bright light shined through its cracks. The light shone brightly, and Jiao Zhanju was taken aback. The merchant was surprised that it lit up as well. He said that he never heard that black iron ore lights up, so as he called King Feng a charlatan. He said that King Feng must be reckless. To the merchant's surprise, Jiao Zhanju was so enraged that he punched him and reprimanded him for daring to offend the wrong person. The merchant asked Jiao Zhanju what he was doing, and Jiao Zhanju told him that it was over because he offended an old man. He dragged the merchant by his foot, telling him to come with him so he could apologize to the old man in the hopes that they could rectify the situation. On the other hand, King Feng and his men were traveling in the mountains when Kin Sankui asked him if he really accepted one of the strongest chemists as his mentor because he felt like he messed up on refining the current batch of black iron ore. Kin Sankui said that they even priced the black iron ore high, so he felt like they wouldn't be able to sell it to 10 stores at the moment, to which the guard chimed in, suggesting that they sell it at a low price, and King Feng admitted that perhaps his refining techniques were very advanced. 
Suddenly, Jiao Zhanju was running from behind, dragging the merchant, and asking King Feng to wait a moment because he would buy all his black iron ore from the armory. King Feng was surprised that Jiao Zhanju would buy it all, and he said that he estimated that the batch would be worth 10,000 gold. But Jiao Zhanju was insistent that he would buy it all as he already brought the money for him and that there was just a misunderstanding earlier. King Feng smirked, and he told Jiao Zhanju that he knew his stuff. Tin Sangui, along with the guards, rejoiced that their goods were already bought and that the current batch of goods was really in demand and was not just an illusion. Kin Sangui and the guards were quick to urge King Feng to sell the black iron ores quickly, but King Feng smiled and apologized to Jiao Zhanju, saying that the black iron ores were no longer for sale. Jiao Zhanju asked why he wouldn't sell them, and King Feng told him that he wanted to sell them earlier. But the current batch doesn't need buyers because the merchant from earlier just made him and his subordinates a bit embarrassed, so his subordinates won't let him sell the black iron ores at the moment. Kin Sangui and the guards were crushed by King Feng's words, as they thought that they would love to sell them all and that it was only natural to blame King Feng for not selling them when the goods were in demand. On the other hand, Jiao Zhanju was scolding the merchant, calling him a fool and saying that he should blame himself for attacking King Feng, so he should apologize quickly. But the merchant insisted that they were fake, so he wouldn't apologize, and Jiao Zhanju scolded him again for daring to claim that the black iron ores were fake, questioning if he was blind. Jiao Zhanju explained that ordinary black iron ore was transparent and sparkling like a gem because it contained more impurities, making it difficult to get rid of them, which created the illusion that black iron ore was like a gem. He said that in reality, the purer the black iron ore, the darker its color, and when black iron ore was filled with aura, it could emit light. So since the black iron ore owned by King Fen was dark, shiny, and was emitting a strong light, it was a high-quality product among high-quality goods. The merchant, along with Kin Sangui and the guards, were surprised that the black iron ore they were calling useless was a high-quality product. Jiao Zhanju thought that since the black iron ore was duplicated to that level, there must be a chemist with deep understanding behind King Feng. King Feng was the chemist with deep understanding, and he was proud because, after all, the current batch of black iron ore was refined by An Haochen using techniques from 10,000 years in the future. But he wondered who made Jiao Zhanju aware and that they shouldn't blame him for raising the price afterward. King Feng told Jiao Zhanju that there was no need to apologize because the merchant, his assistant, only did it for the sake of the shop. With a sinister grin, King Feng recalled that the merchant told him earlier that if the goods they had were real, he would kneel to him. But seeing that the merchant was not willing to do so, King Feng slyly said that he wouldn't object at all, and Jiao Zhanju was alarmed. Jiao Zhanju clenched his fist, and the merchant tried to run away. Jiao Zhanju hit the merchant so hard that his head hit the ground. He called him a fool, and told him that he should kneel when he told him to kneel. The merchant's head was planted on the ground, looking like he was bowing, and he said that he felt wronged. On the other hand, Jiao Zhanju was trying to appease King Feng, saying that his subordinates wouldn't be angry anymore because, to compensate them further, he would buy their goods for 30,000, and King Feng agreed, saying that he would lose just a little because the main thing was to save Jiao Zhanju. Jiao Zhanju was ecstatic as he told King Feng that he was truly generous while suggesting to King Feng that the next time he should sell his goods to him. Upon hearing what Jiao Zhanju said, Kin Sangui, along with the other guards, were surprised as they didn't think that selling those goods for 30,000 was at a loss. So they realized that it was how to make money, and one of the guards thought that his three views had collapsed, so he wanted to go back home. With the money in his hands, King Feng grinned as he said that they currently had the money, and that even after paying off the debt, they would have plenty left. Kin Sangui and the guards rejoiced when King Feng declared that they would go on a shopping spree, while King Feng thought that there were things they needed to buy on the path of development, and he was glad that he could finally spend with pride. In the depths of the night, Lin Lang was kneeling in front of his master, telling him that he had been subjected to bullying by the traitor King Feng, so he must help him seek justice. Lin Lang coughed, and he said that King Feng had falsely accused him and publicly beat him, causing him to be truly desperate. Lin Lang's master was surprised, and he couldn't believe that King Feng, who was a scoundrel in his eyes, dared to do such a thing. Lin Lang acted desperate, and he told his master that King Feng was currently in the city of Fengaming. Lin Lang's master told him not to worry because King Feng was just a traitor, so there was no way he would stand idly by, and he declared that King Feng wouldn't live to see tomorrow. Lin Lang thanked his master as he grinned evilly in secret while wiping off the fake blood from his face, and he thought that they should see how King Feng would escape death at that time. 
A few moments later, at King Feng's house, he was on his bed, meditating. King Feng smiled as he thought that the body strengthening pills his father gave him were excellent, and along with the refining technique that allows him to transform into a deity, it enabled him to directly advance to the fifth level of kin and blood. He thought that it was very good because as he became stronger gradually, he would surely be able to change the course of his previous life. Suddenly, King Feng heard a noise coming from outside. He applied an aura to his eyes as he noticed that there was a sound from outside the house. He was able to see human figures outside his house, and he immediately knew that they were assassins. King Feng grinned as he thought that it was very late, so he didn't know who the guests were that had come at the moment, but he thought that it was a good opportunity to train and test his skills to see how much he had improved. On the other hand, one of the assassins outside told their companion to wait for him to enter inside and kill King Feng, as he would do it quickly. He declared that he would break the window first, and poke the window with a bamboo stem. The other assassin readied himself for the attack. But to their surprise, King Feng kicked the door from the inside, causing the door to open wide and showing himself in front of the assassins. King Feng greeted the two assassins a good evening and asked them what he could do for them. One of the assassins asked King Feng how he sensed them, and King Feng told him that he was felt both of them since they were came there, which made the other assassin ask King Feng if he was discovered their identity, so he decided to come out for them. But King Feng apologized to them and said that he was knew that they were killers, but he wasn't faced something like that in years, so he just wanted to fight both of them. One of the assassins laughed at the fact that King Feng was just at the fifth level of Kai, and blood, Yet he wanted to fight them, and the other assassin added that they always chase and kill others, so it was the first time someone came to their door seeking death. King Feng said that it was no problem for him, so they should just come because it was the first time in his life to engage in a real fight, and he thought that he hadn't been in any fight since his previous life, not for a thousand years, so he must fight those assassins because it was a good chance to test the result of his training during that period. One of the assassins laughed when they heard that it was King Feng's first time, he told his companion that he would die laughing, so he would leave King Feng to him, to which the other assassin agreed, saying that he would show King Feng the consequences of daring to fight assassins. The assassin got ready for the fight, and he told King Feng that he would pay with his life. King Feng said that he had learned his lesson while thinking that his goal in the battle was to test and improve his skills as soon as possible, so he must gain battle experience as much as he could. The assassin emitted an aura that looked like a bee as he told King Feng that he had a high level of Kai and blood and had killed at least 180 people at the fifth level of Kai, and blood. The other assassin was surprised that his companion was using a beasting attack, so he asked him if he was going to use his full power to deal with King Feng, and his companion told him that a lion fights an ant with all its might, so he would not underestimate King Feng. The assassin charged with his beasting attack, and he was at the eighth level of Kai and blood, so it was very strong. So his companion thought that he wouldn't watch what was about to happen because his brother was very strict, even though King Feng was at the fifth level of Kai and blood. One of the assassins said that even if King Feng was at the eighth level, he wouldn't be able to handle the beasting attack, so he would surely die. On the other hand, King Feng was thinking that he wouldn't escape because it was his first battle in 100,000 years, so he could only hope that he didn't suffer serious injuries. King Feng continued to hope that he didn't suffer serious injuries as he was about to deliver his punch at the assassin. King Feng's punch was so strong that the assassin was slammed to the ground, and he was not able to deliver his attack to King Feng. The assassin's mask broke, and he was unconscious, which surprised his companion, who tried to ask him what happened to him. King Feng looked so surprised as he stared at his fists, and he wondered if the assassin really died. King Feng asked the assassin if he could still speak, and upon seeing that there was no response, King Feng said that the assassin was just trying to deceive him because he just punched him with a regular punch, but he died instantly. When the other assassin heard what King Feng just said, he questioned if King Feng was really at the fifth level of Kai and blood because his companion died just from a simple punch. King Feng gave a cute smile and apologized to the other assassin for punching his companion so quickly so he didn't feel the fight. He asked if he could try fighting him too, and he said that he would do his best not to kill him. The assassin's eyes widened in surprise, and he wondered if King Feng was really human or a demon. He clenched his fist and called King Feng scum, and he said that for daring to kill his brother, he wouldn't leave King Feng alive. King Feng got intrigued, so he asked the assassin if he wanted to continue fighting for the sake of training. But the assassin fled and said that only 10 years wasn't enough time to seek revenge. King Feng said that there was no need to worry, as what the assassin just said didn't concern him at all, 
and he said that he never expected that his transformation technique would become such a powerful primary strength. King Feng looked determined as he thought that he must go and find out who sent those people to kill him. A few moments later, at the leader's palace in Fengaming City, King Feng jumped over the walls, and he thought that the killer just ran in that direction, so the mastermind behind his assassination may be nearby. Suddenly, someone with tattered clothes and bruises approached him from behind. It was the assassin who ran away earlier, and he got weapons impaled on his body. He begged King Feng to help him because the people in there wouldn't let him live. The assassin collapsed on the ground, and King Feng was surprised that he had died, and he wondered if he was the mastermind behind all that. Suddenly, there were men carrying torches, saying that one of the thieves broke into the house, so they must catch him and not let him escape. King Feng was surprised when the men immediately surrounded him. He was alarmed when he realized that he fell into a trap and that the men surrounding him were all at the eighth level of Kai and blood. Suddenly, a man called King Feng and said that even though he defeated them in Yunying City before, they were currently in Fengaming City. It was Lin Lang, and he asked King Feng if he was still trying to kill him. King Feng smiled as he was amused, and he asked Lin Lang if he was the one who sent people to kill him. But in his mind, he was already certain that Lin Lang was behind all that. Lin Lang acted like he didn't know what King Feng was talking about, and he said that all he knew was that King Feng killed someone in the leader's palace, and they caught him red-handed. King Feng realized that they were at the leader's palace, and the former leader of Fengaming City was supported by the Qin family. If Lin Lang dared to provoke his family in the leader's palace, the leader wouldn't let him leave. So, King Feng confidently asked Lin Lang if he thought that he could use divine power to conspire against him and if he dared to summon the city lord. Suddenly, someone pulled the dagger out of the assassin's body. King Feng was confused when he saw the man, and the man asked him if he had called for him. It was the city lord of Fengaming and he was reminding someone that if they wanted to kill, they should do it cleanly and efficiently and not count on him to clean up their mess in the future. The city lord was talking to Lin Lang, who called him the wise one as he apologized. Upon hearing their conversation, King Feng was confused, so he asked the wise one if he wasn't from the Qin family. The wise one laughed as he asked King Feng, who told him that he was from the Qin family. Then he said that it had been many years, yet his Qin family still took on small tasks so he had already repaid them with his kind treatment. The wise one ordered his men to make King Feng kneel, and two of them immediately pushed and forced King Feng to kneel. The wise one leaned towards King Feng, and he told him that Lin Lang's sister, Lin Xuan, was his former fiancé. But not only did she enter the Immortal Moon Palace, she was also about to become the third prince's wife, so it was also possible that the King family would be replaced in order to allow the Lin family to become one of the new five major families. The wise one said that since the Lin family held immense power without limit, no one would care any longer about the rest of the Qin family. King Feng was so mad that his veins popped as he gritted his teeth. Lin Lang chimed in with a smile on his face, asking the wise one what he would do with King Feng and the wise one told him not to worry because no one from the Qin family would dare interfere again. With an evil look on his face, the wise one gave orders to get rid of King Feng, and Lin Lang thanked the wise one as he was pleased with it. At midnight, in the dungeon of the Lord's Palace, King Feng was imprisoned, and as he saw that the guards were already gone, he thought that he didn't expect that the city lord would ally with the Lin family. Suddenly, a voice saying the number four could be heard from King Feng's side, so he asked who was there. Qin Sangui's head emerged from the little hole in the wall, and as he confirmed if he was talking to King Feng, King Feng's eyes widened in surprise. He asked Qin Sangui why he was there, and Qin Sangui told him that he couldn't stay away because the house he was in got surrounded. Qin Sangui quickly approached King Feng, asking him how he could do something so reckless, and King Feng asked him what happened. Qin Sangui told King Feng that people from the Lord's Palace said that Lin Xuan became the fiancé of the Third Prince and out of envy, he killed two members of the imperial family in Fengaming City so the next day he would be executed according to the law. King Feng smirked as he was amused at their excuse to kill someone, and he thought that he would just be sentenced to exile or something. But he didn't expect that the city lord would ally with the Lin family and would go that far, using the royal family to deal with him. King Feng thought that since the family was the most powerful, even if he clearly stated that he had been wronged and framed, the Qin family may dare to be angry but not to speak. 
Kin Sangui disrupted King Feng's thoughts as he told him that he must escape quickly while it was still time to switch guards. He pointed at the hole he came from and said that he dug that with all his strength, so if they missed the opportunity, there would be no way out. King Feng leaned on the wall as he chuckled and said that he didn't kill anyone from the imperial family, so there was no reason for him to want to escape like a coward. But Kin Sangui told him that he was still stubborn even when they were running out of time. King Feng declared that, as a member of the Kin family, he would leave, but only with his head held high. Suddenly, someone from the outside noticed their noise and was about to check on the cell, so King Feng kicked Kin Sangui out. He said that the guards would be changed soon, so if he didn't leave immediately, he would be accompanying him, and Kin Sangui told him to stop imagining and to hurry up. As the guards came to check on King Feng, the grass in the cell had already been used to cover the hole, and King Feng was still leaning against the wall, so they said that there was nothing unusual. As he took out the Kin family's battle matter, King Feng thought that he didn't expect the Kin family to raise a wolf with white eyes, and he wondered if they still wanted to admit it as their companion, saying that he had no choice. King Feng aimed the Kin family's battle matter outside his cell window and said that the enemies had forced him into that situation. A streak of fire flew into the skies. Then it exploded into a bright light that was formed into a symbol. Soldiers immediately came rushing. Meanwhile, King Feng was calm in his cell as the guards heard some sound and asked who dared to intrude into the cell. There was a bloody scene outside King Feng's cell as the guards got killed. The soldiers opened King Feng's cell, and as they bowed to him, they said that the rescue teams affiliated with the Kin family had gathered, so they were asking what his orders were. King Feng chuckled as he said that he had no orders and that he just had someone who wanted to challenge him in a fight. He told the soldiers that they would fight the person who challenged him for a while. The next day, early in the morning, on the way to the execution, Kin Sangui was scolding a guard who was moping, and he told him not to strain his face like that because they all shouldn't think that King Feng was dead. Kin Sangui said that perhaps King Feng thought it through and escaped from the cell, to which the guard agreed, saying that King Feng was a genius who could sell black iron ore for 30,000 gold, so he may have escaped early. They laughed as they walked towards the plaza, and Kin Sangui was thinking that King Feng couldn't be dead. As they arrived, there was a crowd, and the crowd looked amused as there was a hanging body there early in the morning. There was indeed a man with long hair hanging through his neck, and some people said that it was truly sickening. Kin Sangui and the guards wept as they questioned if it was really over and how it could happen. They all kneeled, and Kin Sangui wailed as they bowed on the ground, saying that King Feng had passed away, and they arrived too late, so they couldn't even bid farewell to King Feng on his final journey and there was no chance for them to meet him. Suddenly, King Feng appeared, wondering why some people were crying, as he didn't know what reason there was for other people to cry for the person who was hanging. But he saw that it was Kin Sangui, and he told him that he finally arrived. While King Feng asked Kin Sangui why he was crying, Kin Sangui and the guards all looked so confused. King Feng asked Kin Sangui if he made breakfast for him, but Kin Sangui and the guards jumped on him, happy that he wasn't dead. Kin Sangui pointed out that King Feng was supposed to be executed, so he asked him how he managed to escape. But King Feng wasn't able to answer his question as he was busy pushing them away because it was too crowded and questioning them why they were crying. King Feng pointed at the man hanging and said that the man's father wasn't as powerful as his father. King Feng mentioned that Lin Lang lost his spiritual mentor painfully. When Kin Sangui looked at the swollen face, he was surprised to realize it was the city lord. Kin Sangui asked King Feng how he managed to accomplish such a feat on his own. King Feng produced the Kin family's battle insignia and asked Kin Sangui if he was familiar with it. Kin Sangui immediately recognized it. King Feng explained that the Kin family's battle insignia represented the strength of the Kin family's private army. Within a hundred miles of the execution site, all Kin family execution teams were obliged to follow the sender's orders upon seeing the Kin family's battle insignia. Kin Sangui inquired about the orders King Feng had issued. King Feng laughed and asked Kin Sangui if he even needed to inquire. King Feng smirked and said that if Lin Lang and the others had tried to harm him, he would have ordered a massacre. The previous night, dozens of powerful martial arts experts had attacked the city lord's residence and committed a massacre, no one survived. King Feng stated that his father had worked hard for many years, but had unfortunately received only one decree, which had now been used up, leaving only an empty shell. Kin Sangui laughed and commented that it was no wonder why the city lord's palace had been so deserted that day. He praised King Feng for a job well done. Suddenly, Kin Sangui remembered Lin Lang and asked King Feng where he was or if he had escaped. This made King Feng laugh as he responded that he couldn't forget about that child and told Kin Sangui to come with him. 
Lin Lang was being punished by the people, who were throwing all kinds of disgusting stuff at him. They told him that in those past years, he had taken advantage of his spiritual mentor's position, the city lord, and had caused trouble in the city. They asked Lin Lang if he still wanted to blame innocent people and told him to go to hell. The people continued to throw stuff at him, and he told them that it was enough. While crying, Lin Lang confessed that he was the one who framed King Feng. He said that King Feng hadn't killed anyone, and it was all him. Seeing Lin Lang's position, Kin Sangkui laughed at him and pointed out that Lin Lang was trapped in the escape pit that he had secretly dug the other day. King Feng said that judging by the public anger, it seemed that Lin Lang had been causing trouble in the city for the past few years. Kin Sangkui asked King Feng why they didn't do something when Lin Lang harmed him repeatedly, and King Feng told him that Lin Xuan's influence was still strong, so if they went mad and killed Lin Lang, it might lead to a war between the families. King Feng said that last night, Lin Lang threatened to clear his name, and since he was a member of the Qin family, if he killed the city lord who was supported by the Qin family, both the Lin and Yi families wouldn't say anything, so he could escape without blame. Qin Sangkui and the guards were still pissed, saying that it was too cheap to let Lin Lang go without punishment, but an idea crossed Qin Sangkui's mind. With an evil look on their faces, Kin Sangkui asked King Feng if it didn't matter what they did as long as they didn't kill Lin Lang. King Feng hesitatedly told them that they could understand it that way, and King Feng wondered why he felt like those people were more brutal than him. Kin Sangkui immediately led the guards. They all had that evil grin on their faces as Kin Sangkui ordered everyone to control their strength. Lin Lang was surprised when they loomed over him. Lin Lang screamed, telling Kin Sangkui not to come to him, and his scream could be heard across the mountains which startled the birds. A few moments later, King Feng told his group that they should leave Lin Lang there, and he thought that it was time to prepare for his next plan. Meanwhile, Lin Lang was still stuck in the hole. His face was extremely swollen, and he said that human hearts were traitorous. Nighttime came, and Lin Lang was still stuck in that place, shriveling. Suddenly, a muscular man approached him, and he wondered if it was the Kin family execution team. The man immediately swung his axe and aimed it at Lin Lang, which made his eyes widen in surprise. As the axe approached him, Lin Lang screamed and pleaded not to be killed. But to his surprise, he was not harmed, and the wood plank that trapped him was destroyed. As the two men pulled Lin Lang out of the hole, someone else arrived, and he told Lin Lang not to be afraid as they were on the same side. He introduced himself as Yi Gong Gong, and he told Lin Lang that since Lin Xuan was engaged to the third prince, they had come to represent the third prince to accompany him to the capital. Lin Lang laughed, and he was thankful because King Feng had caused him so much trouble, so it was truly a blessing that he finally had some assistance. Lin Lang pleaded for Yi Gong Gong to help him kill the entire Qin family, otherwise, he would not be willing to return to the capital. Yi Gong Gong smiled as he requested that Lin Lang not make things complicated because their highness only asked for his family to bring him back to the capital. Lin Lang told Yi Gong Gong that as long as he was willing to help him assassinate King Feng in the future, he would not only praise him in front of the emperor, but he would also give him half of the iron mine that they were going to recover. Yi Gong Gong laughed, and he decided to forget it because, since it was Lin Lang's request, their family could not refuse. Yi Gong Gong ordered Xiao and Huan, who were both level 3 of body strength, to go and bring King Feng's head to him, to which they agreed. As Xiao and Huan departed, Lin Lang grinned, and he thought that he would see how King Feng would survive at that time when he would be facing two experts in level 3 of body strength. On the other hand, late at night at the medicinal garden of the Qin family, King Feng was tied up while he was lying on the bed with An Haochen, and he was thinking that the tightness in his chest was a feeling of relief. Qin Sangkui was also there, holding the rope that was tying both of King Feng's hands, and King Feng sighed as he wondered how things ended up like that. King Feng blushed as An Haochen's face was near his, and he recalled what happened a few hours earlier. A few hours ago, while King Feng was working at a wood carving in the medicinal garden, Kin Sangkui and An Haochen sounded concerned when they heard that he was planning to go into the misty forest, and they were asking if he was planning to die. King Feng told them that he had no plans to do so, and he wondered why they were both surprised, so he asked the two of them how going to the misty forest would mean going to death. An Haochen covered her eyes as King Feng activated the puppet automatically, and he rejoiced as his mission was accomplished. He said that he had become a herbalist, so he needed to gather some herbs. Kin Sangkui looked eerie as he told King Feng that he didn't know how terrifying the misty forest was, and that surprised King Feng. 
Kin Sank we said that the misty forest was not only full of poisonous gases, but there were also countless poisonous insects and savage beasts. Kin Sank we said that their family's medical book was part of the misty forest, and opening a small part of the medicinal garden led to sacrificing hundreds of warriors from the Kin family. So that was enough to show that the misty forest was a forbidden place for the living. Holding up a rope, Kin Sangui and An Houchen were both determined not to let King Feng go, and King Feng asked them what they were planning to do. Back to the current situation, King Feng was still blushing as he lay beside An Houchen when he realized that he forgot that the Misty Forest was not primarily developed, so it was natural for Kin Sangui and An Houchen to be afraid for him but he thought that An Houchen really doesn't treat him like a stranger. Suddenly, King Feng heard noises from the outside. He was alarmed that there were strange noises in the medicinal garden in the middle of the night, so he quickly applied an aura to his eyes. Xiao and Huan were each holding a guard, and Xiao said that Yigong Gong told them to only kill King Feng. King Feng sensed that the two of them were experts in strengthening level as they dropped the unconscious guards on the ground. And Sayo said that if they kill the non-residents, the main kin family may launch an investigation, to which Huan didn't argue. He just said that they should finish their mission quickly. King Feng was alarmed, so he quickly broke free from the ropes as he thought that an expert in the body strengthening level could kill 10 cultivators in Kai cultivation level. And the strongest person in the medicinal garden was only at the ninth stage of Kai cultivation. In addition, the kin family's battle matter had been used. King Feng thought that if they fought in there, the people in the medicinal garden might be affected. So King Feng went out of his house, stretching and acting like he was unaware of Xiao and Huan's presence. Xiao and Huan saw that King Feng had gone out and was peeing by the wall. Huan immediately decided to attack, and he charged behind King Feng, swinging his axe behind him. Huan's axe sliced through King Feng's head, and King Feng's head rolled into the ground. Xiao reached out to pick up King Feng's head, and he said that the Qin family members were easy to kill, so they just needed to bring the head, and they were done. But Xiao was surprised. In his hand was the head of the wooden puppet that King Feng was working on earlier that day. They were surprised when they saw that what Huan attacked was a wooden puppet, and they wondered if King Feng had escaped. Someone was packing a large quantity of fruits, and he was mocking Xiao and Huan, saying that two strong men could be tricked by a dummy. It was King Feng, and he told Xiao and Huan that they couldn't kill him at that level as he waved them goodbye. Huan clicked his tongue when he realized that King Feng had already noticed them. Meanwhile, as King Feng rode his horse away from the medicinal garden, he thought that Xiao and Huan had come for him, so for the safety of Kin Sangui and the others, he could only keep those two away. On the other hand, Xiao and Huan's eyes glowed sinisterly as Huan said that King Feng was a brainless person because instead of calling the guards, he just ran out thinking he could escape, and Xiao suggested that they should chase King Feng. The two of them immediately ran behind King Feng. King Feng suddenly threw glittery powder towards Xiao and Huan, who were chasing behind him. King Feng thought that although their cultivation was much higher than his, it was not difficult to chase a hundred thousand year old maker. Xiao and Huan didn't know what King Feng threw at them, and they couldn't open their eyes. Meanwhile, King Feng continued to run and he thought that he had scattered the heavenly fruit pills to obstruct Xiao and Huan's vision. So if he could beat those two guys, it seemed that they were actually nothing. King Feng applied a magic trick. He thought that he had the magic trick that could make night like day, so horseback riding was not restricted by the terrain, and it was not difficult to get rid of Xiao and Huan that way. As King Feng continued to escape with his horse, he didn't notice that Xiao and Huan were already in front of him up in the tree waiting for him to pass by the tree branch they were in. Xiao and Huan quickly jumped off the branch they were on, and King Feng was surprised when he saw that the two of them were about to attack him from above, telling him to die. A huge explosion happened in the forest due to the impact. King Feng was able to evade Xiao and Huan's attack by jumping off his horse and sacrificing it, and as he skidded on the ground away from his assassins, he wondered how that could happen. Xiao and Huan both had their eyes closed, and King Feng wondered how the two of them could still chase him in the forest at night when their visions were impaired. Xiao pointed at the horse on the ground, and he said that King Feng was there. Huan quickly went to attack, but Xiao realized that it was the horse King Feng rode. King Feng saw that Xiao and Huan were able to chase him, but they made a mistake in recognizing the horse that was not him. He realized that those two were the professional hunters who hunted by smell. As King Feng thought that the two of them were deceived by a fake dummy, not because they were stupid but because the dummy carried the scent of his clothes and the horse did too. Xiao pointed in his direction and said that he could smell King Feng's scent there. 
The two of them quickly chased after King Feng and King Feng ran away, and he thought that if he was targeted by those professionals, he was simply dead. King Feng started to rip a part of his shirt, and he thought that if he tried to scatter his scent everywhere, he may be able to escape from those two after that. Xiao laughed when he realized that King Feng knew that they could smell scents and wanted to hinder them by spreading them. But Huan said that the suitable condition for doing that was that he already had a way to escape. Suddenly, King Feng's eyes widened in surprise. King Feng was at the edge of a cliff, and Huan told him that the area in front of them was an area forbidden for living beings, the Misty Forest. King Feng looked so astonished that he wondered if he had accidentally entered the Misty Forest. Xiao laughed as he asked King Feng if he was scared and if he had the courage to continue, while Huan added that once King Feng enters the forest, only the poisonous mist alone guarantees his death. Xiao told King Feng that if he let them kill him, they promised him a quick death, and Huan added that otherwise, they could also throw him into the maze forest and let him die while he was afraid. The two of them were flabbergasted when King Feng suddenly crushed a sky snare fruit in his hand. King Feng grinned as he asked Xiao and Huan, who were scared. Xiao and Huan were both surprised when King Feng jumped off the cliff head first. King Feng gave Xiao and Huan the middle finger as he fell down the cliff while eating the sky snare fruit, and he told them that he wouldn't die at the hands of half-human and half-dog creatures. Xiao and Huan couldn't believe that King Feng jumped, and they questioned if he wanted to die. As he continued to fall down, King Feng reminded the two of them that it was the Misty Forest. Xiao laughed as he said that King Feng thought he was the hero of the story who could jump off the abyss to escape, and Huan added that in that forest, only the poisonous mist could kill him a hundred times, so all they needed to do was wait for the surrounding poisonous mist to dissipate during the day. They could enter and cut off King Feng's head to claim the reward. Xiao laughed again, saying that King Feng must have been affected by the poisonous mist and that the pain would be terrible, to which Huan commented that King Feng was perhaps already screaming in regret. Meanwhile, in the misty forest, someone was screaming in regret, it was King Feng and he smiled brightly, saying that he regretted not coming there for a long time. King Feng recognized the maze elixir, which was 100,000 years old and incredibly refreshing. The corpse Mayas a flower, which hadn't been picked for thousands of years and was growing significantly. And he found so many spiritual herbs, which all belonged to him at that moment. So he laughed and said that he was so happy that he couldn't stop screaming. King Feng smirked as he said that Xiao and Huan may have thought that he was dead, and he thought that even though the mist was filled with poison, he used sky snare fruit in advance to make a simple antidote and took it so the forest was not harmful to him, and it saved his life. Although the antidote wouldn't last long, there were many high-quality spiritual herbs there, so it would be a piece of cake for the god of alchemy to make an antidote and monster repellent pills on demand. King Feng smiled brightly as he gathered the herbs, and he said that he should go on and do some great work that day because he couldn't overlook those spiritual herbs that had been waiting for him for years. Two hours later, while King Feng was refining, something fell behind him and caught his attention. King Feng immediately recognized the hard-to-catch creature, the blood raccoon, that was lying dizzy on the ground, and he said that it seemed like the monster repellent pills he made were of good quality, to the point that the blood raccoon got affected when he passed by. Suddenly, King Feng noticed some shiny things on the tree branches behind the blood raccoon. He smirked as he thought he was worried about how to deal with those guys outside. But at that moment, he found a way. The next morning, Xiao and Huan set foot in the misty forest, and Xiao said that the poisonous gas around the swamp had finally dissipated, but Huan complained that the place was truly disgusting. Xiao told Huan to stop talking nonsense and look carefully because King Feng was supposed to die there. Xiao found King Feng's lifeless body on a tree branch, and as he announced he found King Feng, Huan laughed and said that it seemed that King Feng was tortured by monsters before he died there, calling him a fool. Huan quickly wielded his axe and said they could finally go back and claim their reward. But King Feng suddenly woke up and threw two sharp objects at them. The two of them were able to dodge King Feng's attack, and they were surprised that he was not dead. Xiao said that if King Feng was not dead, he must have been poisoned, and Huan added that it was ridiculous to make a mistake in a close-range ambush like that. King Feng smugly questioned them if he really missed the shot, and he said that he was in the Kai and Blood stage, so it was really hard to hit, but as professional hunters, they should have some understanding of swamp toxins. He asked them what would happen if a blood raccoon's blood hit the miasma tree in the sunlight. Huan laughed and said that everyone knows that it produces a toxic mist that damages the soul, and Xiao added that once someone inhaled it, it would only take 10 breaths for even a strong person in the body enhancement world to fall but blood raccoons were cunning, so it wouldn't be easy to hunt them. 
but King Feng simply laughed at them in response while having that sinister look on his face. Suddenly, Xiao and Huan noticed smoke, and they were surprised, wondering where it was coming from. The two of them quickly turned to look at the sharp objects that King Feng threw earlier, and the smoke was indeed coming out of where those were. Sayo immediately realized that Blood Raccoon's blood was smeared on the arrows that hit the miasma tree to produce the mist, and they had already inhaled it without knowing it, which surprised Huan. Recalling what he did, King Feng told them that he accidentally caught a Blood Raccoon that night, so his target from the beginning was the miasma tree. He said that two minutes ago, he knew he couldn't defeat them or escape from them, so he could only risk playing the role of the dead to divert their attention, and that made him facilitate the production of the mist on sight without being detected. Realizing that King Feng deceived them, Xiao and Huan got mad, and as they called him a bastard, they told him that they would kill him at that moment. While Xiao and Huan charged forward to attack him, King Feng calmly closed his eyes as he laughed and pointed out that they realized what he had done. And as he opened his eyes, he immediately told the two hunters that it was too late. Xiao and Huan immediately coughed up blood, and the two of them fell face first into the ground. King Feng said that unfortunately, for ordinary people, the poisonous mist might not have been effective at that speed. But for them, specialists with enhanced senses of smell, the results would be immediate. A lot of glowing pairs of eyes appeared in the dark part of the woods behind King Feng. It was a troop of blood raccoons, and King Feng told one of them that he borrowed some blood from him before, so he wouldn't treat him badly. He told them that he gave those two men to them for breakfast, and as he walked away, he was pleased that the trip had been very profitable because, on that journey, he wiped out the pursuers and found many spiritual herbs. Meanwhile, at the medicine garden, Kin Sang we clarified with Yi Gong Gong what he had said because he couldn't believe that King Feng would die and he told them to stop spouting nonsense. Realizing that Kin Sangui didn't believe him, Yi Gong Gong threw something on the ground and said that they should find out. And Hao Chen did not know what the item meant, but Kin Sangui immediately recognized that it was the saddle of King Feng's horse. Lin Lang told them that he found that by tracing bloodstains in the woods, to which Yi Gong Gong added that it seemed that King Feng had gone deep into the misty forest, and Lin Lang told them that if they dared to enter that place, he was afraid that not even their bones would survive. Kin Sangui immediately remembered that King Feng had said the other day that he was going to the forest, and An Hao Chen immediately knelt on the ground as she questioned if King Feng could really be dead. With an evil look on his face, Lin Lang said that King Feng dared to venture into the misty forest alone, so he really admired him. But Ling Lang said that he wouldn't stop there because, since King Feng was dead, he would take over the iron ore mine and medicinal herb field, and that made Kin Sangui mad. Lin Lang immediately ordered the royal guards that were with them to go ahead and take King Feng's men out. Lin Lang declared that from that moment forward, he would take care of that place for King Feng. And while Kin Sangui gritted his teeth, he wondered how Lin Lang engaged those irresistible royal forces. Suddenly, both Yi Gong Gong and Lin Lang were surprised when they heard someone asking if taking care of the place for him was necessary. It was King Feng. He quickly recognized Yi Gong Gong the eunuch servant of the eighth and last son of the royal family. And as he pointed out that they even engaged the royal family's forces, Yi Gong Gong and Lin Lang were both so surprised that he was not dead that they couldn't help but blurt it out. Suddenly, An Hao Chen dashed towards King Feng and embraced him while questioning him about where he was all night. King Feng told her that it was okay because he just went for a walk in the misty forest in the middle of the night. Lin Lang was shaking with anger, and as he called King Feng trash, he asked how he did not die when he went to the misty woods and got deep into them. King Feng asked Lin Lang why he would die when he just went to the misty forest and why he was so sure that he delved into it, which made Lin Lang speechless. King Feng figured out that sure enough, those two assassins were sent by Lin Lang. He Gong Gong suddenly chimed in and asked King Feng if he knew who represented the Lin family that day when they discussed the ownership of the iron mines. Kin Sangui got worried when he realized that Yi Gong Gong represented the Yi royal family. So no matter how King Feng responded, as long as he was aware of his relationship with the Lin family, he would definitely be at a disadvantage. But King Feng simply laughed and, while he took a step forward, asked why he would care who they represented. King Feng grinned evilly and said that he had a very bad mood that day, so he would kill those who dared to get on his nerves, even if they were from the Qin family. Both Lin Lang and Yi Gong Gong got nervous when King Feng put his arms around Lin Lang's shoulders and asked Yi Gong Gong if he knew that Lin Lang was the ruler of Fengming City, which was under the influence of the Qin family, and he was arrested because he tried to ally with the royal power and kill him. King Feng said that that night, he activated his Kin family's battle matter, and everyone working at the main mansion of Fengaming City's governor was killed. 
Not a single one was spared. King Feng added that the other night, he was wandering in the misty forest when he discovered two bad guys planning to kill him. Therefore, he activated his kin family's battle matter to cut their bodies to pieces. While they listened to King Feng, both He Gong Gong and Lin Lang looked terrified. King Feng said that in general, he would do such a thing on the spot to anyone who dared to provoke him, and he asked He Gong Gong if he just said that he represented someone. While King Feng playfully pecked Yi Gong Gong's face with the Kin family's battle matter, Yi Gong Gong was still surprised that the killers they sent were dead. He thought that it turned out that King Feng could go to the Misty Forest and could return because the Kin family still had a battle matter. Yi Gong Gong swallowed his saliva as he thought that he saw the horror of the Kin family's battle matter, and he knew that after it was issued, he would be punished even to the ends of the earth. Di Gong Gong immediately told King Feng that it was a misunderstanding because, in fact, they wanted to represent the Yi royal family and wished him a fruitful year, to which Lin Lang agreed. Di Gong Gong ordered everyone to say it together, and simultaneously, Yi Gong Gong, Lin Lang, along with the royal guards, bowed to King Feng and wished a happy new year to him and his friends with respect and tact. King Feng told them that the medicine garden was a little messy, so he was not going to invite them to it and the two of them nervously responded that it was okay, so King Feng gestured that they could leave. Kin Sangui grinned as he watched Yi Gong Gong command the royal guards to run away, and not let the lunatic King Feng start the war while Lin Lang chased them, asking them to wait for him as he was not on a horse yet. Kin Sangui asked King Feng why he still held the Kin family's battle matter when he already used it, and King Feng told him that it was just an empty shell that was used only to scare the dogs, which surprised Kin Sangui who said that it was a very cool trick. And Hao Chen asked King Feng where he went that night, saying that they were so worried about him. And King Feng told her that he went to the misty forest and reaped a good harvest of spiritual medicines. Kin Sangui didn't believe King Feng, and he told him not to deceive them because going to the misty forest meant real danger that could cost them their lives. So he asked where the harvest was, which he spoke of. Pointing at a figure behind him, King Feng said that he collected a lot of herbs and re-equipped the horse with more healing items on the way, and those harvests were in the back. The figure was the horse carrying a huge bag, and it was shaking and in tears due to exhaustion, so things may have been more difficult than they seemed. As they opened the bag, everyone was surprised at the huge amount of spiritual medicine, and the worst thing was that it was really from the herbs of the forest, so they asked King Feng if he really went alone to that scary place. King Feng told them that it was as he told them, so they should unload the goods quickly as he was going to sleep and have a rest, and the guards exclaimed their disbelief as it looked like the harvest was more than the last few years at the medicine farm, and that amount of spiritual medicine was really cool. Meanwhile, Kin Sangui looked puzzled as he said that he couldn't fathom King Feng's abilities and that he really couldn't predict them, while An Haochen said that King Feng was really creative. Several days after the Misty Forest incident, due to Lin Xuwen and the Third Prince's wedding, Lin Lang was transported to the capital. At the Third Prince's orders, Governor Yi directed the Yi family's guard team to Shadow Cloud Town to stay in readiness, and while he was traveling, Lin Lang complained that after a long battle, he couldn't beat King Feng and he was tired, so he wouldn't play anymore. On the other hand, King Feng was thinking that at present, although the Kin family still controlled Shadow Cloud Town, the Emperor Yi family had intervened, which made him think that perhaps the Emperor Yi family would like to press him to death in Shadow Cloud Town, so he decided that he would not sit idly by and wait for the inevitable fate. King Feng told Kin Sangui that starting that day, the salaries of the security guards would be doubled every month, and Kin Sangui was surprised. Kin Sangui asked King Feng what the point of doubling their salaries was. King Feng said that he would organize a team to go and explore the Misty Forest. Kin Sangui was so surprised that he asked King Feng if the living could explore the Misty Forest, which was a forbidden place. King Feng told him not to worry and said he would think about it, so he should reassemble the team first. King Feng believed that, according to the course of history, the current era was on the brink of experiencing a wave of exploration of new lands. To be the first scouting team, he needed to train his people to firmly control Shadow Cloud Town and establish a foundation for himself. The next day, the guards gathered, and they asked King Feng if he meant to provide spiritual medicines for them to use in exploring the Misty Forest. They wanted to confirm if he was serious. King Feng confirmed that he wasn't kidding and told them that selective examinations would be conducted to form the scouting team. He mentioned that after passing, the salaries would be tripled, and the guards were extremely surprised by the amount. One of the guards enthusiastically asked if Kin Sangui would take command and handle their training. King Feng responded that forming the team at that time was very important. So, with full confidence and a clear plan, 
King Feng informed the guards that he would personally lead them. The guards were confused and demoralized. The guards turned back, saying that they should just leave because King Feng was teasing them early in the morning, thinking he could fool them. One of them agreed, complaining that he hadn't had breakfast yet. While King Feng asked the guards where they were going, Kin Sangui was exasperated. He thought King Feng was joking, but he had taken a toll on his inner strength and was weaker than ever at the medicine farm. He knew he couldn't provide effective training in his condition. King Feng was unfazed and said it didn't matter. He would go with Kin Sangui to buy weapons and prepare material supplies for exploration. Kin Sangui agreed. As King Feng walked away comfortably, Kin Sangui wondered if King Feng actually thought he was a genius. He thought he was only lucky to escape once from the misty forest. In a restaurant, someone was confirming with another person if what they had heard was right, that the battle matter from the Kin family that King Feng showed them was fake. The one asking was Yi Gong Gong, and the man confirmed with him that, based on the investigation, King Feng only engaged in one battle, which he employed in Fengaming City. Yi Gong Gong inquired if King Feng underestimated them and used them as amusements, to which the man responded that that was how it was. Yi Gong Gong threw his drink away, and he cursed, calling King Feng the son of a bitch. The cup shattered on the floor in front of someone, and the drink splashed on them. It was Kin Yulong and he was furious as he asked Yi Gong Gong if he was the one who threw the tea, and Yi Gong Gong nonchalantly told him that he didn't care. Tian Yulun got so mad that he said that King Feng had annoyed him, so he couldn't take it anymore because even someone like Yi Gong Gong makes him angry. Tian Yulun lunged forward to punch Yi Gong Gong and told him to watch how he would teach him a lesson properly. But without looking at Tian Yulun, Yi Gong Gong effortlessly blocked his attack with only one hand, and that surprised Tian Yulun. Upon learning Kin Yulang's name, Yi Gong Gong asked him if he was from the Kin family and if he had a quarrel with King Feng too. Kin Yulang said that it was natural because King Feng had become a mortal, but he still gets excellent results using the fruits of the Tai Lu mud and appears well in the Kin family. He said that he would not accept that and he would show his complete rejection. Yi Gong Gong smirked as he told Kin Yulang that the two of them were on the same path. Yi Gong Gong acted friendly with Kin Yulang called him his dear brother, and told him that, in fact, he also wished to kill King Feng, so he asked him if he would like to talk together, which surprised Kin Yulang. Kin Yulang couldn't help but ask if Yi Gong Gong also had a grudge against King Feng, and Yi Gong Gong told him that he certainly did, urging him that they should talk in detail. Yi Gong Gong asked Kin Yulang if King Feng was going to meet the alchemist and if he had such good fortune, while he thought that with an alchemist, that explained everything about how Zio and Huan could be killed with poison. Kin Yulang said that the most important thing an alchemist needs is medicinal materials, so in order to bring down King Feng, they must destroy his medicinal field first. Yi Gong Gong disagreed with Kin Yulang's suggestion as they represented the royal family, so if they sent people to publicly destroy King Feng's medicinal field, it might lead to a war between the royal family and the Kin family, but Kin Yulang told him that they didn't need to do it themselves, and he asked him if he knew anything about boiled blood pills. Qin Yulang said that those pills could bring forth ferocious beasts, and those days were the savage iron bull beasts' migration season. So if the herb garden was destroyed by the monstrous iron bull, they'd just have to see what happens next. Qin Yulang told Yi Gong Gong that the price of a blood pill was expensive, but Yi Gong Gong had the money while he had the way to buy it, and that suggestion of his caught Yi Gong Gong's attention. Yi Gong Gong grinned evilly as he said that he liked that plan and that they must kill King Feng no matter what the cost. Meanwhile, in front of a pill furnace, King Feng was thinking that 20 pills of Tianliuagu heavenly medicine could be made from a single pomegranate. He thought that, generally, an alchemist had to make it in several rounds because making a truly heavenly Tianliuaguo pill was difficult. King Feng placed his hand into the furnace and thought that, compared to him, who mixed hundreds of ingredients to make cereal. It was simple, and mastering the manufacture of components was not difficult at all. He made 22 pills of medicine without losing any of the medicinal properties, and at his age, the success rate of making medicine would reach 102%. As King Feng tried one of the pills, he thought that if the quality of the medicine was rated from 1 to 10, he believed that the medicine he made was 0 out of 10, and he was pleased as he hadn't created that kind of medicine for a very long time. He thought that if a quality body shaping medicine were to leak into the market, it would definitely cause trouble. So in the future, if they wanted to sell it, they would have to find a way to lower the quality. The divine transformation art suddenly activated, and King Feng felt that his vital strength increased to the sixth level and that his strength became nearly a ton. So he believed that the result of using the body formation pills he made along with the divine transformation art was just as effective. 
While looking at another pill, King Feng believed that once he took an extra dose of the body formation pill, he would regain the strength he had before his blood vessels were damaged. But constantly upgrading in a short period of time was just too dangerous. Suddenly, King Feng ate the pill. He grinned as he believed that in order to be one of the early explorers, they could only fight in one battle to the death. Meanwhile, An Chen stood outside King Feng's residence, wondering if he was trying to break through. And Hao Chen believed that she heard from Kin Sangui that after being on the top of the mighty, King Feng fell to the bottom, and it hadn't been long, not more than a month, so she wondered if King Feng really set out on a quest to get back everything he had lost. She decided that she would protect King Feng and not allow anyone to disturb him. Meanwhile, in a dense forest near the medicine garden, red smoke wafted in the area, and Hao Chen heard someone give out a warning that there was a monster attack, instructing everyone to prepare to fight, and that alarmed her. She worried that monsters came at a time when King Feng hadn't broken through yet. Meanwhile, a spear broke while someone tried to pierce something. It was King Feng's guards, they were trying to fight a level 3 iron bull of body strengthening, and they said that its defense was very strong, so there was no way they could penetrate Iron Thor's armor. The iron bull attacked the guards, and it sent two of them flying while the one left looked terrified at what he just witnessed. Suddenly, an arrow charged at an intense speed. It hit the iron bull, and the guards were surprised. And Hao Chen was the one who fired the arrow from the roof, and she breathed out vigorously. One of the guards cheered at An Hao Chen, telling her that she did well for using the arrows purchased by King Feng, while the other one couldn't believe that what he saw was possible. Suddenly, the iron bull got angry, and the guards were terrified. Kin Yulung laughed as he saw the hard-to-handle iron bull entering the body strengthening state, so he wondered how King Feng would defend his medicinal garden and he wanted to see how King Feng would guard the medicine garden at that time. He Gong Gong celebrated with Kin Yulan, and he told King Feng that he could die in peace. On the other hand, the Iron Bull charged towards An Hao Chen, and the guards warned her about it while telling her to be careful. An Hao Chen fired another arrow, and she told the Iron Bull to die, calling it a bastard. But the Iron Bull managed to deflect the arrow she fired with its horns. The Iron Bull charged towards An Hao Chen, who stood in front of King Feng's residence, and the guards yelled at her, telling her to quickly get out of the way because she was alone and couldn't stop the Iron Bull. But An Hao Chen refused, and she grabbed the sword beside her. With full determination, An Hao Chen said that King Feng was behind her, so they must not let the sinful beast pass. An Hao Chen swung the sword with all her might, and she thought that even if she died in battle, she couldn't back down at all. The sword broke as soon as it made contact with the iron bull. An Hao Chen screamed as she got cuts all over her body from the shards of the sword. The iron bull loomed over her as she tried to stand up, and she shook. He Gong Gong laughed evilly as he said that King Feng was in the back room and he suggested to Kin Yulang that they kill him for their family. Meanwhile, with tears in the corners of her eyes, An Hao Chen closed them, accepting her fate as the iron bull's horn was about to hit her. But suddenly, when An Hao Chen opened her eyes, she was already leaning on King Feng's chest while King Feng asked where the bull came from, saying that it didn't know where it was. The guards were all surprised by what they saw. An Hao Chen was also surprised, as King Feng carried her in his arms and said that the Iron Bull was looking for death for daring to touch his family. King Feng immediately asked An Hao Chen if she was alright, and she confirmed that she was fine. He told An Hao Chen that it was okay to go away, and she did a good job, so he would take care of the Iron Bull. An Hao Chen stopped him and told him that he couldn't because the monster had reached the third level of body strengthening while he was only at the seventh level of Kai and blood, so there was a huge difference to it, which was why he couldn't handle it. King Feng told her not to be afraid because no matter what level the monster was, there was no way he wouldn't act if it dared to avenge his arrogance in his kingdom, and that made An Hao Chen more worried. On the other hand, Kin Yuleng was laughing, saying that that day, King Feng sent Kin Sangui with the guards to go shopping in the city, so he questioned King Feng's decision to deal with the Iron Bull on his own when the guards were currently short on supply and he Gong Gong said that King Feng was really looking for death. King Feng landed on the ground and faced the Iron Bull. King Feng's guards panicked when they saw the bull lock him up, and they immediately told King Feng to run away quickly as he would not be able to penetrate its shield. Meanwhile, Kin Yuleng and he Gong Gong were laughing, telling King Feng to die. King Feng calmly asked his guards why they were panicking when the Iron Bull's skin was just thick. He prepared himself for battle, and he wondered if it wouldn't work if he just had to blow it up. King Feng moved quickly, and as his attack landed on the Iron Bull, blood splattered in all directions. King Feng's weapon was left on the Iron Bull's back, and the bull screamed in pain. Kin Yulang and Yi Gong Gong couldn't believe what they saw, 
and they questioned if King Feng managed to break through the Iron Bull's armor. On the other hand, King Feng's guards recognized the martial technique that could only be used with body strengthening, and they wondered how he could train himself on it when he was only at the Kai and blood levels. Meanwhile, An Houchen was surprised and speechless. King Feng believed that typically, an ordinary knight reached the body cycle stage to be able to practice martial arts, but with the help of the divine transformation art, he surpassed the seventh level Kai and blood restrictions. King Feng remembered that in his previous life, he accumulated so many excellent martial arts skills, but he couldn't practice some of them. He grinned as he wielded more daggers, thinking about his current life. King Feng threw the daggers towards the Iron Bull, and he realized that finally there was a place for him to use his martial skills. The Iron Bull was hit by King Feng's daggers. King Feng moved swiftly and used his move, Martial Arts, Moonlight, where the sword struck silently within a hundred paces and never missed. The Iron Bull got alarmed when it saw King Feng coming. The guards were all worried, and they warned King Feng not to come near the bull, as getting close to the Iron Bull meant suicide. And Hao Chen also worried as the Iron Bull stood on its hind legs and was about to stomp on King Feng. The Iron Bull slammed its front legs on the ground with a powerful force that destroyed the ground. Qin Yulung and Yi Gong Gong laughed when they saw that King Feng hurried to die, while An Hao Chen and King Feng's guards were devastated. But suddenly, King Feng spoke, asking the Iron Bull if it sought death. The Iron Bull was alarmed when it saw King Feng hovering above it, and King Feng thought that after learning Moonlight, his avoidance ability increased. But Moonlight could also analyze and detect enemy weaknesses during battle. King Feng's eyes gleamed as he prepared his punch by combining Moonlight with the strange power of the Divine Transformation art. He believed that it would be easy to finish as he plunged at the Iron Bull, and he hit it with a very powerful force that broke the ground in the process. And Hao Chen and King Feng's guards were surprised that the Iron Bull was killed, while Qin Yulang and Yi Gong Gong couldn't believe that the scope of the destruction of King Feng's attack exceeded the Iron Bull's so they wondered what it was. On the other hand, King Feng's guard ran towards him, and they were all surprised that the triple barbarian Iron Bull was killed by King Feng at the seventh level of Kai and blood. While King Feng climbed up the Iron Bull's back, asking the guards how they were doing and telling them not to look cute, and Hao Chen wondered if King Feng returned to the top. Sitting on top of the Iron Bull, King Feng asked the guards if anyone still thought that he was not qualified to train all of them. He told them that it was their last chance to join his hunting team, so they shouldn't miss it. The guards immediately and enthusiastically said that they would join the team because, with King Feng's guidance, it was only a matter of time for them to surpass the molten body level. As the guards praised him, King Feng told them not to rush and take things slow. He ordered them to move the iron bull first as he had some uses for it, and in his mind, he was satisfied that the hunting team's recruitment was completed. King Feng wondered why the Iron Bull came there, and he remembered that a few moments ago, there was a fragrant smell of perfume in the medicinal garden. He took a sniff, and he recognized the smell of boiled blood pills. King Feng thought that the Iron Bull must have been lured there by someone using a boiled blood pill. King Feng used the divine transformation art, which made his eyes gleam, and he could see two figures at the edge of the cliff in the distance. It was Qin Yulang and Yi Gong Gong, and Yi Gong Gong cursed Qin Yulang and blamed him, saying that because of his bad idea, not only did they lose the boiling blood pill, they also gave King Feng a barbarian iron bull for free. Qin Yulang told Yi Gong Gong that his plan was perfect, so it must have been him, the bastard, who brought the fake pills, and Yi Gong Gong got more enraged when he heard Qin Yulang called him a bastard as they continued to fight, complaining that one of them was a monster and threatening to kill each other, the edge of the cliff broke, and the two of them fell down, leaving their guards confused as to where they went when they noticed that their masters were gone. The two of them fainted as they reached the ground. King Feng saw what happened, and he realized that it was the two of them bastards who were behind the attack, so King Feng thanked them in his mind while giving them a thumbs up, which confused An Hao Chen. A few days later, all the guards of the Qin family joined the hunting team, and they were wondering what kind of medicine King Feng gave them because one of them was seriously injured previously, but it only took him a few days to recover. King Feng asked them why they were all so surprised that he made them some medicine for their injuries, and he told them that they would perform better in the future. As the guards thanked King Feng, he announced that An Hao Chen would be given iron armor. An Hao Chen was surprised at the announcement, and King Feng said that after that, if there were talented people in the team who would perform great, they would receive great rewards. An Hao Chen thanked King Feng when he handed her the iron armor, while the rest of the guards' eyes were twinkling in admiration as they looked at the iron armor being given. 
Additionally, King Feng announced that those guards who guarded the medicine garden the other day would each receive one body hardening pill, and the guards immediately thanked him. He told them that he would give it to them in the middle of next month, and as for those who performed admirably, they would follow him to open a wasteland in the misty forest, and their reward would be two kai pills in blood. King Feng reminded his guards that as long as they behaved well, he would definitely not treat them badly, and the guards immediately bowed to him and thanked him. A few moments later, gossip was already spreading in the shadow cloud bar. They were talking about King Feng, who took people to the misty forest, and one of them laughed, saying that he heard that King Feng took people to die. They began betting on how many people would bet that King Feng would come back alive after going to the misty forest at that time. One of them laughed, saying that at a minimum, it was impossible for all of his team members to come back alive, and one added, saying that after all, no one went there and returned unharmed. One started to bet that no one would survive, and the rest of them followed. Suddenly, someone yelled, disagreeing with them and saying that only one of them could stay alive that day. It was Yi Gong Gong, and he ordered all of them to bet on his teams, saying that whoever dared to disobey his orders was against the royal family. One of the people asked Yi Gong Gong if he was kidding them, but Yi Gong Gong asked them if they didn't understand that those who did not obey orders would lose their heads. The royal guards were pointing their spears at the men, and they were crying saying that Igongong Gong was openly trying to steal their money because no team in history could go to the Misty Forest and return unharmed with all its members. Igongong Gong was acting smug and shameless, as he thought that the boiled blood pill made him lose a lot of money, so even if he was rude, he had to take it back. He thought that to ensure nothing went wrong, he would secretly attack King Feng, who entered the forest, and King Feng must die in the Misty Forest at that time. Half a month later, Kin Sankui informed King Feng that the hunting team had assembled and was perfectly lined up and ready. Kin Sankui said that after half a month of selection, 12 members of the Kai and Blood Realm were selected into the Wasteland Elite team, and they were all equipped with a full set of throwing blades and hand crossbows, so everything was ready. King Feng was pleased, and he asked everyone to pay attention, telling them that it was their first time entering the Misty Forest, so it must be difficult but he believed that everyone would do well after the training. King Feng led them and said that only success and no failure were allowed, to which his troops agreed. A few moments later, they arrived at the Misty Forest, and as they were surrounded by beasts, King Feng reminded them to beware because the most dangerous thing in that forest was the fog and the toxic air. King Feng told them that those were no longer a threat to them because the pills he gave them were enough to guarantee that they wouldn't be harmed by those for two hours. He said that the second danger was insects and poisonous monsters lurking in the fog, where they could die of panic as soon as they encountered them, so they split into three groups of four and dispersed in different directions. King Feng told them that he would walk in front, so they followed him. King Feng thought that relying on the divine transformation art to Strangai's senses was enough to comprehend the situation of the poisonous fog, so as long as everyone obeyed his orders, they did not lose anyone in that reconnaissance. Unbeknownst to him, some of the guards behind him were looking at him, amused at how he acted like he knew the place in detail, as if he had been there a few times, and another one agreed, saying that he was just lucky to get in once before. They smirked and said that they should go and explore the misty forest themselves to show King Feng that they were competent, and that they, the veterans, were stronger than others. Four of them sneaked out of the formation. They gleefully said that they sneaked away to bring more trophies. They were unaware of the centipede that crawled above them while they said it was also good to let King Feng give them more reward money. Suddenly, one of them noticed something. He was alarmed as the centipede jumped off the branch to attack him. King Feng immediately realized that something happened, and he quickly looked back, asking them what the matter was. The guards panicked, and they tried to run when they saw it was the Ironback Centipede. But suddenly, something struck the Ironback Centipede, which surprised one of the guards who was near it. One of the four guards who snuck out of the formation fired an arrow to kill the Ironback Centipede, and he proudly said it was nothing but a poisonous insect, so there was no need to be afraid as they just had to shoot it to death. One of his companions praised him, saying he was strong, so it seemed he had to rely on him in the misty forest, and the guard who fired the arrow proudly said it was expected because he had been there before, unlike him, who was a weak and inexperienced boy. But suddenly, more ironback centipedes started to crawl near them. King Feng was enraged, calling him an idiot, and he told him to look around carefully. The guards who sneaked out were surrounded by a swarm of ironback centipedes, and King Feng told them that the dead centipede emitted a smell that attracted the swarm, so killing one of them would attract countless numbers. The veteran guard, the one who fired the arrow, was extremely horrified. 
King Feng tried his best to warn everyone to be careful. The guards started to fire their arrows at the ironback centipedes, but one of them got their crossbow stuck, while another lost his morale when he saw there were so many and thought it would be impossible to kill them all. They were in a pinch as the ironback centipedes started to get near them. The veteran guard was shaking as one of his companions asked him what he was doing in a daze when he was strong and told him to save them quickly. The veteran guard kneeled on the ground in surrender, and he said it was over, and they were done because he could handle one or two, but there were so many of them that he was sure none of them would survive. He kept saying that everything was over, and they would all die that day. They were surrounded by ironback centipedes, who were about to pounce on them. King Feng called them fools, asking them what happened to them, and he quickly charged to attack the ironback centipedes that were about to attack his guards. King Feng emitted multiple waves of powerful aura, and it killed multiple ironback centipedes at once. Tears filled one of the guards' eyes as he saw ironback centipedes coming his way, and he said it was their end. But to their surprise, King Feng suddenly appeared in front of them and used his body as a shield to protect them from the ironback centipedes. King Feng coughed up blood as he endured the bites of the ironback centipedes. The veteran guard was horrified at what he just witnessed. Tears filled his eyes as he thought that King Feng used his body as a shield to protect them. And Houchen and Kin Sangui got worried for King Feng, and they ran towards him, saying they would come to help. But King Feng glared at them and ordered them not to come to him. He prepared himself for another attack as he told them they couldn't handle it. King Feng raised his dagger, and he quickly attacked the ironback centipedes with it. King Feng coughed up blood as two more ironback centipedes attacked him from behind. But King Feng didn't stop attacking. He simply looked back to slash those two into pieces. One more ironback centipede attacked him from the side. And Hao Chin and Kin Sangui were so worried that they couldn't help but call out his name. King Feng noticed the centipede that was attacking him, and he dug his dagger into it. He screamed and continued to slash the ironback centipedes with all his might. Tears ran down Anne Houchen's face as she said that King Feng was really just one person, but he eliminated a large group of centipedes. King Feng stood there as he finished eliminating the last of the centipedes, and their carcasses were still falling to the ground. The guards who sneaked and celebrated that they were alive. The veteran guard cried, and he told his mom that her baby was still alive. Suddenly, a bloody hand grabbed him by the collar and called him an idiot. It was King Feng who was extremely mad, and he was asking him why he didn't do what he said when he told them how to act in the forest. King Feng asked him if he knew that his reckless behavior would destroy the entire team at any time. He asked why they dealt with a group of centipedes and if all their previous exercises were in vain. The veteran guard was speechless as he realized the gravity of what he had done. King Feng felt pain, and he started to stagger. And Hao Chin and Kin Sangui quickly came to assist him, and they were both extremely worried. The four guards who sneaked out were crestfallen, as they said that they had caused King Feng all that harm and almost killed everyone. On the other hand, King Feng was telling An Hao Chin and Kin Sangui that he had just been poisoned by the ironback centipede. But he was okay and he asked them to just give him some detox pills. As King Feng took the pill, he thought that his vitality had greatly weakened at the moment, and without him, he was afraid that the reconnaissance would end at the beginning. King Feng was surprised when four people kneeled in front of him, begging for his pardon. The veteran guard was one of them, and he said that according to the rules, whoever hurts their teammates must leave the team. The four guards admitted that they almost got everyone killed, so they shouldn't stay there, and as they walked away, they bid them goodbye, saying that they would leave the team as their punishment, so they would just find another way to earn a living for themselves. Suddenly, someone threw a bag on the ground and asked them where they went. It was King Feng, and he told the four of them that he knew that they made their own decisions because their parents were sick and needed money, so he asked them what their parents would do if they left. As they opened the bag, they were surprised to see recovery pills in it, and the veteran guard asked King Feng what they were. King Feng gently pushed An Hao Chin away, who assisted him in standing up. King Feng told them that even a hero makes mistakes, but as long as he corrects them, he wins. He asked them if they wanted to die for wanting to walk out of the forest by themselves, and he ordered them to restore their strength first, as their punishment would be discussed later. The guards were so surprised that they couldn't help but ask King Feng if he still wanted to keep them in his team when they almost killed him. King Feng did not discuss the matter further with them, and he immediately ordered them to find a place to camp safely because, when they became well, he would take them out of the forest alive, to which the guards agreed. After three days, King Feng's team set up camp near a cave. King Feng meditated, and he thought that the potency of the pills he made was still very low, otherwise, there was no way that centipede poison could trap him for three days, so all he could do was use divine transformation art to speed up the detoxification. 
he thought that until after the detoxification was complete, he couldn't fight, so he hoped he could get through things safely. Suddenly, someone yelled outside that poisonous insects were coming. King Feng quickly came out of the cave and asked everyone what was wrong. King Feng was surprised when he saw a cluster of spiders in front of their camp. He was surprised when he saw that it was a cluster of bloodweb spiders, and there were too many of them, so they couldn't handle them all. King Feng immediately charged at the front lines. He instructed everyone to run, saying that he would come after them while he thought that the team didn't have much combat experience, and it was a lot of bloodweb spiders, so even though he didn't possess much fighting strength at the moment, he could only fight to save everyone. But the veteran guard ordered everyone to line up in a defensive formation. He swore to guard the entrance to the cave and told everyone that they should help King Feng complete things. The guards immediately lined up, protecting King Feng behind them. Kin Sankui threw a bag and spilled a purple substance into the bloodweb spiders. King Feng was surprised. He was surprised that his troops already knew how to crush a monster blocking pill and set up a defensive line. The veteran guard ordered everyone to retreat and release the center entrance to let the bloodweb spiders into the trap. The guards immediately executed his orders, and the bloodweb spiders started falling into their trap. King Feng got worried, and he told the veteran guard that although the bloodweb spiders couldn't jump, their ability to spin silk was extremely strong, so they would climb up along the silk. The bloodweb spiders did exactly what King Feng said. But the veteran guard didn't seem worried as he asked King Feng what he was saying when they just wanted them to spin silk and King Feng was taken aback. The veteran guard reminded him that they taught them before that spider silk was highly flammable. He said that when the bloodweb spiders were weaving silk and crawling on a spider's web, it would just be a bonfire feast. And yet again, King Feng was surprised. King Feng couldn't believe that they actually managed it. Suddenly, a huge leg emerged from the raging flames, and King Feng recognized what it was. King Feng was worried about what they should do, and he told his troops to run because it was the Spider Queen, and its skin was thick, so the flame would not affect it. But one of the guards started loading their arrow and told King Feng that they knew. The four of them charged forward, and they reminded King Feng that he told them that when the little bloodweb spider died, the Spider Queen would emerge, they said that the Spider Queen is not afraid of flames, so if they encounter one, they must run away. But they also remembered that King Feng taught them that when the enemy surrounded them, they could not escape. The four of them jumped to attack the Spider Queen and said that they must act decisively and raise awareness to fight. With determination in their eyes, the four of them said that they must do their best. They attacked the Spider Queen simultaneously, and they all focused on its eyes. The Spider Queen's blood splattered as it fell to the ground. The veteran guard told King Feng that during the last few days that he had been recovering, they were intensely revising the knowledge that he taught them. The four of them stood together, and the veteran guard told King Feng that as long as he didn't hate them, they would become a pillar for him even if they risked their lives. As the veteran guard told King Feng that he didn't have to carry everything on his own and that he should let them stand by him to support him, King Feng was in awe when he saw that they actually relied on themselves and destroyed all the bloodweb spiders. King Feng admitted that he underestimated them, and he said that they should continue where they started, which Kin Sankui confirmed if he meant the return trip home. King Feng enthusiastically said that there was no reason for them to go home as they were making great progress, so they should search for spiritual herbs, otherwise, it would be a waste of time, and his troops, with the same enthusiasm, agreed with him. The next evening, in the safe area outside the misty forest, people gathered as it was time for the Kin family's hunting team to return. People wished that they didn't all die and that at least one came back alive because Yi Gong Gong forced all of them to bet against them. So if they lost, everyone in Shadow Cloud Town would lose their fortune. Yi Gong Gong was on a carriage, and he said that the people bet on King Feng to return victorious while he bet that no one would survive. Yi Gong Gong thought that a brat like King Feng couldn't lead a team from the Misty Forest alive because if he did, he could be the first person in history, so King Feng had to die and let him make a lot of money. Suddenly, someone pointed out that there was movement and Yi Gong Gong became anxious. The people started to rejoice when they had hoped that King Feng's troops could come back because if someone appeared, they could rest assured they would not lose their money. But a dove emerged from the forest, which left the people speechless, and Yi Gong Gong was a bit relieved that it was just a dove. The people started to fill with dread because they waited all day, but no one showed up, so King Feng and the others must have died in the forest. Yi Gong Gong immediately laughed and claimed that he had thought to himself that there was no way King Feng, and the others could come back. 
The Gong Gong said that they must have died, so he immediately ordered the royal guards to take the people's money, and the people started to plead with him because they still had to take the money for their families. But Yi Gong Gong didn't listen. He said that if he told them to give him money, they must give it to him because he represents the royal authority. Then he asked them if they dared to stand up to the royal family, to which the people nervously said no. Suddenly, to Yi Gong Gong's surprise, someone spoke behind him, saying that they were wondering why all those people crowded together, and that it turned out to be a gamble. It was King Feck, and as he said that he thought that the whole town had gathered to prevent them from entering the town, Yi Gong Gong couldn't help but express his surprise when he saw that he was not dead. King Feng mockingly asked Yi Gong Gong if his face looked like a dead person's face to him, and he told him that unfortunately for him, they were not dead. King Feng's team began to emerge, carrying their harvest, and King Feng mentioned that nobody died. All team members returned safe and sound. Yi Gong Gong's eyes popped out of their sockets due to shock when he heard that nobody died while the townspeople rejoiced that they won the bet. Yi Gong Gong was fuming mad as he informed King Feng that it was pure luck that he came back and he instructed his guards to depart. But suddenly, someone walked quickly. It was King Feng, and he blocked Yi Gong Gong from entering his carriage, reminding him that he lost the bet with the townspeople and hadn't paid yet. Yi Gong Gong promptly reminded King Feng that he represented the royal authority, so he would not pay the money, and he inquired what he would do about it. King Feng informed Yi Gong Gong that he wouldn't take any action but would defame him. He stated that he would inform the royal family of his actions and also that he owed civilians money. Yi Gong Gong was sweating profusely, and he was speechless with anger when King Feng inquired what would happen to him if the news reached the royal family, which cares about their reputation. A quarter of an hour later, clothes and weapons were gathered as soldiers collected them. Yi Gong Gong and the royal guards were left with only their underpants, and he mentioned that he didn't have enough money, so he would cover his debts with clothes and armor, and that was all he possessed. King Feng made a calculation. And he remarked that it was almost there, so if they surrendered their panties, it would be just right, which infuriated Yi Gong Gong, calling him a bastard and telling him not to go too far. But King Feng simply stated that he would inform the royal family of his actions, leaving Yi Gong Gong speechless. After a minute, Yi Gong Gong, along with his royal guards, ran away naked, and he cried, telling King Feng that he would remember that humiliation on behalf of the royal family while the townspeople laughed at him. One child even asked their daddy why Yi Gong Gong had a little go-go. The townspeople thanked King Feng for standing up for them, and when they asked him how they could express their gratitude, King Feng told them that it was not necessary. King Feng informed them that he would frequently visit the forest in the future so he might need their help, like for the equipment and trading sources they would require on their forest trek. But of course, everything has its price. The townspeople gladly accepted King Feng's idea, and they said that he helped them a lot both in the iron mine and in the betting, so they were indebted to him. After three days, Yi Gong Gong and his royal guards gathered around a bonfire, shivering. And Yi Gong Gong wondered how King Feng got out of the forest, saying that he was totally broke because of him. Someone approached Yi Gong Gong from behind and told him that according to royal intelligence, King Feng passed through the misty forest without being poisoned, so he must have been taught by a mysterious alchemist. Yi Gong Gong questioned the person about how they could know proprietary information, and he asked him who he was. It was Yi Wen, the first-class alchemist of the royal family, and he told Yi Gong Gong that he was specially sent by Lin Lang and Lin Xuan from the capital, a person who could help him kill King Feng. A huge hammer with a chain attached to it arrived, and Qin Sangui informed King Feng that he brought the hammer he ordered because the other day, the town of Shadow Cloud collected iron to make it, and it was already ready. King Feng was amazed, as he didn't expect that the townspeople respected him so much. He grabbed the hammer and said that he would try it, which made An Hao Chen and Qin Sangui cheer him on, saying that he was amazing. The hammer was lifted off the ground, but King Feng felt a searing pain on his back, and it felt like he broke it. King Feng shuddered as he put down the hammer and complained about his back, which worried Qin Sangui, who immediately asked him if the hammer was too heavy. But to their confusion, King Feng told them that it was not too heavy, and the hammer suited him perfectly, so they should get ready to go to the jungle again. King Feng thought that he recently learned a new technique, and although he hadn't mastered it yet, as long as he was not facing a tough enemy, he could use the hammer to deal with them. The next day, in the jungle swamp fog, King Feng was amazed as he found a good place again. One of his troops said that he didn't expect the swamp to be full of large crabs, and they could get a lot of money by selling them. Suddenly, while Qin Sangui was busy collecting the large crabs with the other troops, King Feng's divine transformation art suddenly sensed someone approaching, and he found it strange. 
King Feng immediately instructed Kin Sangui to go search for a safe place and wait for him there while he took a look around the place, to which Kin Sangui agreed. A few moments later, King Feng was able to find the place where the person his divine transformation art was sensing, and to his surprise, he saw Yi Wen, who was leading Yi Gong Gong and the other royal guards. Yi Wen was telling Yi Gong Gong that he prepared an antidote to poison for everyone, and he also brought some equipment, so it was the day that they would kill King Feng which made Yi Gong Gong thankful to him. Hearing what he said, King Feng wondered if Yi Wen brought poison to kill them all in the jungle. King Feng thought that it was bad because the palace soldiers were much stronger than his team, and if they tried to escape, they would block all escape routes, so he must find a solution. A few moments later, a soldier reported to Yi Gong Gong that he found footprints that were just recent, so King Feng's troops must be in front of them. Yi Gong Gong immediately charged forward, asking his soldiers what they were waiting for, and ordered them to go and kill their enemies mercilessly. They traveled at an incredible speed, and their horses jumped as they emerged from the bushes. Suddenly, Yi Gong Gong was filled with horror when he realized something. He and his soldiers were falling into muddy water. All of them fell down, including their horses, and they struggled to get out of the water. One of the soldiers screamed as they got attacked by a giant crab, and Yi Gong Gong couldn't understand what was happening asking if they were in a swamp. Suddenly, King Feng's hammer rushed in their direction. It hit one of the soldiers, and Yi Gong Gong was extremely surprised. Yi Gong Gong immediately recognized that it was King Feng who wielded the weapon, and he asked him what he was doing. King Feng told Yi Gong Gong that he already knew his plan of wanting to kill him, so he asked his team to leave fake footprints, and they were already hiding in a safe place. King Feng caught the hammer with his hand as it came back to him. He threw it back again at the enemies, and another soldier was hit. King Feng repeatedly did it, and he eliminated the soldiers one by one, which alarmed Yi Gong Gong. King Feng told Yi Gong Gong not to worry as it was his turn, and Yi Gong Gong was in a panic when he saw the hammer coming in his direction. Suddenly, Yi Wen appeared and kicked King Feng's hammer away so it wouldn't hit Yi Gong Gong. He told King Feng that they were his people, so he shouldn't dare do anything. King Feng mocked Yi Wen, stating that he was a first-class alchemist but made poison to kill others instead of making medicine. He dared him to come taste the power of his hammer. Yi Wen became annoyed and glared at King Feng. He moved so fast that his figure became a blur, which surprised both King Feng and Yi Gong Gong. As Yi Wen asked King Feng, who said that alchemists could only make medicine, Yi Wen hit him with his knees on his stomach, delivering a powerful blow. King Feng was surprised and wondered how Yi Wen approached him. King Feng lost his balance and his hammer while he thought that Yi Wen was so fast. Yi Wen grabbed his clothes and told King Feng that he could see for himself. Yi Wen removed his clothes, revealing a muscular body, and he told King Feng that he was a first-class alchemist and also a first-class fighter. King Feng gritted his teeth and was surprised that Yi Wen was both a first-class alchemist and fighter. Yi Wen told King Feng that he heard that he became an alchemist and was doing whatever he wanted in the town of Shadow Cloud, so he was specially assigned by the royal family to kill him because he was really famous. King Feng was in pain, and he thought that he didn't expect that Yi Wen was hiding his power. Yi Wen charged towards King Feng, confirming with him if he was also a strength specializing fighter, and that surprised King Feng. King Feng looked distressed when Yi Wen suddenly appeared behind him, saying that it was a coincidence because he was a fighter specializing in speed. Yi Wen was moving so fast that it seemed like there were a lot of him attacking King Feng, and he was telling King Feng that he must know that speed is the enemy of strength, so he couldn't even touch him. Yi Wen kicked King Feng's hammer away and asked him how he would fight, which agitated King Feng. As King Feng's hammer fell into the muddy water, Yi Gong Gong, who was climbing out of it, laughed and praised Yi Wen, saying that King Feng relied on that hammer to fight, so they should see what he could do without it. King Feng asked Yi Wen how he could even kick his ton weight hammer when he was a speed specialized fighter, and Yi Wen asked King Feng if it was strange, explaining to him that speed specialized fighters rely on directing their power through the tips of their feet. Yi Wen was about to kick King Feng while he asked him if he was scared because he kicked his hammer away and he realized that strength specialized fighters have no understanding of the power of their feet. Yi Wen delivered a powerful blow as he lectured King Feng that he knew nothing about the strength of their feet, and King Feng managed to block his attack with his arms. King Feng was pushed back by the power of Yi Wen's attack while he wondered if that stance was how he fought and if he relied on directing his power through the tips of his feet. Yi Wen laughed as he told King Feng that he didn't expect his stamina to be good, and he couldn't believe that he endured his kick. King Feng smugly reminded Yi Wen that he defeated the Iron Bull alone, so his speed was not enough to kill him. Yi Wen laughed as he asked King Feng if that was right, and he took a pill. 
He asked King Feng if he thought that alchemists couldn't make pills to increase speed, and he created multiple figures of him, which surprised King Feng as he didn't expect that Yuan could still become faster. Yuan told King Feng that he couldn't even touch him, and after taking that pill, he became faster than before, so he asked King Feng if he still thought he could beat him. Yi Gong Gong was rejoicing on the side, telling King Feng that it was his end, and that it was time for his death. Two figures of Yuan were attacking King Feng, and King Feng was startled. But King Feng looked serious as he began to crouch. Yuan was surprised when he saw that something was coming straight towards his face. It was King Feng's knee, and he managed to land it on Yuan's face, throwing him backward. Yuan lost multiple teeth, and as he screamed in pain, he questioned how it was possible. He Gong Gong, who cheered for Yuan earlier, was distressed, and he couldn't believe what he saw. Yuan didn't understand what happened, and he asked King Feng how he was able to keep up with his speed when he was a fighter specializing in strength. King Feng laughed as he asked Yuan, who said that he was a fighter specializing in strength, and he thought that he used the hammer because he just learned a powerful technique from his previous life, the Ghost Dance. Ghost Dance was a great master technique from his previous life that, when mastered, one could move too fast, and King Feng learned that technique only a few days ago, so he couldn't control his speed, which was why he wanted to use the hammer to slow himself down or else he couldn't move properly. King Feng thought that when he fought earlier, by chance, he figured out the right way to use the technique, and he realized that he used the technique incorrectly so far because he used his ways to use energy. King Feng charged forward with incredible speed, and he thought that he could finally understand it so he could finally use Ghost Dance in combat. King Feng told Yi Wen that he hit him a lot, so it was his turn, and as his image doubled, both Yi Gong Gong and Yi Wen were surprised that there were two copies of him. King Feng took a pill and told Yi Wen that it wasn't over yet because the pill he took earlier was bad. King Feng told Yi Wen that he would show him what the real speed boost pill was, and three figures of King Feng simultaneously charged Yi Wen. Yi Gong Gong and Yi Wen were both surprised to see that there were three copies of King Feng. The three figures of King Feng attacked Yi Wen, who wasn't able to react. Yi Wen directly took all of King Feng's attacks, as he wasn't able to dodge them. As Yi Wen fell, Yi Gong Gong was terrified, and he asked if Yi Wen was dead. King Feng started to approach Yi Gong Gong, saying that it was his turn, and Yi Gong Gong pleaded with King Feng not to kill him. Yi Gong Gong bowed to the ground, saying that he was just an envoy from the third prince and that he was innocent, so he asked King Feng to let him go. King Feng was amused, and he said that he knew that things weren't in his hands. King Feng kicked Yi Gong Gong in the face, resulting in him breaking his neck, and he told him that he should tell those things to the King of Hell. Yi Gong Gong's lifeless body fell to the ground directly next to Yi Wen. King Feng thought that he must throw their bodies into the swamp, and he was pleased that no one would bother him within the jungle. After a few days, news of Yi Wen's disappearance reached the capital. The royal family was so furious that they immediately sent someone to the town of Shadow Cloud to find the culprit, and once the culprit was found, he would be killed immediately. At Shadow Cloud Town's judicial office, King Feng and his troops appeared to be on trial. Someone slammed a wooden cube on the table. It was the royal family's judge. He angrily said that Yi Wen and his soldiers were in the jungle. And at that time, King Fang and his troops were the only ones who went into the jungle, so it must be them who killed them in the jungle. He demanded that they tell the truth. There was a sinister aura around King Fang and his troops as he asked the royal family's judge what he was talking about. He acted helpless and said that every time they went into the jungle, they felt extreme fear, so there was no way they could dare to kill Yi Wen. Kin Sankui also chimed in, and while crying, he asked the royal family's judge if he knew how weak they were, explaining that when they entered the jungle for the first time, they were attacked by a centipede. The guards also joined in the act and said that the centipede hurt them badly, and they asked the royal family's judge if he knew how much it hurt them, complaining that it was so painful. And Hao Chen also acted pitiful as she recalled that they encountered the bloodweb spiders, who attacked anyone who passed by there. And she said that they were very weak, so there was no way they could kill Yi Wen. Presenting his butt, King Feng told the royal family's judge that if he doesn't believe them, he still has marks from the centipede sting on his backside that he could show him. But the judge was perplexed, and he told him to not do it and stop. King Feng and his troops told the royal family's judge that he should believe them that they were innocent because they were very weak. And the judge was having a hard time wondering if the information was wrong. He couldn't believe that Yuan could be killed by those people, and he thought that it would cause a lot of chaos if that information spread. Even though the royal family was very eager to uncover the killer, they didn't really believe that elite members of the royalty would be killed by King Feng and his troops, so they hastily decided to leave the case of King Feng's murder unresolved. 
This was why, at the Qin family residence, King Feng's troops were laughing, saying that they didn't expect that they would succeed in disguising themselves. But they said that everyone was following King Feng's directions, portraying accordingly so there couldn't be a mistake. King Feng told them that during that period, everyone improved significantly. So in the future, when any of them reached the ninth level of Kai and blood, he would provide them with a body purification pill to help them break through to a new stage. He told them that he would give an additional reward of 20 gold pieces to whoever succeeded in advancing to the new stage, and Kin Sangui, along with the other guards, thanked King Feng, saying that they respected him greatly. King Feng thought that although the body purification pill was good, in the end, it was still a first-rate pill, and in fact, the two biggest gains from those tasks were the collection of advanced spirit medicines. At night, in the medicine garden, someone was thinking that they could finally start preparing the bare bone, and the tiger tendon pill. It was King Feng, and he thought that although the bare bone and the tiger tendon pill were third grade medicines, they were extremely rare at present. Because of that, he couldn't take those pills to sell them in any case. He knew that once Lin Xuan and the third prince discovered his ability to refine third grade elixirs, they would easily suppress him, so he must use them only for himself. King Feng placed the remaining pulse grass and awakened the essence of the barbaric bull heart. A huge, fiery aura surged out of the furnace, and it surprised King Feng. As he faced the fiery aura, King Feng thought that it was excellent as the essence of the barbaric bull heart was still there, and the more the remaining essence's energy increases, the purer the refined elixir becomes. The essence of the barbaric bull heart charged at King Feng and tried to attack him, but King Feng confidently told it that its true image was already in his hands. He asked if it still wanted to struggle with his remnants. The barbaric bull heart essence was being subdued by another fiery aura, and King Feng ordered it to submit to him. It continued to struggle while it was being sucked back into the furnace. King Feng said that the timing was right, so he ordered it to extinguish the form and release the elixir, allowing him to create a fiery orb. Seeing the fiery pill, King Feng said that it was very good, as the essence of the barbaric bull heart was perfectly preserved, and he succeeded in refining the elixir of the bare bone and the tiger tendon pill. King Feng immediately took the pill, and he thought that a warrior's absorption of the essence of monsters was extremely beneficial for their training. King Feng started to meditate, and he thought that, thanks to the divine refinement technique, it not only purified marrow and shattered bones but also refined divine consciousness. However, the pain caused by activating blood vessels was enough to make ordinary people collapse, so at that moment, King Feng thought that he must not lose his composure. King Feng emitted a burst of energy, and he thought that the bare bone and the tiger tendon pill could only be used by warriors above the initiation level and there were significant risks in taking them at a higher level of Kai and blood. King Feng was having a hard time meditating, and he thought that when he defied the third grade medicine, the blood vessels were severely damaged. King Feng screamed due to pain while he thought that, fortunately, he accumulated knowledge in chemistry over 10,000 years, greatly reducing damage. As he thought about overcoming that obstacle, he couldn't finish his thoughts as he felt something. The room was lit extremely brightly. He felt that he reached the level 8 of the Kai and Blood Realm, so he succeeded. But King Feng said that it was not enough, and as he questioned how the refined dose made by the Pill God over 10,000 years could only break through one level, he said that the strength of the potency was still there, so it should keep going for him. He released a powerful wave of aura as he performed a breakthrough. The wave of aura reached the skies, and his room was lit so much brighter than before. King Feng breathed out and thought that it was a success, as he was already at the peak of the Kai and Blood Realm. King Feng released his aura as he thought that he was already at the ninth level. He fired an aura-packed punch that broke everything in its way, and he thought that its sensation was completely different from what he felt in the ninth level that he lived before his cultivation was lost. King Feng thought that it was excellent as it had the strength of 1,500 katas, which was an ancient measurement unit used to measure weight in some Asian cultures and was roughly equivalent to about 600 grams. King Feng said that even if he directly fought with someone in a body-tempering realm, he was not weaker than them, and suddenly An Chin popped out of the hole that he created in his room, calling him. As she asked him if his elixir was refined, King Feng quickly covered her mouth. That surprised An Chin, and King Feng told her that she must not leak news of the successful elixir, confirming with her if she understood. An Chin told King Feng that if the main clan discovered that he, who was expelled to the wilderness, became a third-grade alchemist, they would surely welcome him and his family back to the capital. 
King Feng told An Haochen that there was nothing good about returning to the capital as he didn't want to get involved in the clan's internal conflicts, and he added that if he returned, she wouldn't be able to stay by his side anymore, which made An Haochen blush. An Haochen wondered if King Feng confessed to her, and she thought that the news must not be leaked because if it were, she wouldn't see King Feng again. But unbeknownst to her, in reality, King Feng only wanted her to stay by his side to help him with his work. Meanwhile, King Feng was thinking that lately, Lin Xuwen and the third prince would hold an engagement ceremony in the capital, and he thought that they caused him a lot of suffering in his previous life, so he must do something to get revenge. Warning came, and in the Qin family's medicinal garden, someone called King Feng, saying that it had been a few days since they last separated, and he heard that he had accomplished some great things. It was Qin Wanli, he told King Feng that during that period, he should try to stay in Shadow Cloud Town and wait until Lin Xuan and the third prince's wedding was over because maybe they would forget about him. Qin Wanli told King Feng that as long as he was not targeted by the royal family, even if he and his son were sent to that wilderness, they could still live a good life. King Feng was taken aback when he realized that Qin Wanli wanted him to disappear from the limelight in Shadow Cloud Town and live a good life. But King Feng told Qin Wanli that his grandmother in the capital was about to celebrate her 90th birthday, so he wanted to go and congratulate her, and that alarmed Qin Wanli. Qin Wanli told King Feng that he knew that he was obedient, but his current trip to the capital would surely cause dissatisfaction in the third prince's heart, so they should avoid that if possible. To Qin Wanli's surprise, King Feng was adamant, reminding him that he was a warrior. He said that warriors were brave and unstoppable, and he mentioned that he also didn't deserve Lin Xuan and the Yi family, so they shouldn't avoid it. King Feng smirked confidently. As he delivered a punch, he informed Qin Wanli that he was much stronger at the moment. Qin Wanli caught King Feng's punch with the palm of his hand, and he was astonished. His hands shook as he asked King Feng, confirming with him if his cultivation were recovered. King Feng confirmed that he did and said that the progress he had made was not just in refinement. At the Qin family's martial arts arena, King Feng's troops were training, and he told Qin Wanli that currently, they had five guards from the medicinal garden who had reached the ninth level of Kai and blood. King Feng proudly told Qin Wanli that even the weakest of the guards had reached the fifth level of Kai and blood, and they all had battle experience. Qin Wanli was surprised when he heard that there were five at the ninth level because when he left, there was only Qin Sangui, who was at the ninth level, and King Feng told him that it was all thanks to his blessings. Qin Wanli was worried when he asked King Feng if he took all the sky snare fruit and exchanged them for elixirs when he left. He told King Feng that he caused a big disaster by using spirit medicines for his personal cultivation, and that confused King Feng. King Feng asked Qin Wanli what he was thinking and told him that he would know how many fruits were missing if he took a look. King Feng showed Qin Wanli the improved medicinal field and told him that currently, the amount of fruit delivered to the main clan was enough, so the rest could be sold to earn at least tens of thousands of gold. Qin Wanli was surprised, and his mouth was agape while he thought that not only didn't the harvest decrease, it even expanded several times. He pinched himself as he wondered if he was dreaming, asking how much time he spent away because he had never dreamed that the medicinal garden would change to that extent, and King Feng smiled proudly. Qin Wanli agreed with King Feng and told him that he wouldn't stop him from going to the capital, but he reminded him to be calm when facing any issues in the capital but avoid them if he could, and if things didn't work out, he would still support him in Shadow Cloud Town. King Feng agreed, and he told Qin Wanli that he would faithfully follow his teachings. The engagement ceremony for Lin Xuan was still a month away, so before King Feng left, he trained the hunting team. King Feng taught An Haochen the pill refinement technique before leaving in order to provide pills for the hunting team. After half a month, King Feng and Qin Sanki set off on a journey to the capital under the pretense of visiting their great-grandmother but their true purpose was to take revenge on Lin Xuan. Outside the capital, after six days, Qin Sangui was telling King Feng that they arrived at the rest stop arranged by the main clan. The two of them were extremely exhausted, and King Feng said that they could finally have a place to rest after walking for a long time. Qin Sangui told King Feng that, according to the main clan's handwriting, the inn should be very comfortable. The two of them arrived at the city of demon slayings, and it looked so torn down. Qin Sangui couldn't believe that it was the inn arranged by the main clan, and King Feng said that it was excessive, questioning if that was how they welcomed him with no dignity. As they ventured inside, King Feng thought that it was said that a hundred years ago, that city faced a powerful demon, so the Da Zai royal family sent thousands of warriors to kill the demon, and so the city was named Demon Slaying City. King Feng passed by an old man who was holding a jar. 
King Feng thought that after the demon was killed, the city was always filled with sorrow, and people believed that it was due to the Dencian energy from the many who died. So they gradually moved away, and as a result, only a few refugees dared to live there at the moment. King Feng looked crestfallen as he thought that, due to memories from his previous life, he knew the Dencian energy wasn't due to a large number of deaths, but was a sign that the deceased demon was about to resurface. The two of them simply passed by the old man and King Feng continued to think that even if he knew that information, he was helpless because no one would believe that the demon who died a hundred years ago would cause trouble again in the human world. They have arrived at the Kin family ancestral hall, and they wondered if it was for the Kin family members who died in the battle in the city of demon slaying. Kin Sangui told King Feng that the main clan perhaps wanted them to pay respects to their ancestors, which was why they arranged the rest stop there. Kin Sangui confessed that he was afraid that something unclean might appear, and King Feng asked him what he feared when there were many ancestors there. As if right on cue, when King Feng asked Kin Sangui if a ghost could appear in broad daylight, a skeletal hand grabbed onto Kin Sangui's legs. Kin Sangui screamed when it suddenly pulled him up, causing him to be upside down, and King Feng was alarmed. He called Kin Sangui and immediately threw a dagger at the rope that was connected to the skeletal hand but his dagger simply bounced off, and King Feng was surprised that the rope couldn't be cut. Kin Sangui cried and screamed, asking King Feng to save him. Suddenly, people started to arrive in the hall. Both King Feng and Kin Sangui were surprised when someone inside the hall asked who they were while calling them rats and questioning them for daring to invade the ancestral hall of their Kin family. All of them were wearing masks, and as they asked King Feng and Kin Sangui if they wanted to die, Kin Sangui screamed, saying that there really was a ghost there. King Feng told everyone to wait, confirming with them if they were supposed to have entered the Ancestor Hall, and asking them if they were members of the Kin family because they were. One of the masked people asked King Feng if they were members of the Kin family, and he confirmed it with a smile on his face, thinking that they shouldn't bite the hand that fed them, so it was better to communicate. But the masked people became more enraged, and they said that the people they hated the most were members of the Kin family. Kin Sangui was distressed as he told King Feng that it seemed that the masked people had become angrier, while King Feng panicked, wondering if he said something wrong and confirming if they were not part of the Kin family. One of the masked people explained that 30 years ago, the Kin family and the Yi family became enemies, so in order to compensate the Yi family, the Kin family expelled them, the innocent ones, from the Kin lineages and made them sacrifices. The masked person told King Feng that they were all foreign people who were killed by them, and it was the cowardly Kin family that forced them to survive in the city of demon slaying. The masked person accused King Feng of being someone from the inner family who dared to come and pay respects shamelessly. On the other hand, King Feng was trying to remember about the foreigners 30 years ago, and he wondered if they could be the group of people who were expelled from the Kin lineage during that time. King Feng asked the masked person what they wanted to do while remembering that their group of foreigners eventually formed a force and launched repeated revenges against the main Kin family. The masked person told King Feng that, since he was a part of the Kin family, he would dare him to duel with those foreigners. The masked person said that the loser would be punished with either disability or represent their family in surrender because they wanted the world to know that the Kin family was not just a group of weaklings who bullied the weak and feared the strong, and the other masked people behind him cheered. King Feng thought that it was just as expected, and he asked the masked person if they would release his people if he won. The masked person told him that it was to be expected, so King Feng quickly agreed and promised, which surprised Kin Sangui. Kin Sangui asked King Feng what he promised when his cultivation was just recovered, and King Feng told him not to worry because, looking at those people's weak appearances, he could defeat them. King Feng told the masked people that he could see that they were all pale and thin. He confidently told them that he would let them hit him first because only those who could hit him were worthy to be his opponents. The masked people were speechless for a moment. Afterward, they burst out laughing, and their leader said that it was wonderful, and that he couldn't ask for more. Kin Sangui asked King Feng what nonsense he was talking about, but King Feng told him that it was okay and to let them come because he couldn't believe that anyone could defeat him. Suddenly, a huge fist moved so fast. King Feng was alarmed by it. A huge, muscular man hit King Feng, and he was blown away by its powerful force. Kin Sangui was surprised, and he called King Feng with worry in his voice. The masked person laughed and said that people from their clan were truly narrow-minded because they thought that they, as outsiders, couldn't defeat them. 
The man grinned and said that they had mastered the fourfold body refinement, which was a natural divine power, and they had already defeated countless people. So he questioned who in the world of Kai and blood dares to take a blow, saying that it was just seeking death. Kin Sankui was surprised when he heard that the opponent was at the body tempering realm, and as he saw King Feng buried in the wall, he called him and asked if he was okay. King Feng coughed as he stood up, but he told Kin Sankui not to worry because it was just a body tempering realm. He told him that he could still deal with it and thought that. Furthermore, he found the person he was looking for instantly. The man told him that he was not bad because he could still laugh. He charged forward and told King Feng that he hoped he could laugh after the battle was over, which surprised King Feng. King Feng was able to dodge his attack by jumping up in the air. He applied his aura to the pebbles he was holding between his fingers. King Feng threw them and hit his opponent. The pebbles fell to the ground. His opponent laughed as he told King Feng that his attack didn't hurt, and it didn't even itch, so he asked him if he threw those stones to scratch him. The man delivered another punch, and King Feng dodged it again by jumping up in the air, and gave a counterattack by throwing pebbles at his opponent. King Feng smiled as he confirmed with his opponent that his attacks really didn't hurt or itch. King Feng did the same thing as the man continued to attack him. The man told King Feng that he was ridiculous, like a cowardly clown who didn't dare to fight and it was as expected because the Kin family was full of cowards who didn't dare to fight. King Feng laughed, and he told the man that it was whatever, reminding him that he just said that his stones didn't cause him any feelings. King Feng said that it was the time, and the feelings must have come. The man suddenly froze and knelt on the ground. The man didn't know what had happened, and he wondered why he suddenly felt weak and numb all over his body. The masked people couldn't believe that their senior brother actually got knocked down, and their leader was also surprised, questioning how it was possible when King Fent was still at Kai in Blood Realm. King Feng approached his opponent, telling him that he was an arrogant fool, and asked him if he could still fight or if he would just admit defeat. The man was shaking, but he was still determined, and he told King Feng that for a bastard like him from the inner clan, even if he died, he would never surrender to him. The man charged forward to attack King Feng again. But King Feng calmly stood there and told him not to waste his time. King Feng did not attempt to dodge his opponent's attack and told him that his energy was no longer enough to even be able to hit him. But the man's powerful punch landed on King Feng. The man told King Feng to feel his strike and lectured him that it was the result of his arrogance. But the man was surprised when he saw a skeletal hand that was holding onto King Feng's feet. The man was annoyed when he realized that he didn't hit King Feng. But King Feng was caught instead. The man, Kin Fanjong, told their leader, calling him father, to release King Feng quickly because he had never engaged in unfair and dishonorable acts for victory. But the leader just called him a bastard, asking him which fairness he wanted with the inner clan members and telling him that King Feng was an alchemist, so he was not having a fair duel with him as he had been using stones to disrupt his acupoints. Kin Fanjong was surprised when their leader told him that King Feng was secretly undermining his cultivation. Kin Fanjong confirmed with King Feng by asking him if he really was targeting his cultivation during their fight, and King Feng told him that it was sort of. King Feng told him to keep going, as he hadn't surrendered yet. He grinned as he asked Kin Fanjong if he thought that he could beat him just by trapping his feet. Kin Fanjong got mad, and he called King Feng a brat, saying that it was a duel between two men, yet he resorted to such sneaky tactics. He told King Feng that it seemed that the inner clan was full of bastards like him. Kin Fanjong was about to deliver another punch to King Feng, and he told him that he was a cunning and treacherous waste. Just before he got hit with Kin Fanjong's punch, King Feng jumped into the air, and that surprised Kin Fanjong. King Feng was able to dodge Kin Fanjong's punch. He made him hit the skeletal hand that grabbed his foot and broke it. Then, he told Kin Fanjong that he just mentioned his innate divine power. King Feng grabbed Kin Fanjong's arm. Kin Fanjong was alarmed when King Feng twirled in the air while still holding his arm. King Feng informed Kin Fanjong that his innate divine power alone wasn't enough, and he knocked him off the ground with his kick. King Feng's kick was so powerful that Kin Fanjong was buried into the floor, and the concrete floor was destroyed. Kin Fanjong could only scream in pain. On the other hand, the leader of the masked people couldn't believe that his iron claws were broken, and the other masked people were surprised as well. Meanwhile, Kin Sangui celebrated and told King Feng he was amazing for using Kin Fanjong's own strength against him. Kin Fanjong coughed, and he trembled as he tried to stand up. He was alarmed when King Feng approached him, confirming that he couldn't fight anymore and asking if he surrendered. 
King Feng smiled sinisterly, and with stones in the palm of his hand, he asked Qin Fanjong if he should disable his cultivation. Qin Fanjong glared at King Feng and told him to go ahead and disable his cultivation because he wouldn't surrender to their filthy inner clan members. King Feng accepted Qin Fanjong's answer, and he smiled brightly, saying that he admitted defeat while dropping the stones from his hand. The masked people, Qin Fanjong, and Qin Sangui were all surprised. Qin Fanjong angrily asked King Feng what he was talking about and reminded him that he must have known that he represented the Qin family, so if he admitted defeat, it meant that the Qin family surrendered. King Feng was surprised, so he said that there was no such thing, as it was not right, and he told Qin Fanjong that it was just a matter between the two of them, so he admitted defeat, which was no big deal. Qin Fanjong told King Feng that he was such a shameless person as he walked away, saying that since one side admitted defeat, it was over, and he had to go and save his people because Qin Sangui was going to have a cerebral hemorrhage. The other masked people helped Qin Fanjong up, asking him if his internal injuries wouldn't worsen when he was beaten up just like that, and Qin Fanjong told them that it was fine because he could still bear with it. Suddenly, Qin Fanjong realized something, and he didn't know what was going on. He realized that he no longer felt any pain in his body, and all his internal injuries were healed. Qin Fanjong realized something when he looked at the stones that were lying on the ground. He thought that it was not right, and he finally understood that King Feng didn't use the stone to hinder his cultivation. But instead, he healed his internal injury during the battle. While King Feng was busy helping Qin Sangui out, Qin Fanjong was thinking about how his power was unbalanced because of all those internal injuries. Remembering King Feng's final move, Qin Fanjong realized that King Feng even guided him on how to use his power during the fight. Qin Fanjong was enraged, he called King Feng a bastard, accusing him that he never considered him a worthy opponent since the beginning of the duel, and he told him that he could have defeated him, but he surrendered, so he asked King Feng if he was trying to humiliate him. King Feng told Qin Fanjong that they were all part of the Qin family. He took a step forward, and as he passed by Qin Fanjong, he asked him if they needed to fight each other to the death like enemies when it was between family members, which surprised Qin Fanjong. King Feng approached an altar. He knelt on one of the cushions and said that Qin ancestors were the best. Hu King Feng began to pay his respects by introducing himself, and he swore that the younger generations would do their best to clear the grievances of the ancestors who were expelled. He swore that one day they would rewrite the Qin family genealogy and restore their ancestors' status so that the Qin family would no longer have outsiders. But Qin Fanjong and Qin Sangui were surprised when they heard what King Feng said. Qin Fanjong looked puzzled because, as he could recall, his adoptive father had told him that the Qin family looked down on them as outsiders. He remembered how he was beaten when he was young while a man called them disgusting outsiders and ordered his people to remove them from his sight. Those people threatened to kill him if they caught him again. While King Feng was still bowing, Qin Fanjong thought that the insiders didn't see them as human beings, but at that moment, he could truly feel that those insiders from the Qin family in front of him treated them like family members. Qin Fanjong admitted that he lost, and he told King Feng that he could leave, promising that they wouldn't bother him anymore. The leader of the masked people was surprised. King Feng thanked Qin Fanjong, and Qin Sangui told King Feng that he was the best. Suddenly, someone hit Qin Fanjong with a wooden weapon from behind, calling him a bastard. It was the leader of the masked people, as he kept hitting Qin Fanjong. He questioned him about who allowed him to give up and ordered him to attack and kill King Feng for him. Qin Fanjong took all the beating and endured it as he told the leader that the duel was over and he lost. So as agreed, he would no longer fight King Feng anymore. The leader called him a fool, asking him if he had forgotten what the Qin family did to his family and if he would just let King Feng go just like that. The other masked people tried to stop their leader and reminded him that Qin Fanjong's internal injury was caused by being beaten like that before. Suddenly, someone grabbed the wooden weapon with their hand. It was King Feng, and while Qin Fanjong was puzzled, their leader was surprised when King Feng told him that how the Qin family handled their issues was their old business, calling him a stupid old man from the Yi family and asking who told him that it was his turn to intervene. With a sinister look on his face, King Feng leaned into the leader and asked him if he wanted to keep it up because he knew that the receptionist who sent him there was Qin Dahai from the Qin family. The leader was startled, but he feigned innocence, asking King Feng what he was talking about and asking which kind of clan master was Qin Dahai because he didn't understand. King Feng was amused that the leader was claiming to be an outsider, and he told him that he had seen him before in the main clan, so he was clearly an insider, a member of the clan pretending to be an outsider. King Feng told the leader that, if he was not mistaken, the demon-slaying city wasn't arranged by the main clan for them, 
but it was him who brought him there on purpose. He told the leader that earlier. He noticed that the material of the rope was royal black gold, which was something that only the royal family could possess. So if he had that weapon, he must be related to the Yi family. The leader denied all allegations, telling King Feng that he was speaking nonsense, and he asked him if he could insult him like that just because he was an outsider. King Feng told the leader that if he still wanted to argue, he dared him to confront both the Qin and Yi families with him, and if he was innocent, they would meet him again. The leader was taken aback by what King Feng said. He laughed and gave up, telling King Feng that he didn't expect the Qin family to have such a sharp-eyed and observant little devil like him. The leader, the receptionist of the Qin family's clan, Qin Dahai, removed his mask and admitted to King Feng that he was an insider from the Qin family and, to be precise, he was about to become a member of the Yi family. Qin Dahai said that the Qin family was one of the five major families, but it was the weakest while the Yi family was the strongest. Which is why, for so many years, he has been training outsiders to deal with the insiders of the Kin family, and he finally gained the trust of the Yi family to become a part of them. He said that the Yi family had finally decided to give him a chance. Qin Dahai admitted that as long as he eliminated King Feng and presented it as a gift to the Yi family's engagement banquet, he could leave the Kin family and become a true member of the Yi family. King Feng said that he didn't expect such a traitorous dog to be part of the main clan of the Kin family. On the other hand, Qin Fanjong looked horrified as he asked his adoptive father, Qin Dahai, if, after all those years, he was pretending to be an outsider to deceive them into becoming the Yi family's lackeys. Qin Dahai shamelessly admitted, saying that they were all just lackeys of the Yi family, so they should be grateful to the Yi family. He told everyone that since King Feng had exposed his identity, anyone who was willing to follow him to enjoy the prosperity in the Yi family should kill King Feng for him. The masked people were debating whether they should listen to Qin Dahai, who deceived them, and one of them said that although Qin Dahai deceived them, he thought that they should choose the Yi family, to which another one agreed, saying that after all, it was the Yi family's world at the moment, so he also wanted to be with the Yi family. They said that it was the Yi family's money that raised them, so it didn't matter if they became their lackeys, and they all decided to kill King Feng. While they charged forward to attack King Feng, they said that they would follow the Yi family and kill King Feng, and Qin Sangui quickly stood in front of King Feng, saying that he would stop those ungrateful people for him. Qin Sangui was confused when King Feng tapped him on the shoulder and told him that some people may be ungrateful, but there were also others who were willing to sacrifice themselves for justice and righteousness. King Feng told Qin Sangui not to worry, and as Qin Fanjong stood up, King Feng said that the lion had awakened. Qin Fanjong glared at the people in front of him. He quickly stood in front of King Feng and Qin Sangui, and he roared loudly, which interrupted the masked people from attacking. As Qin Fanjong was about to deliver a punch, he pointed out to the masked people that they all knew the truth, but they were still willing to be dogs for the outsider. Qin Fanjong released a tremendous amount of power, which sent the masked people flying, and he told them that they didn't deserve to be members of the Qin family. Qin Sangui was confused as to why Qin Fanjong was helping them, while King Feng just knowingly smiled behind him. Qin Fanjong defeated the rest of the masked people. Qin Dahai asked him if he disobeyed him and reminded him that he was his adoptive father while he was just a dog raised by the Yi family, so he hurried up and gave it to him. Suddenly, blood splattered out of his face as a huge fist hit it. Qin Dahai was sent flying and twirled into the air. Qin Fanjong said that Qin Dahai was a dog that barked loudly, and he didn't know what happened. He yelled that his surname was Qin from the Qin family, and the blood flowing in his body belonged to the Qin family's martyrs so he would never kneel, and he would never be someone else's dog. King Feng thought that when he actually found out that it was the group of people who were outsiders, he recalled in his past memories that there was a person named Qin Fanjong among the outsiders. As he remembered, Qin Fanjong had extraordinary talent and immense strength, so if he could win him over, it would be a great help for him, which is why he started to make a move. All of the masked people in the room were knocked out, and King Feng thought that he wanted to use his strength to find Qin Fanjong. Qin Fanjong looked sinister as his eyes gleamed when he turned to look behind him. He approached King Feng, which alarmed Qin Sangui, and he quickly blocked Qin Fanjong's way, asking what he wanted and if he wanted to fight them. Carrying some things, Qin Fanjong said that because of them, he had nowhere to eat at the moment. Qin Sangui was surprised when he recognized that it was their luggage, and Qin Fanjong told them that from that day forward, he reluctantly had to hang out with them because, by following them, at least he would have something to eat. Qin Sangui couldn't believe what Qin Fanjong said, while King Feng laughed and said that there was, of course, no problem if he wanted to join them. 
King Feng extended his hand and told Kin Fan Zhang that if he followed him, he would be fine. But he had to be careful because he might go hungry for three days and miss nine meals. Kin Fan Zhang grabbed King Feng's hand as they had an agreement. He said that it was still better to starve with them than to be someone's dog. And King Feng was pleased, saying that they would enjoy good fortune and endure hunger together. Suddenly, horses arrived in the area, and the people riding them confirmed that they saw King Feng ahead. They confirmed that King Feng and his companions were all inside and ordered their men to surround the area. King Feng wondered what was going on. A lot of men quickly flooded and surrounded the area. They quickly recognized them as the Yi family's troops, and they didn't know what to do. Someone stepped forward and greeted King Feng, saying that it had been a long time since they saw each other, and he said that they were just conducting routine investigations. It was Lin Lang. He said that they would soon find out that King Feng from the Qin family came to the demon-slaying city and fought against the outsiders, but he couldn't defeat the outsiders, so he ultimately met a tragic end. King Feng pointed out that Lin Lang knew about the outsiders and that he was in Demon Slaying City, which made him realize that Qin Dahai must be the one he was directing, and he thought that Lin Lang had planned it all along. Lin Lang confidently asked King Feng what he could do to him, pointing out that he still had some influence in Shadow Cloud Town, but he insisted on coming to the capital, where his sister was the fiancé of the third prince of the Yi family. With the Yi family's tempering body troops behind him, Lin Lang boasted that his influence at the moment was not what it used to be. Qin Fanjong was surprised when he recognized that they were the Yi family's tempering body troops, and he said that he could still handle one or two tempered bodies. But with so many, he was afraid that there was no escape, while Qin Sangui was worried about King Feng. Lin Lang commanded the tempering body troops to attack, and they immediately complied. As they got surrounded by enemies, King Feng apologized to Qin Fanjong for encountering all that when he just joined them. But Qin Fanjong told him that it didn't matter because even if he died that day, at least he would die with dignity. King Feng was hyped up, saying that they should go as the people of the Qin family would rather die in battle than live in mediocrity, so they should fight their way out as there might still be a glimmer of hope. Qin Fanjong laughed and said that it was no problem because he owed King Feng a huge favor, so he would do everything he could to help him escape. On the other hand, Qin Sangui, who was still trembling, urged their opponents to come at him, and he said that he was no longer afraid. Qin Sangui and Qin Fanjong said that, as members of the Qin family, they would rather die in battle than live in mediocrity, while King Feng told their enemies that he wanted to see if they could keep them there. Suddenly, someone laughed and clapped, saying that what they said had been good. It was the old man from earlier, and he said that the good man would rather fight to the death than live, so he stated that they were good men because they would rather die in battle than live. Lin Lang asked his troops who that old man had been, calling him a crazy drunkard, and he stated that nobody could see them, so he ordered his troops to kill the old man, to which the troops immediately agreed. One of the soldiers attacked the old man with his sword and told him to get lost, but before the soldier could land his attack, he was so surprised when the old man tapped him powerfully on the chest. The soldier was immediately sent flying towards King Feng, and King Feng was startled. He couldn't react in time, so he was hit by the soldier's body, and King Feng, Qin Sangui, and Qin Fanjong simultaneously asked what was happening. On the other hand, Lin Lang cursed, and he immediately ordered everyone to protect him and kill the old man. The family's troops immediately surrounded the old man and said that they would kill him, which alarmed King Feng. With sinister looks on their faces, the troops came charging toward the old man, but the old man twirled the staff he was holding behind his back and attacked the troops with it. All the troops were sent flying away when the old man waved his staff in a slashing motion, and Lin Lang was surprised. Qin Sangui and Qin Fanjong were also surprised, while King Feng realized that he might know the old man as he pointed out that the old man could fling all those powerful soldiers into the air in one fell swoop. The old man laughed hysterically as he said that he could and he said again that the Qin family would rather die than live. The old man opened his staff as he questioned how his Qin family could be a slave for another family, and he said that he had been useless for a long time. The old man slammed his staff on the ground as he said that he would no longer be useless that day, and a bright golden light that came from the staff shot up into the sky. It exploded into the sky, creating a bright symbol, and the old man said that they should return to the madness of adolescence. King Feng, Qin Sangui and Qin Fanjong were surprised when they recognized the thing that was waving in front of them. The old man was holding onto a battle banner. Suddenly, the ground shook. A large number of troops started to march. They prepared for battle with their shields in front of them. In just a few moments, the entire demon-slaying city looked like it was filled with troops, and the Yi family's troops that were surrounding King Feng, 
and his companions earlier were also surrounded. Lin Lan groveled on the ground when he saw that the Kin family battle banner summoned the Kin family army, and he couldn't understand how that kind of war level thing was there. On the other hand, King Feng was surprised when he saw the battle banner, and he thought that the Kin family's battle banner and the Kin family's battle matter were different because the battle matter could be used by the Kin family while the battle banner could only be possessed by those who had achieved great military exploits for the Kin family. King Feng thought that once the battle banner was raised, the entire Kin family would enter a state of preparation for war, and the standard bearer could give an order to wage war at any time. He thought that there were only a few members of the family who had the battle banner. While one of the Kin family's soldiers greeted the old man and said that they awaited the battle banner bearer's orders, King Feng wondered who the old man could be with the battle banner. They addressed the old man as a grandmaster and said that they were at his command. The soldiers knelt on the ground, and they welcomed the grandmaster back to the family. King Feng was surprised to hear that the old man was a grandmaster, and he thought that it was no wonder that he could defeat the body tempering experts so easily. He thought that although the body tempering experts were strong, the scales differed when facing a grandmaster, and since no one reached the first stage of the strength pyramid, that meant that the grandmaster stage was the strongest stage. King Feng thought that it meant that the old man, Yu Lao, was the greatest strength of the legendary Qin family, and he was at the sixth level of grandmaster, so that strength would have extremely high respect even in the five great families. He remembered that Yu Lao disappeared over 30 years ago, and never appeared again, so he wondered why he appeared at that time. Yu Lao said that he remembered that when he was young, the Kin family started to decline, and at that time, there was a constant struggle between the Kin family and the other families. He recalled that 30 years ago, he was bullied by the Yi family, and as the bullying got worse, he couldn't stand it and let his military squad to fight back. He said that it was the Yi family who made trouble first but the Kin family was afraid of retaliation from the Yi royal family. Yu Lao said that he was the reason that his squad was lynched. He said that to see such a weak, shameful concession, he thought that the Kin family was hopeless, and although the Kin family didn't punish him, he punished himself by living in seclusion in Demon Slaying City. Yu Lao pointed at someone and said that that day, he saw hope in that young man from the Kin family. He was pointing at King Feng who was surprised, and Yu Lao said that he had seen all of his tolerance and vigor that day. Recalling the things King Feng did that day, Yu Lao said that the lion was waking up and it was time for the lion of the Qin family to wake up. So that day, he raised the battle banner to announce his return to the Qin dynasty, not to start a war. But Yu Lao announced that everyone should know something important, and he said that the Qin family should be united instead of pleasing outsiders and killing each other. Yu Lao told King Feng that he was once disappointed with the leadership of his family, but at that moment, someone like him had appeared in the Qin family, which surprised King Feng. Yu Lao smiled brightly as he talked about the future of the Qin family. He handed the battle banner to King Feng and told him that he would perhaps leave it to him to lead the family. The soldier who had kneeled in front of Yu Lao earlier immediately kneeled in front of King Feng, and he announced that the bannerman had changed, informing the troops to wait for the orders of the new bannerman. The soldiers identified themselves as the Qin family forces, saying they were waiting for the new bannerman's orders and were at the behest of the new bannerman. They all chanted that they would listen to the orders of the new bannerman. Meanwhile, Lin Lang was terrified when he heard that all those men were in King Feng's army, and he wondered if King Feng was going to cut him into pieces. As he wondered what King Feng would do to him, Qin Fan Zhang approached King Feng, and he was laughing, saying that it was a good idea because, like that, he could quickly gather the Qin army by using the banner. King Feng smiled as he thought that it seemed that Yu Lao decided to hand over the command of the army to him, so he gave him the battle banner, but he questioned if he qualified for that. With Lin Lang and the Yi family's troops kneeling on the ground, Yu Lao asked King Feng how he would deal with those who wanted to harm him. King Feng bowed at Yu Lao and thanked him for trusting him, but he said he thought using the battle banner to deal with a bunch of garbage was very annoying, and Yu Lao was amused, so he asked King Feng if he was going to let them go. As soon as Lin Lang heard what King Feng said, he vigorously bowed his head to the ground and said that King Feng was really merciful, thanking him for sparing their lives over and over again. King Feng's expressions went dark as he said that it was just that he didn't want to kill Lin Lang just to avoid starting a war between Qin and Yi because of that rubbish, but that didn't mean that he wouldn't torture Lin Lang. King Feng immediately turned sinister as he said that, in fact, he had a more murderous and heartbreaking way, which made Lin Lang terrified, asking him what he wanted to do. On the other hand, at the mansion of the third prince in Beijing, people looked nervous as they gathered there. 
Yi Fan, the royal dynasty's third prince, was angry when he heard about the story of the Qin family battle banner, and he complained that it was his engagement day, so he was afraid that that story would scare his guests. Yi Fan quickly called one of his men and ordered him to quickly find out what was going on, to which the man nervously agreed. Lin Xuan later arrived, and with tears in her eyes, she told Yi Fan not to be angry because something big might have happened outside, and she hoped that the battle banner would not cause any inconvenience to him, so she said that she wanted to postpone the engagement banquet. Yi Fan disagreed. He told her that regardless, the engagement banquet had to be grandly celebrated, and he would make Lin Xuan the envy of the whole city. Lin Xuan hugged Yi Fan with a cunning look on her face, and she told him that she was not interested in fame and fortune because, as long as she had him by her side, it was enough, and Yi Fan told her that she didn't have to think so much for others. Suddenly, a soldier came in to report to Yi Fan, saying that the Qin family's army had arrived and they had surrounded the mansion. Both Lin Xuan and Yi Fan were surprised by the news. The Qin family's army had indeed surrounded the mansion, and four men were leading them in the front. Yi Fan was mad, calling them scoundrels, and he said that the Great Zi Dynasty was under the control of his Yi family, so he asked where the Qin family's army came from and if they were planning a rebellion. King Feng, who led the army, introduced himself and said that he came specifically to attend the engagement banquet of Yi Fan and congratulate him. Lin Xuan immediately recognized King Feng, and she wondered how he got there when she asked her eldest brother to go and eliminate him in Demon Slaying City. Yi Fan got angrier when he recognized King Feng as Lin Xuan's friend from Shadow Cloud Town, and he told him to get out as they didn't welcome him to their engagement banquet. King Feng sighed, and he told Yi Fan not to be in such a hurry because he didn't come empty-handed. The soldiers dropped Lin Lang to the ground, who was tied down and crying, and King Feng told Yi Fan that it was a gift that he couldn't refuse. Yi Fan and Lin Xuan were both surprised when they saw Lin Lang. King Feng told Yi Fan that Lin Lang had disgraced himself by committing an indecent act with a so in Demon Slaying City, and he was captured by the villagers. He said that just as Lin Lang was about to be immersed in a pig cage, they happened to pass by and rescue him. King Feng said that the villagers were still agitated because of the So's lost chastity, so if they didn't let him attend the banquet, he would have no choice but to send Lin Lang back. The guests of the banquet were surprised when they heard that Lin Lang, the eldest uncle of the third prince, had actually assaulted a So, and they said that the moral decline was really alarming. Lin Xuan was so enraged that she asked King Feng what nonsense he had been talking about and she almost confessed that she had clearly asked Lin Lang to go and kill him, but she managed to stop herself mid-sentence before revealing who or what she had asked him to kill. King Feng quickly taunted Lin Xuan and asked her what she had asked Lin Lang to kill, and Lin Xuan was left speechless. Lin Xuan quickly told Yi Fan that it was better not to escalate things, so they let King Feng attend the banquet and Yi Fan informed King Feng that he would give him face since Lin Xuan said so. King Feng thanked Yi Fan as he entered the banquet along with Qin Sangui, Qin Fan Zhong, and Yu Lao. They left dirty footprints behind, and Yi Fan was disgusted by it, questioning what kind of people King Feng had brought and saying that it was simply lowering the standard of their wedding banquet. Qin Sangui looked back at Yi Fan and asked King Feng what they should do next since Yi Fan seemed very annoyed. King Feng explained that, after all, he had a brief encounter with Lin Xuan, and she was in the spotlight on that highly anticipated day of the wedding banquet. With a sinister look on their faces, King Feng told his companions that it was to be expected that they needed to leave an impression on Lin Xuan and give her unforgettable engagement banquet memories. A few moments later, someone announced that the wedding banquet had begun and that Yi Fan would deliver a speech. Yi Fan proudly introduced Lin Xuan to the guests, saying that she was the woman he loved the most. He explained that not only had Lin Xuan been chosen by the moon-shaking immortal palace at a young age, but she had also been willing to be the woman behind him despite such an honor. She had made a vow to only be his woman for the rest of his life. Lin Xuan acted shy in front of Yi Fan. The guests were touched, and they said that the prince married a good, pure, and kind young woman and they were moved to tears. On the other hand, Qin Sangui was enraged, saying that it was all nonsense because all Lin Xuan wanted was to be Yi Fan's wife, and she was a derogatory term. King Feng told Qin Sangui not to be like that because anger made them lose their sobriety, and Qin Sangui asked him if he wanted to let Lin Xuan go like that. King Feng grinned sinisterly as he told Qin Sangui that he wouldn't do that, but instead of cursing, they should fight. King Feng stood up and told Yi Fan that he had been Lin Xuan's friend since they were kids, and he knew she was a good girl, so he asked Yi Fan to let him extend his warmest congratulations to Lin Xuan. Lin Xuan immediately got nervous, and she told King Feng that he didn't have to say it. 
but Yi Fan told Lin Xuan that it was fine, and they should let King Feng speak because he would like for everyone to hear how good she was. King Feng thanked Yi Fan, and he told him that, in fact, Lin Xuan's simplicity and kindness were far beyond his imagination, so he should listen to him carefully. King Feng said that when the Lin family was weak and broken, Lin Xuan grew up with the Qin family. He said that it was him and his father who supported Lin Xuan and made her grow, and Lin Xuan also entered into a marriage contract with him in order to repay. The guests were surprised to hear that Lin Xuan entered into a marriage contract with King Feng because they remembered that Lin Xuan said that she only married Yi Fan. On the other hand, Qin Sangui started playing the role of King Feng, while Qin Fanjong played the role of Lin Xuan, who was making a promise to King Feng with her body, and King Feng continued his speech, saying that Lin Xuan was so good that the third prince fell in love with her. King Feng said that it was great that Yi Fan fell in love with Lin Xuan, but Lin Xuan didn't cause him any trouble. Meanwhile, Qin Fanjong, who was still acting as Lin Xuan, told Qin Sangui, who was acting as King Feng, that an important person fell in love with him, and Qin Sangui acted surprised, asking Qin Fanjong if he wanted to leave him. Qin Fanjong suddenly told Qin Sangui that he actually wanted to kill him, immediately stabbing him with the chicken feet, and Qin Sangui acted like he coughed up blood and told Qin Fanjong not to do it, calling him his love. As King Feng continued his speech, stating that Lin Xuan took the initiative to seal his martial arts and thus broke off the engagement and left him, Qin Sangui and Qin Fanjong acted out what he just said behind him, and the guests looked at them amusingly. King Feng acted dejected as he stated that Lin Xuan's condition got better after all, and he was only the one who helped her become what she was, so he couldn't interfere in her life. The guests were surprised, and they questioned if Lin Xuan was really that kind of woman, saying that she was not good at all, ungrateful, and a fraud. Meanwhile, Lin Xuan looked horrified, and she cursed King Feng in her head, thinking that he was a sly guy pretending to praise her, but he was actually making fun of her. Seeing King Feng's grinning face, Lin Xuan cursed in her mind again as she realized that King Feng turned the tables against her. Yi Fan immediately defended Lin Xuan, asking King Feng what he meant by his face and saying that those were lies because he didn't know Lin Xuan as she was not that kind of person. King Feng threw a plate at Yi Fan, and he told him that maybe he didn't know her, but he did know one thing. Yi Fan caught the plate, and he asked King Feng what it was. King Feng told Yi Fan that he would bear the consequences of used goods. Yi Fan was extremely enraged by what King Feng just said. Lin Xuan immediately fanned the flames, telling Yi Fan that for King Feng to insult her was a small matter, but to insult him was a big matter, so Yi Fan immediately told King Feng that he would punish him, and he ordered his men to arrest King Feng. The guards fiercely charged towards King Feng's table immediately, but suddenly, King Feng slammed something on the table. It was the Qin family's battle banner, and Qin Fanjong cunningly asked King Feng what it was. King Feng dragged his chair and confidently sat on it with his feet on the table, and he said that it was a toothpick as he would like to clean his teeth with a big toothpick. He grinned as he confirmed if that made sense. Yi Fan's men were suddenly alarmed. They immediately stopped their attack and bowed down to King Feng. The guests were surprised when they recognized the Qin family's battle banner, and saw that the Yi family guards were all kneeling on the ground. Yi Fan couldn't believe what he saw, so he asked how the Qin family's battle banner could be that far. One of the guards reported to Yi Fan that they investigated and found out that the new bannerman of the Qin family was King Feng, which surprised Yi Fan. King Feng sat confidently in the middle of all the commotion, while Yi Fan couldn't help but express his disbelief that King Feng was the bannerman. The guard advised Yi Fan that they must not do anything reckless because one of the people sitting next to King Feng was one of the ten masters of the Qin family. They addressed Yu Lao as the clumsy old man. Both Lin Xuan and Yu Fan were shaking as they found out that the clumsy old man was a Qin family overlord. Yu Lao calmly asked Yu Fan what it meant when he suddenly asked someone to jump beside them. Yu Fan nervously grabbed a cup, and he was lost for words. He nervously told Yu Lao that he just wanted to offer him a drink to enjoy his meal while thinking that there was nothing he could do since the family elder was not there. The guard told Yi Fan that they investigated the matter of Lin Lang regarding his molestation of a pig, and it turned out that it was King Feng's slander. But Yi Fan told him to shut up because even if it was a slander, King Feng currently had a battle banner with a grandmaster at his side. King Feng and his companions stood there mightily, and Yi Fan said that no one would dare touch or deny them. Meanwhile, Lin Xuan was cursing in her head, saying that her Lin family would have been famous in the capital starting that day. But since King Feng had made a fuss, her family had become the object of ridicule for the entire city. Lin Xuan was extremely mad, and she was thinking that she wouldn't let King Feng get away with his act. 
A few moments later, King Feng and his companions walked out of the mansion, and Kin Fan Zhang was laughing, saying that it was amazing, while Kin Sangui was telling King Feng that he was really good at making people angry even without a single swear word. Ironically, King Feng proudly told Kin Sangui that he wouldn't be proud even if he praised him, while Kin Sangui just laughed, saying that he was very humble, and that both of them were unaware of the guards that were approaching them. King Feng was surprised when the guard suddenly grabbed the Kin family's battle banner out of his hand. Someone suddenly grabbed him by the shoulders. It was another guard, and the guard immediately slammed him into the ground while bringing his hand behind his back. While King Feng was arrested, both Kin Sangui and Kin Fanjong asked who dared to arrest the Kin family's banner man. It was Kin Jan, the head of the Kin family, and he said that, by order of the Kin family association of elders, they were there to take back the Kin family's battle banner. He added that they were also bringing the war criminal King Feng to the Kin family law enforcement hall to prosecute him for his actions. King Feng, Kin Sangui, and Kin Fanjong were all surprised. A few moments later, at the Kin family enforcement hall, someone called King Feng. It was one of the elders, and while King Feng was tied up, kneeling in front of them, the elder told him that he used the battle banner to cause a huge commotion at the Yi family's engagement banquet, which almost caused a war between the Kin and Yi families. The elder asked King Feng if he was guilty. King Feng responded that the Yi family attacked him first in Demon Slaying City, so he counterattacked, and since the war did not break out, he questioned how they called him a war criminal. The elder told King Feng that he had a sharp tongue, but he shouldn't think that he would get away with it just because there was no evidence against him, and he should know that they were not the ones who would judge him that day but the granny. King Feng was surprised by what the elder said, and the audience were also surprised that the granny pronounced the verdict. Kin Sangui was nervous as he thought that Granny Lu was the most powerful in the Kin family, and anyone who fell under her rule would be finished, even if they were innocent. Suddenly, someone from the audience laughed, telling King Feng that he never imagined that he would see him in a situation like that. It was Kin Yulan, and he told King Feng that he would be imprisoned, so that was the difference between them. King Feng was surprised when Kin Yulan admitted that he was the first to inform the court of his use of the battle banner. Suddenly, someone announced that Granny Lu had arrived, and Kin Yulan told King Feng that his good days were over. As soon as Granny Lu arrived, she immediately told King Feng that some said that he used the battle banner to go to the Yi family to stir up trouble and that he also violated family laws by arbitrarily associating with foreigners who had been expelled long ago. Lu Fangua, Granny Lu's full name, was Kin Jan's mother, who was also a grandmaster level two, and she asked King Feng if he acknowledged his actions. King Feng bravely admitted his actions in front of Lu Fangua. Lu Fangua came down the stairs. She approached King Feng and asked him for the reason for doing those things. King Feng expressed his derision at the question, asking for a reason. He said that the Yi family had always underestimated them, and he had always been so disgusted with the laws the Yi family made to exclude foreigners, which surprised Lu Fangua. King Feng stood up confidently as he told Lu Fangua that their family's laws were pedantic and despicable, so he thought that it was time for a change. The elders were fuming mad as they asked King Feng what he was saying, and they told him that what he was doing was rebellion. On the other hand, Lu Fangua raised her staff, as she confirmed with King Feng if those were his reasons. Kin Sangui looked worried as he thought that King Feng was confused because, unlike all the masters there, Lu Fangua was of the Grand Master level, and on the other hand, Kin Fanjong was confirming if King Feng hadn't been convicted yet. Meanwhile, Kin Yuleng was laughing, telling King Feng to count his crimes in front of Lu Fangua, calling him a traitor, and saying that his name would be removed from the family. But suddenly, Lu Fangua used her staff to break the chains that bound King Feng's hands. She laughed and said that it was what she expected of her intrepid grandson, and she told him that it was well said. King Feng was surprised and confused by what Lu Fangua had just done. Kin Yulan, the elders, and Kin Sangui were all so surprised that they couldn't help but ask Lu Fangua if she was going to release King Feng. Kin Yulan tried to protest by reminding Lu Fangua that King Feng had committed too many crimes and he told her that King Feng should be expelled from the family. Lu Fangguo was enraged when she heard Kin Yulang suggest expelling King Feng, and she told him that their family desperately needed someone like Ling Feng, someone as brave as him to break the unjust laws. Lu Fangguo said that she understood King Feng's thinking as she talked with Yu Lao, and she said that Yu Lao told her that King Feng treated people equally without discrimination. She added that foreigners were good people, and she asked everyone if they visited them once to get to know them. One of the elders got nervous when he heard that Yu Lao, 
who had just returned, had already talked about King Feng, and he asked about King Feng's judgment. Lu Fangua said that since the Five Great Families Wasteland Reclamation Competition was just around the corner, King Feng would go and participate in the Wasteland Tournament. The elder was so surprised that he couldn't help but question if it was not enough that King Feng was not punished. But he was also rewarded. Tian Yuleng protested again by reminding Lu Fangua that there were only a limited number of places that were already booked. And he questioned why King Feng would get everything he wanted, pointing out that it was against the law. Lu Fangua agreed with Qin Yuleng that according to the rules, the places were already full, which made Qin Yuleng grin while thinking that he would not allow King Feng to gain any benefit. Lu Fangua smiled and announced that King Feng would take over Qin Yuleng's place. Qin Yuleng looked like he was struck by lightning when he heard Lu Fangua's announcement. He started to cry as he questioned Lu Fangua as to why she gave King Feng his place. Lu Fangua told him that it was because he was a snitch and that she also hated in fighting. King Feng immediately thanked Lu Fangua, and he thought that, in fact, the Wasteland Reclamation Competition was the best way for the disciples of the Qin family to be stronger, and if they performed well, they would achieve great achievements for the main family. Lu Fangua announced that she would establish a new youth squad and that she would choose a group of young people with experience in land reclamation. She looked at King Feng and called him. King Feng was surprised when Lu Fangua told him that he would be the leader of the squad. Qin Sangui and Qin Fanjong rejoiced, saying that it was great as it looked like King Feng had secured a prestigious job, while Qin Yuleng was mourning and questioning why it was King Feng. Lu Fangua told King Feng that the level of leadership he could eventually reach depends on his hard work, and King Feng told her that he wouldn't disappoint her. King Feng thought that if he could become a leader, he could build great relationships and power, so in the future, he would have a great deal in the main family. A few moments later, at the library, King Feng was looking at the huge building, thinking that it had been a long time since he had been away from the main family, so he was going to learn some new techniques to help him in the future. King Feng slowly opened the door to the library. As he entered, he thought that although there were many techniques in his previous memory from his previous life, learning and acquiring new techniques wouldn't hurt. King Feng saw the book The Blood Monster Knife and the Turtle Breathing Technique. As he looked at them, he thought that he could learn the Blood Monster Knife book to fight ferocious monsters while the turtle breathing technique could block poison. But only two books were not enough, he thought that there were so many books there, and he wondered when the day would come that he would memorize them all by himself. Suddenly, King Feng was confused when someone from the outside called him, asking if he was hiding in there. It was Qin Yulang, and he was mad at King Feng for daring to take his place in the Wasteland Reclamation Competition, so he wanted to fight him. King Feng told Qin Yuleng that he didn't deserve to be his opponent, and as for his place, Lu Fangua gave it to him. He told him that if he wanted to fight, he should go to Lu Fangua, and Qin Yuleng was hit by the fact that King Feng was Lu Fangua's great-grandson, rendering him speechless. Qin Yuleng taunted King Feng and told him that he thought he was just afraid. His muscles bulged out as he told King Feng that he should have inquired about the training he had practiced for three years for the Wasteland Reclamation Competition. His clothes started to rip, and he urged King Feng to come and fight him. King Feng looked to his side nonchalantly, and he looked confused. King Feng saw Qin Yuleng with bulging muscles, telling him that his secret technique was to crush 800 pounds in one move, and he asked him if he could keep up with that. Qin Yuleng's men were amazed at his strength, and they looked glad that they were able to see the Yuleng secret technique again, saying that his strength was equivalent to that of a legendary god. Qin Yuleng urged King Feng to come at him and fight like a man. He jumped up in the air as he said that he would prove that Lu Fangguo was wrong. Qin Yuleng was up in the air, above King Feng, and he said that he would prove that he could destroy King Feng in one move. But suddenly, a fist landed on Qin Yuleng's face. It was King Feng's, and as Qin Yuleng twirled in the air due to its force, King Feng told him that he was annoying and shouldn't bother him while he was looking through books. As Qin Yuleng crashed into the ground, his men ran towards him, calling out his name with worry. King Feng glared at them as he told them that searching for books was stressful, so they shouldn't bother him again or else he would make them sleep forever. Qin Yuleng's men admitted that King Feng was a very strong person with a powerful punch because he brought down Qin Yuleng in one fell swoop. But suddenly, more men surrounded King Feng and told him that defeating Qin Yuleng was not a big thing. King Feng told them that he didn't hear them, and he asked them if they didn't get enough sleep. With his face swollen, Qin Yuleng said that he knew that those boys wouldn't go with the wind and that they would support him in difficult times. But suddenly, his men kneeled in front of King Feng, and with twinkling eyes, they told him that from that day forward, he was their new big brother. Qin Yuleng was extremely surprised. He asked his men what they said and what that nonsense was, he asked them if they dared to betray him. 
but they simply looked at him condescendingly and clicked their tongues. They asked Kin Yulung who he was, as the position of big brother belongs to the strongest person, and they said that he looked very familiar. Kin Yulang was hurt, and he coughed up blood, exclaiming his disbelief that those boys had denied him so quickly. On the other hand, King Feng looked disgusted, but he agreed for them to be his little brothers if they helped him find martial arts technique books. While on the back of his mind, King Feng was thinking that those boys were so ungrateful that he couldn't accept being their big brother. The boys quickly moved and told King Feng that it was no problem as they would help him find the book he wanted quickly. King Feng smiled as he thought that, despite not being able to accept them, having so many people help him search for martial arts technique books could save him a lot of time. A few moments later, King Feng was curious when he heard someone say that the five great families would hold an auction, and he couldn't help but ask them. He talked to the boys, and one of them was happy that there was finally something that King Feng didn't know. Another one of them said that in a few days, the five great families would hold an auction to exchange and bid for resources. Another one added that, in a truer sense, it was an auction to show off power. They said that their kin family had nothing to show, so they were afraid they would just have to watch the other family's show of strength but they hoped to see the Qin family succeed even once. King Feng was deep in thought, and he thought it was strange because the Qin family was equal to the rest of the families in almost everything. However, it was less important than others. He looked at the boys, and he thought that seeing the family so weak all that time made the new generation feel frustrated. And if the new generation lost confidence in themselves, the family would not progress. King Feng told the boys that, in fact, the Qin family had always hidden its strength and the boys looked so happy as they asked King Feng if their family was really strong. Kin Feng confirmed, saying that in the upcoming auction, they would see the strength of the Kin family, and he thought that some rare pills were bound to be offered at the auction. A few moments later, at the Kin Jai Dan Fang district, King Feng was thinking that that year, the family should let him, as a 100,000-year-old alchemist, take care of the family. He looked around, and he thought that even though the King family had no alchemists previously, they still didn't skimp on spending on alchemists. King Feng arrived at a rundown building, and he thought it was the alchemy room conferred on him. He looked so disappointed as he wondered if it was his den, and he asked where the stove was. Suddenly, someone welcomed King Feng. It was a blonde girl, and she introduced herself as the collector of herbs in that place, and she was responsible for helping King Feng make medicine, so she requested that he give her more advice. King Feng awkwardly greeted her, recalling that the Kin family allocated alchemy rooms based on the strength of the herb collectors. As he glanced at the current alchemy room, he pondered whether the girl could have been the weakest among them. King Feng examined the interior of the alchemy room. When he saw the herbs on the pots, he concluded that the girl wasn't the weakest, as she had meticulously classified herbs according to their medicinal properties. If she were inexperienced, she wouldn't have categorized them so accurately. While observing the girl working, he wondered why the Kin family had her working in the worst alchemy room. He speculated if there were hidden reasons but decided that as long as he had an iron pot to make pills, he wouldn't meddle in matters that didn't concern him. King Feng inspected the contents of the other jars and asked the girl for her name. She introduced herself as the flower girl, Hua Ju. King Feng was surprised to hear her name and accidentally dropped the cover of the jar he was holding. He informed Hua Ju that her family name was Hua and inquired if she might be old Hua's granddaughter. Hua Ju confirmed that he was correct but questioned how he knew about her grandfather. King Feng introduced himself and mentioned that her grandpa had been a hero who had collected medicine for the Kin family for many years. He asked if she was being mistreated by someone, finding it hard to believe she had been assigned to such a basic alchemy room. Tears welled up in Hua Ju's eyes when she recognized that King Feng was the person her grandfather had often talked about. She urged him to follow her, as she would take him to meet her grandfather. King Feng quickly opened the door and asked Grandpa Hua if he were alright. He recalled that Grandpa Hua was the best herb collector in the Kin family at that time, an excellent herb collector that could collect many high-quality herbs for the family. Grandpa Hua was the one who introduced King Feng to herbs in his childhood, and he was his alchemist mentor, so without him, he wouldn't be the person he was that day. But currently, Grandpa Hua was lying in bed. He was weak, and tears filled his eyes when he saw King Feng, and he asked him why he came back. King Feng immediately asked Grandpa Hua who hurt him, but Grandpa Hua was hesitating to tell him. Hua Ju chimed in, and she told King Feng that it was Kin Yulang. She said that after Kin Yulang knew that he became an alchemist, he remembered that her grandfather taught him everything about herbs, 
so he came and beat up her grandfather. Hua Ju cried as she told King Feng that Qin Yulang also used his brother's authority to assign them to the worst alchemy room, so she didn't have money for her grandfather's treatment. Grandpa Hua reprimanded Hua Ju, and he told her King Feng's family had been demoted to Shadow Cloud City, and they were already in an unenviable position, so she shouldn't make trouble for him. King Feng looked so crestfallen when he realized that what happened to Grandpa Hua was because of him. King Feng told Grandpa Hua that without his guidance, he would not have reached where he was that day. He looked so mad, and he told Grandpa Hua that he would avenge him. Meanwhile, in the largest alchemy room of the Qin family, someone was ratting out to their brother that King Feng didn't just hit him. It was Qin Yulan, and he was telling his brother that King Feng stole his disciples too, so he must achieve justice for his brother. His brother, Qin Gulan, told him not to worry because he just assigned King Feng the worst alchemy room and it was his first step to take revenge on him. King Gulang smirked and said that after that, he would suppress King Feng even more and make him regret things, but he was not able to finish what he was about to say. Someone barged into the room by kicking the door, and Qin Yulang was also surprised by it. It was King Feng, and he looked so mad as he walked into the room with Hua Ju behind him. Qin Yulang greeted King Feng and told him that he was coming to settle scores with him, but he didn't expect him to come to him himself. Without any warning, King Feng punched Qin Yulang in the face. King Feng punched him one more time, and a few of his teeth were dislodged. Qin Yulang was sent flying again by the force of King Feng's punch, and Qin Guling was worried. King Feng told Qin Yulang that a real man did not fight helpless people, and he confirmed with him if he was the one who hurt Grandpa Hua. Qin Guling looked extremely scared as he asked King Feng what he would do. King Feng challenged him to a herbal collecting competition against Hua Ju, and he said that if she won the competition, they would take the room they were currently in. King Feng confidently said that if she lost, he would be at their disposal. Qin Yulang immediately urged Qin Guling to agree to the challenge. He would kill King Feng, and Qin Guling immediately accepted King Feng's challenge. Hua Ju told King Feng that she couldn't do that because, in the past, her grandfather was collecting herbs while she was just watching and learning, so in that case, he would be in trouble. King Feng told Hua Ju to not be afraid, as she could do it, and he was thinking that he wouldn't be able to trap Qin Yulang and Qin Gulang if he didn't use himself as bait. A few moments later, in the mountains, a few herb collectors were gathered, and Qin Gulang announced that it was time for the traditional herb collecting competition. So they would go to the barren mountain for two hours, and the person who collected the highest level of herbs would win. Qin Gulang introduced his best herbal collectors to King Feng, and Qin Yulang told King Feng that there were more than 10 people, so he was doomed. But King Feng confidently told them that Hua Ju learned from Grandpa Hua, so he believed in her. Qin Gulang announced that the competition began. His herbal collectors immediately started running, leaving Hua Ju behind. Hua Ju tried her best to run and catch up to them. She thought that she was late from the start, so she doubted if she could really do it. A few moments later, Hua Ju came across a renewal bud. She was glad as it was a second-grade spiritual herb, and she thought that if she chose a second-grade spiritual herb, she might even win the competition. But suddenly, one of Qin Guling's herbal collectors grabbed it from her, shamelessly saying that he would take it from her. Hua Ju told the man that she found it first, but the man just laughed and told her that whoever kidnaps it will be the owner. King Feng was still calm, and he told Hua Ju to never mind it. He reminded her that she learned from Grandpa Hua, so a second-rate spiritual herb didn't matter because even if they all came together, they wouldn't defeat her. Qin Yulang smugly asked King Feng if he was blind, and he said that there was no way that such a fool would be stronger than dozens of people. Qin Guling grinned sinisterly as he said that King Feng thought that one girl could defeat his men. Hua Ju was still looking around, and Qin Guling's herbal collectors surrounded her, and they picked the herbs around her. After picking, they quickly ran away, and Hua Ju was distressed as there was nothing left because, as long as there were herbs that could be picked, those men wouldn't leave even a fraction of them. Qin Guling said that there was still half an incense stick left, and Qin Yuling was telling King Feng that death awaited him as they hadn't picked up a single herb yet. Hua Ju was crestfallen, and she gave up, thinking that it was over and they lost, so she would implicate King Feng. But King Feng told Hua Ju that there was still a chance. That surprised Hua Ju. King Feng told her to use the Grandpa Hua method to find the herb with her heart, and he encouraged her that she would definitely be able to do it while he thought that Grandpa Hua was her alchemy mentor, so there was no way to fail. Hua Ju was filled with determination as she agreed that she could do it because if she lost to them, she would not deserve to be Grandpa Hua's heir. She looked around and saw something sparkle up in the mountain. 
Hua Ju rejoiced in her mind when she found it, and she thought that there were still spiritual herbs that could be harvested. Even with her hands filled with bruises, Hua Ju climbed the mountain with all her might. The other herbal collectors laughed at her, saying that she was already risking her life to find weed, but it was impossible because they picked everything that could be picked, so she would not find anything of value. Hua Ju was almost reaching the herb, and she encouraged herself by thinking that she could win because her grandfather taught her, so she had to believe in her abilities. Hua Ju reached out to grab the herb, and she thought it was the last hope for victory. A few moments later, the herbs were presented on the table, and someone said that after examination, it was found that what Hua Ju had brought was nothing but a bunch of ordinary weeds, and the worst ones for them were the first-rate spiritual herbs. It was Kin Gulam, and he told Hua Ju that she lost and that she was really the worst herb collector. Hua Ju couldn't believe it, and the people behind her laughed at her, saying that they still couldn't believe it was rubbish. King Feng was juggling a torch in his hand when Kin Yulang approached him and told him that the winner had been decided, so he wouldn't overhit him if he admitted defeat. But as King Feng grabbed the torch, he asked Kin Yulang, who told him that they lost. He threw the torch on the table and told Kin Yulang that he seemed blind, which surprised both Kin Yulang and Kin Gulang. Kin Yulang angrily asked King Feng what he was doing, while Kin Gulang accused him of trying to burn the herbs to destroy the evidence. King Feng told them that it was not his intention and that real gold was not afraid of fire, so he wanted them to keep their eyes open and take a good look. Kin Yulang said that the medicinal herbs were all burned, and he asked King Feng if she couldn't see the ashes. Suddenly, an herb shone brightly and both Kin Yulang and Kin Guling were surprised that there was still an herb. Kin Yulang asked Kin Guling what it meant because the highest grade of the herb they found was second grade, so he asked him if it could turn into a third grade herb after being burned. But Kin Guling looked shaken as he told Kin Yulang that it was more than just a third grade herb. He said that it had turned into a fourth grade magical herb, the flame stream flower. King Feng smiled triumphantly. Kin Yulang was surprised to hear that it was a fourth grade magical herb, and one herb collector chimed in saying that it was one of the rarest herbs in the entire region. King Feng explained that the flame stream flower looks like dry grass and grows on the slopes of mountains, so reaching it requires not only sharp eyesight but also great courage. King Feng told Kin Gulung's herb collectors that many of them couldn't find it even after they preceded Hua Ju, and he asked them to say who was the strongest herb collector there. The herb collectors couldn't admit it, and all they did was curse and glare at King Feng. Kin Yulang asked Kin Gulung if it was true but Kin Guling told him that it didn't matter if it was true or not. Kin Guling immediately offered to pay 500 gold coins to Hua Ju so she would sell the herb to him. Kin Yulang was surprised when he heard the price, as it was equal to his salary for two years, while the other herb collectors said that it was equal to his salary for 10 years. Hua Ju was thinking that 500 gold could be enough to buy Grandpa Hua's medicines for several years, and she was about to accept the deal. But King Feng interrupted her and told Kin Guling that he should be ashamed of himself for trying to fool a girl, and Hua Ju was surprised. King Feng leaned over as he asked Kin Guling if he knew that the flame stream flower was priced by auction, where only the most skilled herbal collectors could find it, and Kin Guling was intimidated by him. Everyone was surprised, including Hua Ju, when King Feng told Hua Ju that he would buy the flame stream flower from her for 10,000 gold coins, which was twice the market price so she could buy Grandpa Hua's medicine and live a decent life. Kin Guling was surprised by the price, as it was equal to his salary of 10 years, and Kin Yulang wondered when poor King Feng became so rich. Kin Guling gritted his teeth as he told Kin Feng that he was the winner, and he thought it didn't matter because it was just a fourth grade magical plant. And as long as Hua Ju worked for him, he would have a continuous flow of level 4 herbs in the future. But King Feng beat him to it. King Feng told Hua Ju that his team needed an herbalist, so he offered that he would take care of Grandpa Hua from that moment onward and asked her if she would be willing to be his herbal collector. Without further delay, Hua Ju readily agreed, and Kin Guling was surprised. Kin Guling tried to convince Hua Ju to keep working for him, and he promised her that he would give her a better room than the one they were in. He also said that he would provide her with the best areas for collecting herbs, not like those who were offended when he called them trash. But Hua Ju firmly told Kin Guling that she didn't want to work with him and that she would work with King Feng. Both Kin Guling and Kin Yuling were knocked down by a huge rock. Hua Ju thought that King Feng was the first person who believed in her talent after her grandfather, and he also really helped her and her grandfather. Meanwhile, King Feng was pleased, as the good herb collector was a powerful support for the alchemist, and in the future, when he was not in the medicinal garden, Hua Ju could collect spiritual herbs with his team.
King Feng told Kin Gulang and his men that from that moment onward, that room of theirs would belong to Hua Ju, so he told them to leave the place. Kin Gulang and his men willingly left the place, and as soon as they were outside, Kin Gulang threw a tantrum, saying that losing his house was small compared to losing a rare talent like Hua Ju. He blamed Kin Yulang, calling him an idiot and saying that it was all his fault, he said that he shouldn't have antagonized them, and Kin Yulang admitted to Kin Gulang that he had made a mistake. A few moments later, in the largest alchemy room of the Qin family, King Feng was standing in front of a furnace, saying that it was indeed the most luxurious alchemy room in the Qin family, and it was really good, so with the help of that furnace, he could refine a high-level elixir to put on the auction. King Feng thought that before that, he would use the flame stream flower to improve his strength because the medicinal effect of the flame stream flower could help a person enter their body. He thought that its primary use was to defeat inner demons, but the Westland Reclamation competition was coming soon, and he wanted to achieve a good result in the competition. King Feng said that he needed to take a risk, and he began meditating. King Feng sweated profusely as he meditated. Suddenly, an ominous figure that resembled him stood in front of him. King Feng was surprised when the figure suddenly choked him. The figure resembled an evil version of him and told him he didn't deserve to survive and should have died long ago because he was the sinner who couldn't keep his family alive. King Feng felt pain as the figure continued to choke him and wondered if it was the devil living inside him. He recalled that it was said if one was killed by the inner demon, the body would die as well. King Feng gritted his teeth and thought it didn't matter. Infusing his fist with a fiery aura, King Feng grabbed the demon's arm and prepared to punch it. To his surprise, the demon caught his punch at the palm of its hand effortlessly. The demon called him an idiot and claimed it knew him very well. The demon punched him, asking what he was fighting for and telling him he was nothing but a coward who brought harm to others. King Feng coughed up blood, and the demon told him he had nothing to protect. The demon used King Feng's move, the ghost dance, and told him he didn't deserve to live at all. King Feng coughed up blood again as he fell to the ground, and the demon stepped on him. King Feng clicked his tongue and realized he forgot it was his 100,000-year-old demon. He lay helplessly on the floor and looked defeated, thinking the 100,000-year demon was too strong. He lost consciousness and wondered if he was going to die there. The image of the demon sinisterly smiling at him was the last thing King Feng saw. Suddenly, in the darkness, he could hear voices calling him a young master. Images of Kin Sangui, An Hao Chen, Hua Ju, Kin Fanjong, and Kin Wanli filled the darkness. King Feng woke up, his eyes filled with determination, refusing to die. He dug his hand into the demon's chest and said it was because there was still hope, which was why he had to put everything he had into trying. The demon coughed up blood, and King Feng said he also went and worked hard to get any chance. He told the demon that even if he died, even if he was doomed, he would never surrender to anyone. As King Feng started to rip the demon apart, he said that included himself. King Feng yelled from the top of his lungs as he ripped the demon apart, and it splattered in all directions. Back in reality, King Feng, who meditated, emitted a strong surge of aura. He finished meditating and thought that he finally broke through the realm of body strengthening, so he could now fight against level 4 body strengthening experts. This made it much easier to make alchemy for the family. Time passed, and the largest alchemy room of the Kin family looked peaceful. Suddenly, Kin Sangui reported to King Feng that Kin Gulang and Kin Wen arrived, and it seemed they were there to cause trouble for them. King Feng agreed that Kin Wen was not a good man, so he went to take a look. With Kin Yulang and Kin Gulang behind him, Kin Wen immediately confronted King Feng, accusing him of coming to stir up trouble in the clan by occupying the alchemy room. Then he asked King Feng if he asked the elders of the family before doing so. Kin Wen, an elder and the father of Kin Yulang and Kin Gulang, told King Feng that the auction was approaching, and the family was in dire need of an alchemy room to make pills. He asked King Feng what punishment he deserved for trying to disrupt the auction. King Feng confidently told Kin Wen that he was already an apprentice alchemist, and he occupied the alchemy room just to refine the elixir for the family in time so that the family could compete with other families. Kin Wen mocked King Feng, saying that he had only learned alchemy for a few days, but he already thought he deserved the best alchemy room, and Kin Guling chimed in, saying that the alchemy created by a newbie would probably embarrass the family. King Feng gestured to a huge box that Kin Sangui was opening and he asked Kin Wen and his sons if they were sure. Kin Wen and his sons were flabbergasted when King Feng opened the box full of golden pills and told them to take a look at what he made over the past few days. As soon as the box was fully opened, a huge number of golden pills greeted Kin Wen and his sons, and they were all startled. 
Kin Wen recognized that it was a body strengthening pill with a quality higher than 8, and Kin Guling said that even a second class alchemist might not be able to produce that quantity, so Kin Yuling questioned if King Feng made those. Kin Yuling and Kin Guling didn't stop there, and they told King Feng that he shouldn't think the family would ignore the fact that he took over the largest alchemy room just because he made a batch of body strengthening pills. Kin Sangui and King Feng blindfolded themselves as King Feng said that he still had third grade pills so he wondered if he would convince the family to forgive him, and Kin Wen and his sons were confused as to why they were blindfolded. As soon as Kin Sangui opened the box he was holding, an extremely bright light escaped from it, and Kin Wen and his son's eyes were bloodshot due to its shininess. Their jaws dropped, and they couldn't contain their surprised reactions when they saw the third grade pills. King Feng whispered to Kin Wen that there was something about the potion aside from it being a third grade pill, and Kin Wen was astonished. On the other hand, Kin Yuling claimed that the pills must be fake, and Kin Guling added that it was impossible for King Feng to refine a third grade one. But to their surprise, Kin Wen slapped them and told them to shut up, he reprimanded them, saying that they were in the same generation as King Feng but there was such a big difference between them and him. Kin Wen grabbed King Feng's hand. His eyes twinkled as he told King Feng that the alchemist's room would be regarded as a reward from the main family, and he would go with him to represent the Kin family at the auction. Kin Yulung and Kin Gulung couldn't believe what they heard, so they asked their father if he was serious. King Feng immediately thanked Kin Wen for his kindness, and in his mind, he was rejoicing, telling the auction that he was coming. A few days later, at the auction site, the host announced that the auction of the five major families had officially started. King Feng stood beside Kin Wen, and he thought that auctions were a showcase of family strength. He glanced to his side and thought that only powerful families have a voice. He looked at Yi Fan who offered 40,000 gold coins for 50 body-strengthening pills. Yi Fan also bought the Great Bone Bow for 20,000 gold. He had a great time as he paid 300,000 gold for the 7th grade pill. Meanwhile, the boys of the Kin family cursed, saying that the Yi family stole the limelight again, as it happened every year, and their Kin family could only watch. On the other hand, Yi Fan grinned, thinking that since King Feng dared to come to the auction that day, he would make the Kin family lose face. He smiled evilly, thinking that he would avenge the shame of the wedding banquet. But suddenly, Yi Fan noticed something. He looked agitated when he realized that in the past, the Kin family seemed confused when they didn't get anything. But it was different this time. He could see that King Fen was smiling as if he had a winning face. The host announced that the auction was over, but King Feng told him to wait because the Kin family still had a lot to offer, and the host was surprised. The host told them that if they had any good stuff, they could come up and auction it off, and King Feng thanked him. Holding a pill in his hand, King Feng told everyone that, as they all knew, ordinary body strengthening pills were not effective for warriors, but his body strengthening pill, which had a quality of 8 points, could effectively improve strength. Yi Fan asked King Feng if an 8 point quality was indeed rare, but it was just one pill. He inquired if it was as good as the 57th grade pills his family had just bought. The other people laughed at King Feng for daring to bring only one pill, saying that if they didn't have the goods, they shouldn't participate in the auction, and they claimed that the Kin family was a disgrace. The boys of the Kin family cursed, and they said that it looked like King Feng was humiliating himself. But King Feng confidently said on stage that if he only had one, it would have been really funny but it was one of his collections of body-strengthening pills. Multiple boxes filled with pills were presented on stage. King Feng said that there were a hundred of them. Everyone was extremely surprised when they heard that there were a hundred of those eight-point body-strengthening pills. Yi Fan gritted his teeth, and he was wondering how an ordinary family like the Kin family could produce pills of eight-point quality. On the other hand, the boys of the Kin family were entranced by the sight of the 100 body strengthening pills with 8 point quality, wondering if their family was wealthy, and they said that King Feng was awesome. The bidders were in a frenzy, fighting each other and saying that such quantity and quality could significantly improve their family warrior's strength, so they had to take them. Yi Fan quickly offered 200,000 gold to win the pills, and he said that anyone who dared to stand up to his Yi family would be considered an enemy of the royal family which startled everyone. The other bidders gritted their teeth as they said that the Yi family was again relying on the obscene authority of the royal family to dominate things. But 200,000 at once was really a substantial amount of money. Yi Fan smiled evilly as he wondered why the Kin family didn't keep that kind of good stuff for their family instead of selling it. And he said that King Feng was really stupid. Meanwhile, King Feng had agreed that the body-strengthening pill would be taken by the Yi family. 
He grinned and thought that it was actually a redundant pill that they didn't need, but Yi Fan thought he had won the deal. With Kin Wen carrying a box, King Feng said that they were about to show their trump card. Everyone was surprised when they heard that the 100 high-quality pills were not the Kin family's trump card, and they wondered if it could be that the Kin family still had a treasure. King Feng told everyone that it was a third-grade elixir. The bidders lost interest when they heard that it was a third-grade elixir, saying that it was not exactly a grand finale because there was a family that showed up with a similar elixir too earlier. But King Feng addressed the bidders and told them that it was not an ordinary third-grade elixir. He confidently told everyone that they would know that when they saw the elixir. As Kin Wen opened the box, a powerful aura of a white tiger emerged from it. The bidders were startled when the aura charged towards them. Everyone was immediately startled when they recognized that it was an illusion created by the mutation of the elixir. So what King Feng was presenting was an extremely rare mutated elixir, and ordinary third-grade elixirs were nothing compared to it. Up on stage, Kin Wen was proudly thinking that it had been so dignified. He remembered that when King Feng had told him it was the third-grade mutated elixir, he had asked King Feng to accompany him, and he had been glad that King Feng was right. On the other hand, Yi Fan was sweating profusely as he couldn't believe what was happening, and he wondered if the Kin family could really have hired an alchemy master. The bidders frantically ran up on stage, saying they must buy that mutated third-grade elixir at any cost, and they were fighting to get it for their families. Suddenly, Yi Fan, who was also in a panic, said he would buy it on behalf of his father, and anyone who tried to take it would be disobeying the royal family. The other bidders cursed when they heard that at that time, Yi Fan was using the emperor's name to pressure them, and they shamed him. King Feng agreed, telling Yi Fan that he should give him half a million gold coins in cash, and he would give him the elixir. Yi Fan smiled as he thought that King Feng was such a fool for selling away that superb elixir, and he ordered his subordinates to give the money to King Feng. But to his surprise, the lady in charge told him that because of his purchase of the 100 body strengthening pills and his reckless spending, he had already spent all the money authorized by the emperor. The boys from the Kin family snickered as they said that Yi Fan had no money. On the other hand, King Feng clicked his tongue, and he acted disappointed in front of everyone, saying that Yi Fan had no money. King Feng grinned, and he told Yi Fan that he was a big ass if he didn't have money, and a clown. Yi Fan looked extremely mad, and he clicked his tongue in frustration. In the end, the Kin family auctioned off the mutant third grade pill for 700,000 gold. It became the most honorable family, and boys from the Kin family flocked to King Feng, telling him how awesome he was. On the other hand, Yi Fan had an unpleasant look on his face as he left the auction house, while the lady assisting him chased after him, and he repeatedly said that it was a shame because the Yi family became the laughing stock of the auction. Meanwhile, Kin Wen thanked King Feng because their Kin family hadn't had a good time at an auction for many years. Kin Wen told King Feng that he had brought great glory to the family at that time, so he would mark his great achievement, and King Feng thanked him. But Kin Wen told King Feng not to rejoice too much because he became the spotlight, and that has advantages and disadvantages. Kin Wen said that that day, King Feng shined, and he would be remembered by so many that when the Westland Reclamation Competition is held, he might become targeted. King Feng was alarmed by what Kin Wen said. Kin Wen continued, setting Yi Fan as an example, saying that although his cultivation was ordinary, he had a fifth-level bodyguard and that man could defeat many in one go. Kin Wen also mentioned Bai Leng, the new member of the Bai family, and said that his martial arts skills were so powerful that he had no rivals below the sixth level of the body strengthening realm. Kin Wen mentioned Nangong Zukan of the Nangong family. He said that he heard that when Nangong Zukan fights, no one can defeat her. Kin Wen mentioned Sidu Xuanju of the Sidu family, saying that he relied on his ancestor's fighting style and that he was good at assassination, so he was considered an extremely dangerous enemy. Kin Wen pointed out to King Feng that he thinks that Nangong Zukan and Sidu Xuanju are the most dangerous, so he must be careful. King Feng thought that Kin Wen seemed to think that Yi Fan was the most ordinary, but on the contrary, he was his greatest threat. King Feng remembered that in his previous life, Yi Fan possessed a strange skill to hide his strength, and no one could tell what he was up to. Looking determined, King Feng said that the countdown had begun, so he had a lot of work to do before the big competition, and he had a lot of work to do before he got his body hardened. Three days later, the Kin family's grandma Lu Fangyu's birthday banquet was held, and someone announced that the representatives of the four great families had arrived. 
people were busy opening boxes, and one of them noted that the Yi family, the Bai family, the City family, and the Nangong family all sent big gifts. Liu Fangua seemed happy, and she laughed as she thanked everyone, saying that it was a great honor for her. Suddenly, a lady arrived, and she mentioned that the four major families had all presented gifts, but she hadn't seen the Qin family present their own gifts yet. It was Lin Xuan, the representative of the Yi family, and she asked if the Qin family couldn't even afford a decent gift. Qin Yulong and Qin Guling were enraged, saying that every time the Yi family did that, knowing that their Qin family was not as rich as theirs, they deliberately compared themselves with their family. Lin Xuan sat proudly, thinking that it was expected that the Qin family could not be compared to the Yi family in terms of wealth, so it was a wise choice to abandon the Qin family from the beginning. Suddenly, Lin Xuan's attention was caught when King Feng told Lu Fangua that he had come to present a gift to her. King Feng said that it was a simple gift for her, and it was nine-point body-strengthening pills. He opened the box he was holding, and it revealed ten shining pills. Everyone was surprised when they saw the ten nine-point body-strengthening pills, and they said that they thought they were worth 50,000 gold. Lin Xuan chimed in, but she was still smug, even though she admitted that 10 nine-point body-strengthening pills were really rare. She said that, compared to the 300,000 gold gift from her family, it was not worth mentioning. Qin Yulang exclaimed his frustration, saying that it was a battlefield of the five families' secret rivalry, and Qin Guling told King Feng that it would be better not to give that little gift because it was embarrassing. But King Feng was still confident, asking them who told them that he was done, and he asked Lin Xuan why she started bragging. Lin Xuan was agitated when she heard King Feng said bring something up. King Feng presented huge boxes containing a total of 200 high-quality body-strengthening pills, which were rated at 9 points, and he stated that it was his gift to Lu Fangua. Both Qin Yulang and Qin Guling were surprised and commented that 200 pills were worth millions of gold. Lin Xuan couldn't believe that it was true and wondered how the impoverished Qin family could have so many pills. King Feng leaned in towards Lin Xuan and told her that she had abandoned his family when she won the heart of the Prince of the Moonlight Palace. He informed her that since he became an alchemist, he hoped that she didn't regret her choice. As King Feng and his men walked away, Lin Xuan was shaking in anger, thinking that King Feng was a disrespectful individual trying to insult her. On the other hand, King Feng nonchalantly walked away, whistling, and both Qin Yulang and Qin Guling were annoyed that King Feng repeated his actions. A few moments later, in a building, someone was laughing loudly, stating that the Yi family had been suppressing the Qin family for years. It was Lu Fangua, and she told King Feng that he had made the Qin family proud since his return, and that was the best gift she had ever received. Yu Lao said that King Feng had given so much that he deserved a reward, and Lu Fangua said that she could accept one request from King Feng. Qin Jian chimed in and said that it was a great honor for Yu Lao to ask for a reward on his behalf, so he advised King Feng that he had to think carefully before stating his request. King Feng paid his respects and said that since Yu Lao had done so many favors for him, he had only one request when he returned to Shadow Cloud Town in the future. King Feng said that he would like Yu Lao to accompany him and stay there for a few years. Qin Jian, Lu Fangua, and Yu Lao were all surprised when they heard what King Feng said. Qin Jian got mad at King Feng and told him that he had exceeded his limits by asking Yu Lao for a favor in return. King Feng stood his ground and said that he knew Yu Lao had less than three years left to live. Yu Lao was surprised when he heard that and asked King Feng if he was saying that he was dying. King Feng confirmed that it was the case and mentioned that it was what his alchemist master foresaw. But his master also said that there was a way to increase Yu Lao's lifespan as long as he went to Shadow Cloud to protect him. King Feng remembered that in his previous life, Yu Lao died after three years, and losing him as a force to be reckoned with resulted in more pressure on the Qin family than on other families. He thought that before being strong, the family still needed to rely on Yu Lao's support for a while. Qin Jian also asked King Feng if it was really true because if his master could increase the lifespan of Yu Lao, it would have been equivalent to keeping the Qin family's great power. Yu Lao laughed, and he said that if that was the case, it didn't matter if he went to protect the others because he also wanted to live a few more years. Lu Fangua told King Feng that he got what he wanted, and he thanked her for it. King Feng thought that with Yu Lao, the great master, it would have been a big help when they went into the Misty Woods. King Feng told Lu Fangua that he had one more request, and he told her that Qin Fanjiang was his right-hand man so he hoped he would also be included in the Wasteland Reclamation competition. Lu Fangua agreed, but she told King Feng that he was asking for a foreigner to join the family, which was impossible, warning him that he would face the challenge from other people in the family, and so she asked him if he was sure to accept that. King Feng told her that he was certainly sure of it, 
The morning came, and somebody confirmed with someone if they really said those things. It was Kin Fan Yong, and he asked King Feng, who told him to just get ready for the competition with other disciples tomorrow, and Kin Fan Yong couldn't believe it. Kin Fan Yong looked excited, and he said that with that, he would also be able to contribute to the Kin family. Suddenly, someone was yelling outside, demanding for King Feng to come out with Kin Fan Yong calling him a foreigner. Kin Fan Zhang, King Feng, and Hua Ju were surprised. King Feng stepped out, and he saw a lot of people gathering there, so he asked what was going on. Kin and Kin Zhu Wu, both second-level body strength experts, and Kin Tian Kiong, a first-level body strength expert, told King Feng that he had repeatedly broken the rules and asked his family to give him places to participate in the competition. They called him arrogant, and demanded that he come on out. King Feng immediately recognized that some of them were the boys who had wanted to take part in the competition. So, he told them that if they wanted to challenge them, they should wait until the next day. Kin Fanjong called them boring boys. Kin told them that he thought they were afraid and called them cowards. He asked them if they wanted to wait until the next day to get their butts kicked. They pushed the beaten and tied down Kin Sangui to the ground and asked King Feng if they were sure they really wanted to wait until the next day. King Feng and Kin Fanjong were surprised when they saw Kin Sangui. Kin, Kin Zhu Wu, and Kin Tian Kiong told King Feng and Kin Fanjong that if they wanted them to leave Kin Sangui, there were only two ways, either return the places they had taken in the competition or defeat them there, otherwise, Kin Sangui would die. Kin Sangui told King Feng not to fight the boys because they were all at the body strengthening realm stage, and it was important to reserve his strength to participate in the competition. Kin Zhu Wu laughed, saying that King Feng wouldn't dare to fight them, and Kin added that King Feng must have wanted to take Kin Fanjong with him to the competition as his bodyguard. While kicking Kin Sangui, Kin said that otherwise, King Feng would have been beaten to death by them because he was very weak. But to his surprise, King Feng suddenly appeared in front of him, and with a terrifying look on his face, King Feng asked him if he really thought that he would be beaten to death by him. King Feng landed multiple hits on Kin's body before his companions could react, and he told them that they were a joke. King Feng gritted his teeth and said that he didn't want to teach them a lesson. He sent Kin flying, and everyone was astonished. King Feng told Kin that since he was so determined to be taught a lesson, he deserved it. Everyone was surprised when they saw that King Feng was so strong because they had thought he was weak. Kin Zhu Wu found it impossible, as he still thought that King Feng was weak, and Kin Tian Kiang agreed, saying that they were told they should only be wary of Kin Fan Zhang. Suddenly, someone jumped off the ground. It was Kin Fan Zhang, and while mid-air, he asked them if they were sure they had to beware of him. Kin Fan Zhang asked them if they could really do that, and Kin Zhu Wu and Kin Tian Kiang were surprised. Kin Fan Zhang smashed the ground in front of them. They were blown away by the overwhelming power of the impact, and all they could do was curse and protect themselves with their arms. Kin Zhu Wu and Kin Tian Kiang mentioned that Kin Fan Zhang was indeed powerful, and they had underestimated him. Both of them were horrified when Kin Fan Zhang grabbed their heads, guided them to look ahead, called them idiots, and said that they had not been the only ones they underestimated. Kin Fan Zhang told them to reconsider their surroundings, and they were surprised to see the bloody bodies of their companions flung in the air as if they were nothing. All their companions were beaten up, and the two of them were trembling as Kin Fan Zhang told them that they still didn't know who the big master and who the little one was. King Feng grabbed Kin's head and reminded them that they had said they wanted him to defeat all of them. He told them that he had fulfilled their request, so he asked them if there was anything else they would like. Kin Zhu Wu and Kin Tian Kiang trembled uncontrollably, and they were surprised that King Feng was very fast. They thought that in the blink of an eye, King Feng himself could defeat all of them. As King Feng tossed Kin at them, they thought that they were all first and second level body strengthening experts, so they questioned the information they received that King Feng was at the level of the Kai and Blood Realm. King Feng asked the three of them if they would like to see Kin Fan Zhang's power, and the three of them simultaneously answered that they didn't want to. They thought that up until that moment, they thought that Kin Fan Zhang was the strongest, so they were afraid of him. While King Feng and Kin Fan Zhang assisted Kin Sangui into their home, Kin, Kin Zhu Wu, and Kin Tian Kiang realized that apparently, King Feng was the strongest. Half a month later, the competition for the Wasteland Reclamation began between the five major families, and everyone was lined up as someone announced that the Kin family was preparing to participate in that year's Wasteland and Reclamation competition. King Feng and the others listened attentively as the person said that the Kin family had been at the bottom of the competition for 20 years, and those 20 years were a disgrace to the Kin family. The one giving the speech was Kin Jan, 
He promised the participants that if anyone made it to the top four in the competition that year, they would be rewarded with the opportunity to master the secret techniques of the bloodline. And not only that, he would also give them the title of Land Reclamation Youth Squad Leader position. Everyone was excited when they heard about the reward of the title of leader and the secret bloodline technique, and they said it was great motivation. King Feng also looked determined, and he thought that although he was guaranteed leadership by Lu Fangua, there were different types of leaders, so he had to achieve the highest possible level of leadership. However, King Feng had doubts as there were a large number of people with expert body strengthening levels, and he had been training hard for half a month but couldn't even reach the body strength level, so he didn't know if he could get good results in the competition. A few moments later, the participants were riding on their respective wagons, and someone announced that the Five Great Families Wasteland Reclamation Competition had begun. All traveling, King Feng was thinking that at the beginning of the competition, the disciples of the Five Great Families would be sent to the depths of the wastelands by driverless wagons. But the monsters of the wasteland were extremely ferocious, and they competed with each other to kill humans, so there were very few masters who could survive each year, which was why the wasteland reclamation competition was much tougher than anyone could have imagined. Suddenly, King Feng noticed someone at the other end of the wagon. It was Kin Fen, and he cursed in his mind while he continued to cover his face when King Feng saw him and greeted him, saying that he didn't expect them to be on the same wagon, so he suggested that they should stay together throughout the journey. Kin Fen immediately told King Feng that his defeat the other day was just a coincidence, and that it was just luck. Kin Fen proudly told King Feng that he would follow the masters of the Yi and Bai families at that time and that he would be alone in the wasteland. There were four of them, the Yi family's 27th and 29th place and the Bai family's 31st and 34th place. They mocked Kin Fen and King Feng, saying that they were the weaklings of the Kin family and that all they could do was walk behind them because it was the only way for the weaklings to survive in the competition. King Feng shamelessly inspected the four of them and said that he didn't think that they were very strong, so he told Kin Fen that he was better off with him, and the four of them were insulted, asking King Feng if he despised them. A few moments later, the wheel of a wagon bumped into something. It was the wagon where King Feng was, and some of the cultivators in that wagon were sent flying. Those cultivators landed at the mouth of a huge beast. King Feng was surprised when he saw it, and he yelled that there was a fierce monster. He told everyone that a ferocious monster was coming, and it was a giant swamp crocodile. King Feng looked terrified as he hid behind the flipped wagon, and King Feng told him that they should go. King Feng was surprised when someone behind him said that those were the ideas that came out of his stupid head. So they, the Kin family, were indeed weak. It was the 29th place of the Yi family, and as he led the other three into battle, he said that as powerful members of a large family, if they faced a monster, they had no right to retreat, and as for Kin Fen and King Feng, he suggested that they go home and cry in their mother's arms. The four of them charged forward as they told the Kin family to watch them and look at them, the really strong men, while calling them weak. Instead of being insulted, Kin Fen cheered them on, saying that they were very powerful and that it was expected from the strongest large families that even when facing a level 4 giant crocodile, they were not afraid at all. But the four of them were quickly defeated by the giant crocodile, and in one fell swoop of its tail, they were sent flying. Kin Fen was surprised when he saw their lifeless bodies fall to the ground like flies. He was horrified when he realized that the powerful members of the Yi and Bai families were all dead, and he questioned how it was possible. Suddenly, the ferocious giant crocodile roared in front of him, and Kin Fen immediately crouched down on the ground. He looked extremely terrified, thinking that it was over because, as soon as they entered the wasteland, the support was gone, so he wondered if his life would end there. But to Kin Fen's surprise, King Feng attacked the giant crocodile by punching it, and his punch was so powerful that the giant crocodile coughed up blood. King Feng managed to knock the giant crocodile out, and Kin Fen couldn't believe what he just saw. With tears in his eyes, Kin Fen called King Feng. Even after seeing King Feng standing on top of the giant crocodile, Kin Fen still couldn't believe that King Feng had killed the giant crocodile single-handedly. King Feng stood there mightily. He hopped off the giant crocodile. He grabbed Kin Fen by his shirt as he asked him why he was still standing there. Kin Fen was taken by surprise when King Feng suddenly dragged him and told him to run. With him being choked by his own shirt as King Feng dragged him, Kin Fen asked King Feng why he was running instead of taking the giant crocodile's skin as a souvenir when he had just killed it. King Feng told him that he was a grouch and explained that the swamp crocodile was attracted to blood. Kin Fen looked terrified as King Feng continued to explain that if one was standing in a swamp of giant swamp crocodiles, 
One should hurry up and run as soon as there was blood. Kin Fen's eyes widened when King Feng told him that the reason for that was that they would become a snack for those crocodiles. Kin Fen saw multiple giant crocodiles emerging from the swamp, and he screamed, telling King Feng to run faster. As they continued to run, Kin Fen remembered how he thought that he was the best of the best in the family, much better than King Feng, and as a result, he snubbed King Feng without knowing him. Kin Fen asked King Feng why he saved him when he told him that he would leave him alone. King Feng told him that it was because they were family, and there was no stronger reason. Kin Fen was surprised when he heard that King Feng considered him a family member because he had never considered King Feng as a member of the family. As he continued to get dragged by King Feng, he wondered why he had such a strong desire to acknowledge King Feng as an older brother. Somewhere in the wasteland, Yi Fan was telling his men that, in the end, the competition was about how many monsters each one had killed. He said that he had to focus on hunting, so he would put up a reward for eliminating the Kin family, and he asked if there was anyone who agreed to carry out that mission. One of his men confirmed, saying that it was not just anyone who took it and that the best assassin in the competition took it. It was Sidu Xuanju, and he was sitting on top of the pile of carcasses of gigantic crocodiles. He told the prince that killing was his favorite pastime, so he would not leave any insect from the Kin family behind. Yu Fan smiled sinisterly as he said that it was good, and in his mind, he was thinking that he would make King Feng regret standing up to the royal family. On the other hand, King Feng and Kin Fen were traveling together when they heard someone scream. Two men were being cornered by two black panthers, and they were both asking for help. Kin Fen immediately recognized that those men were from the Nangong family, and he said that he was sad for them, but he told King Feng that they should leave. King Feng did not agree with Kin Fen because the Nangong family was the only family that was friendly to the Kin family, so he would give them a helping hand, and Kin Fen asked him how he would help them. King Feng glanced at Kin Fen and told him that he would like to borrow him. To Kin Fen's surprise, King Feng kicked him in the butt, exposing him to the Black Panthers in front of them. The Black Panther's attention quickly shifted to Kin Fen, who was on all fours in front of both of them. Kin Fen cried as he exclaimed his surprise, and he accepted his death. But after flinching for quite some time, nothing was attacking him, and he wondered why, so he opened one of his eyes. He saw King Feng patting the Black Panther and telling them to never bite anyone again. Kin Fen was extremely surprised when he saw that King Feng had tamed the Black Panthers, and he couldn't help but ask King Feng how he did that. King Feng explained to Kin Fen that he brought monster taming pills with him and threw them into the mouths of the Black Panthers while he attracted their attention, which made Kin Fen realize that King Feng had used him as bait, so he cursed. Kin Fen was about to say something when the leaves behind him rustled. He was frozen in place due to fear when a gigantic Black Panther appeared behind him. Kin Fen exclaimed his surprise, and he told King Feng that there was another one, asking if he still had the monster taming pills but King Feng told him that those pills were only effective on small monsters. The giant black panther was drooling as it crouched in front of Kin Fen, and Kin Fen asked for help, saying that it was over because he was so scared that he couldn't move his legs. Handing out a sword, King Feng told Kin Fen that it was okay, and he instructed him to hold the sword and not let go. Kin Fen immediately agreed, and he was glad that King Feng was still saving him in critical moments. But to Kin Fen's surprise, King Feng started swinging the sword that he was holding, and the gigantic Black Panther was also surprised. King Feng continued to swing until he made a rotation. He threw the rotating sword along with the screaming Kin Fen as he used his move, Moonlight Rotation Finish Strike, and the gigantic Black Panther was hit directly by it. Kin Fen collided with a tree while the gigantic Black Panther fell to the ground, lying lifelessly in its own blood. While still dizzy, Kin Fen got mad at King Feng, and he called him an idiot for treating him like a tool. But without remorse, King Feng told him that they still killed the gigantic Black Panther in the end, which enraged Kin Fen more, and he told King Feng that he was not one of his men, so he couldn't use him however he wanted. On the other hand, the two guys from the Nangong family thanked King Feng for helping them, but King Feng told them that the Nangong family had always been on good terms with the Kin family, so it was his duty to help them both. The two men said that they would definitely inform their family about what King Feng did after the competition because his help was a debt to them, so they would never forget it, and Kin Fen chimed in, reminding them that he helped them too. The two men thanked them again, but they suddenly froze and their eyes widened. Kin Fen and King Feng were both surprised when the two men suddenly collapsed in front of them, revealing the two daggers that had been pierced into each of their backs. Kin Fen was trembling as he asked King Feng what had been going on, and King Feng said that someone had just killed the two men. 
King Feng was surprised when someone suddenly spoke behind him, saying that he must have been the King Feng who had stolen the show at the auction. It was Sidu Xuanzhu, and he told King Feng that it was ironic because he had not imagined him to be an insect that had not yet cultivated his body. He told King Feng that there was no need for him to do much to kill him, and he would leave him with the Nangong family. He disappeared and told King Feng to enjoy his time, while, on the other hand, King Feng was surprised to see him. Suddenly, two arrows came in King Feng and Kin Feng's direction. They were surprised, but they were both able to dodge them, and King Feng asked what those were. Suddenly, they heard a voice questioning them, the Kin family, for daring to kill members of the Nangong family. Kin Fen responded and said that they weren't doing such a thing. But the voice told him not to try to lie because their family could handle tiger bites, and while firing two more arrows, the voice told them that they shouldn't think that they could deceive them. The two arrows hit the two black panthers. King Feng said that they wouldn't believe them no matter what they said, especially since there were no traces of tiger bites on the two men's bodies, and Kin Fen was alarmed. Kin Fen looked terrified as he told King Feng that there were people around, but they couldn't even see them because they had amazing camouflage and great agility. He realized that it must have been Nangong Zukan of the Nangong family because, according to the rumors, she was called a ghost because she left no traces even in snow due to her ability to fly using her quick movement skill. Nangong Zukan frowned as Kin Fen said that being confronted by her meant inevitable death. Kin Fen told King Feng to quickly run and hide because their enemy was Nangong Zukan, so if he didn't hide quickly, he would die. Kin Fen realized that he wouldn't worry about King Feng because he was so smart, he would hide for sure. But King Feng only smirked, and with a provoking expression on his face, he called Nangong Zukan a derogatory term and challenged her to come at him if she could kill him so easily. The wind blew around King Feng as he stood in the middle of the area, and while Kin Fen was running away, he couldn't believe what King Feng did. He wondered if King Feng was trying to commit suicide and if he was crazy. While hiding behind a tree, Kin Fen warned King Feng that Nangong Zukan was the most powerful of the new generation, so he couldn't beat her. As Kin Fen told King Feng that all he could do was run for a chance to survive, another arrow was fired behind King Feng's head. King Feng smirked as he sensed the arrow and seemed amused as he commented on Nangong Zukan's power. But the arrow just passed through the image of King Feng's body, and he thought that those attacks would not work on him. Nangong Zukan was alarmed when she felt King Feng appear behind her, and he was smiling evilly. King Feng's eyes gleamed ominously as he laughed and told Nangong Zukan that he had found her, calling her a beautiful lady. A huge explosion occurred, and it scattered the snow. The snow started to settle down, revealing King Feng, who was thinking that because he had the divine transformation art to Strangai's six senses, as long as Nangong Zukan's cultivation level was not much higher than his, he would be able to find out exactly where she was. King Feng choked Nangong Zukan and asked her if he could finally explain what had happened. Nangong Zukan was flustered and surprised by how things had turned out. On the other hand, Kin Fen's jaw was about to drop to the ground as he was so surprised that King Feng had caught Nangong Zukan. Nangong Zukan asked King Feng how he could have found her when he was at the Kai and blood level, and she told him that if he had wanted to kill her, he should have done it quickly. While holding a dagger, King Feng smiled threateningly as he told her that he did not come there to kill people, but she was the one who had started things first. He told her that she had fallen into the evil of her deeds, and she threw the dagger at her head. On the other hand, in the other part of the wasteland, Kin Zhu Wu and Kin Tian Kiang were running away from someone, and while Kin Zhu Wu was assisting the injured Kin Tian Kiang, he asked their pursuer who they were. While Kin Tian Kiang was groaning in pain, Kin Zhu Wu was asking their pursuer why they were chasing them, and to their surprise, the pursuer did not answer their question but instead told them not to blame them for being cruel and merciless. The pursuer was Sidu Xuanzhu, and as he appeared behind them, ready to deliver the final attack, he told them that if they wanted to blame anyone, they should blame their kin family. But suddenly, Sidu Xuanzhu's attack was blocked. It was Kin Fanjong who blocked his attack and protected Kin Zhu Wu and Kin Tian Kiong. Kin Fanjong grinned, and he asked Sidu Xuanzhu if he was the motherfucker who had been chasing his kin family in the competition. Kin Fanjong managed to deflect Sidu Xuanzhu as he swung his axe, and he taunted Sidu Xuanzhu to come at him. Kin Fanjong managed to destroy Sidu Xuanzhu's mask with that attack, and that surprised Sidu Xuanzhu. Sidu Xuanzhu wondered who Kin Fanjong was and how someone at the fourth level of body strengthening could have almost injured him when he was in the sixth level. Kin Zhu Wu asked Kin Fanjong why he had saved them. Kin Fanjong told them that it was what King Feng had taught him. Sidu Xuanzhu laughed when he learned that his enemy had turned out to be Kin Fanjong, 
the strongest youth of the Qin family, and he asked him if he knew that King Feng had died. Siduk Xuanzu licked his dagger heinously as he told Qin Fanjong that he had framed King Feng, and he had died at the hands of Nangong Zukan. He laughed as he said that King Feng should have become a dead body by that time. Qin Zhu was terrified when he heard what Siduk Xuanzu said because he knew that Siduk Xuanzu was the strongest fighter in the Nangong family, and with her agility and strength, if she had targeted King Feng, he would have died. But Qin Fanjong refused to believe it, and as he swung his axe to attack Siduk Xuanzu, he said that it was impossible because King Feng wouldn't have died that easily. Qin Fanjong slashed Siduk Xuanzu with all his might and called him a liar. Qin Fanjong lost sight of Siduk Xuanzu, and as he looked around, wondering where he had disappeared, Siduk Xuanzu laughed. He told Qin Fanjong that both of them had the strength to fight. Siduk Xuanzu was hanging on a tree branch right above Qin Fanjong and he told him that he should care more about his life. Siduk Xuanzu slashed Qin Fanjong multiple times on his back. Blood splattered everywhere, and he told Qin Fanjong that he should not be concerned for King Feng's life and death. Qin Fanjong coughed up blood. He fell face first into the ground, and Qin Zhu worriedly called out to him. Siduk Xuanzu laughed sinisterly as he told Qin Fanjong that in the Westland Reclamation Contest, he didn't have to worry about the lives and deaths of others. Siduk Xuanzu was about to deliver the final blow to Qin Fanjong, and he told him that he should just think of himself, otherwise, he would lose his head in the end. Suddenly, Siduk Xuanzu was surprised when someone yelled behind him, telling him not to touch Qin Fanjong. The person was moving forward with huge and heavy strides. It was King Feng with Qin Fen behind him, and he told Siduk Xuanzu that if he dared to hurt Qin Fanjong, he would kill him and throw his body to the ferocious monsters. Qin Zhu and Qin Tianqiang were both surprised to see King Feng. Siduk Xuanzu laughed and told King Feng that he thought he was one of the masters of the family. He said that Nangong Zukan was a weak person as she was not able to kill him. Qin Zhu warned King Feng that Siduk Xuanzu was a strong and malicious person, and none of them could defeat him, and Qin Tianqiang advised that he run away or they would all be doomed. Meanwhile, Siduk Xuanzu looked evil as he raised his dagger to attack Qin Fanjong, and he wondered what he should do after killing the strongest youth in the Qin family. He decided that he would come to kill King Feng, but he was unaware that King Feng was charging towards him with that ominous look in his eyes. Siduk Xuanzu was taken by surprise when King Feng's fist landed on his face and some of his teeth were sent flying. King Feng looked enraged as he reminded Siduk Xuanzu that he had told him not to dare touch Qin Fanjong. King Feng charged forward again to deliver another attack, and he told Siduk Xuanzu that he would die for touching Qin Fanjong. Siduk Xuanzu was sent flying and tumbling on the ground, and he wondered how King Feng had such power when he was just in the Kai and Blood realm. Qin Zhu and Qin Tianqiang were also surprised when they saw that King Feng threw Siduk Xuanzu into the air. Siduk Xuanzu staggered as he stood up. He suddenly disappeared, and King Feng was surprised. King Feng looked around as he asked where Siduk Xuanzu had disappeared. Just like in the earlier fight, Siduk Xuanzu was hanging by a tree branch right above King Feng. Qin Zhu was alarmed when he realized that King Feng was in a bad situation, and so he immediately warned King Feng to be careful because Qin Fanjong was defeated by that trick. Siduk Xuanzu lunged towards King Feng to attack him, and he laughed as he said that it was too late. Siduk Xuanzu said that the Qin family had lost because they cared so much for each other. But then, to his surprise, while he was still charging downward, King Feng appeared beside him with a smile on his face. King Feng managed to jump and reach the tree branch before Siduk Xuanzu could hit him, and Siduk Xuanzu was so surprised that he couldn't help but wonder how King Feng did that. Siduk Xuanzu looked terrified as the shadow of King Feng's foot covered his face, while King Feng asked him why caring for each other was considered a deficiency for him. King Feng kicked him on the head, and he asked him if he thought he knew him well. Siduk Xuanzu was slammed into the ground with incredible force. Both Qin Zhu and Qin Tianqiang's eyes widened in disbelief as they couldn't believe that King Feng could actually fight with Siduk Xuanzu. And Qin Fen, while assisting Qin Fanjong, said that they shouldn't be too surprised as they would get used to surprises from King Feng. King Feng looked so annoyed as he asked Siduk Xuanzu if he thought he was just a jerk who only knew how to use brute force. Siduk Xuanzu was trying to stand up, shaking and he wondered if King Feng could have used his reflection image to make him think that he was still down there. But he thought that King Feng was at the level of Kai and blood, so he couldn't figure out how he obtained such skills in martial arts. Siduk Xuanzu threw his daggers while thinking that if he couldn't fight directly, 
he would just use ranged attacks because, after all, the dagger technique had been passed down from generation to generation in the Sidhu family. Sidhu Xu and Ju's daggers charged at an incredible speed towards King Feng, who was just standing there, and Sidhu Xu and Ju thought that it was the strongest amongst light weapons. King Feng did not move an inch, but Sidhu Xu and Ju's daggers were deflected. All of his daggers fell to the ground. Sidhu Xu and Ju was surprised that King Feng made his weapons drop. He wondered if King Feng's hidden weapon technique was superior to his. Not knowing what just happened, Kin Zhu Wu and Kin Tian Kyong were again surprised that King Feng really made Sidhu Xu and Ju's powerful daggers drop, and Kin Fen nonchalantly reminded them that they should get used to King Feng's surprises. King Feng charged towards Sidhu Xu and Ju at an incredible speed, and he said that the Sidhu family's light weapon skills were just child's play in front of his moonlight skill. Sidhu Xu and Ju was surprised when King Feng suddenly appeared behind him and told him that even physical skills were useless against his moonlight skill. As soon as Sidhu Xu and Ju knew that King Feng was behind him, he admitted that King Feng had been too fast, and he thought he had to get away from there. But before he could move an inch, a huge fist came towards him. King Feng landed a punch on his face again, and all he could do was scream as it sent him flying. The punch was so powerful that Sidhu Xu and Ju was destroying the trees he collided with on his way. Sidhu Xu and Ju crashed on the ground ahead, and a path was created in front of King Feng. King Feng told Sidhu Xu and Ju that it was a lesson for him on accusing him. Sidhu Xu and Ju was already covered in blood, and his clothes were tattered. The impact of his crash was so powerful that it created a hole in the ground, and as Sidhu Xu and Ju tried to stand up, he coughed up blood. He refused to accept that such a thing could happen, but he wondered if he would die. Suddenly, he fired a flare up into the sky. Kin Fen sighed and wondered if it was wolf smoke. On the other hand, with his face completely destroyed, Sidhu Xu and Ju admitted to King Feng that he seemed to have underestimated him, as he didn't expect him to be the strongest person in the Kin family. Kin Fen, Kin Zhu Wu, and Kin Tian Kiang were alarmed when they were suddenly surrounded by other people. Sidhu Xu and Ju told King Feng, who was surprised as well, that since he had been hiding his strength, he should not blame him for what would happen. Someone arrived and told Sidhu Xu and Ju that what he did was well done, but he didn't finish his work. It was Yi Fan, and he questioned Sidhu Xu and Ju about why he had called him. Kin Fen, Kin Zhu Wu, and Kin Tian Kiang were surprised when they saw Yi Fan. King Feng glared at Yi Fan, thinking that he was the toughest opponent in the wasteland. Sidhu Xu and Ju immediately told Yi Fan that King Feng wasn't as weak as they thought, so he needed his help. Yi Fan told him that it was obvious, but he did not expect him to be beaten like that. Someone suddenly told King Feng to take Kin Fanjiang with him and run away because Yi Fan's guards were strongmen of the sixth level of body strengthening experts, so they must be stronger than Sidhu Xu and Ju. It was Kin Zhu who told King Feng that both he and Kin Tian Kiang had no fighting strength left. Still, in order to save him, they would fight Yi Fan's guards to buy him some time to escape, and Kin Tian Kiang agreed. To their surprise, King Feng asked them what they were talking about, saying that they were all from the Kin family and there was no difference between him and them. King Feng told them not to worry because all of them would get out of there alive. King Feng raised a flare. Smoke came out of it, which made Yi Fan ask if it was the smoke of the Kin family's battle matter. Then he told King Feng that he thought that he was crazy because armies were not allowed into the wasteland, so his enthusiasm was in vain. Yi Fan ordered his guards to kill them. King Feng and the other members of the Kin family were immediately surrounded by Yi Fan's guards. Kin Zhu Wu and Kin Tian Kiang told King Feng that if they didn't run away immediately, it would be too late because Yi Fan's men were at the fifth level of body strengthening experts. While they, the Kin family members, hadn't gone beyond the second level of body strengthening experts. But King Feng was still calm even with the guards already charging at him. He told his companions that it was okay because he would take care of things. King Feng smiled when the guards who were attacking him were suddenly hit by something while they were still midair and coughing up blood. The same thing happened to the guards that were attacking the other Kin family members. The lifeless bodies of the guards fell to the ground like flies. In an instant, the guards that were surrounding King Feng and the Kin family were eliminated, and the Kin family was surprised. Both Yi Fan and Sidhu Xu and Ju were also surprised, and Yi Fan couldn't help but ask what happened to his men. Nangong Zukan and his men showed themselves, and King Feng laughed as he asked Yi Fan if he thought that he was so stupid to call the Kin family's army to the wasteland. Yi Fan and Sidhu Xu and Ju were surprised as the tables turned because, at that moment, they were the ones who were surrounded. Nangong Zukan told King Feng that they came. Yi Fan and Sidhu Xu and Ju were surprised to see Nangong Zukan, and they wondered if she was there to help King Feng. 
King Feng told everyone that Siduk Xu and Ju had accused him before and asked Siduk Xu and Ju if he wanted the Nangong family, who were the only good friends of the Qin family, to turn against the Qin family. Recalling the previous events, King Feng thought that it was fortunate that he could explain things to Nangong Zukin. Nangong Zukin flinched when King Feng threw the dagger, but she was surprised that it was stabbed on the ground beside her and not on her head. Nangong Zukin looked enraged when King Feng told her to look at the weapons used to kill her men and told her that it was a ploy set up by Siduk Xuanzhu. King Feng recalled that after Nangong Zukin knew the truth, she decided to help him. She apologized to him for misunderstanding the situation and told him that if he got into trouble later, he could call her by the smoke anytime. Back to the present, King Feng explained to Yifan and Siduk Xuanzhu that when they were attacked, Nangong Zukin came and helped them. Yifan and Siduk Xuanzhu were alarmed when they got surrounded by Nangong Zukin's men and King Feng told them that even if they had body-strengthening expert forces, it was nothing but a group of turtles in front of Nangong Zukin. Siduk Xuanzhu trembled, and he asked Yi Fan what they were going to do, but Yi Fan could only grit his teeth and say that things were despicable. Yi Fan told King Feng that, since he belonged to the royal family, he didn't care about him, so he suggested that they work things out and leave. But King Feng told him that he killed others whenever he wanted and pointed out that it didn't seem to be fun anymore when it was his turn to die asking how that could go unnoticed. Yi Fan and Siduk Xuanji were alarmed when, without hesitation, King Feng ordered Nangong Zukin and her men to shoot arrows. Yi Fan turned to run away. He asked King Feng if he thought that he could have killed him easily when, after all, he was a level 4 body strengthening expert. Upon seeing Yi Fan flee, Siduk Xuanji immediately reminded him that he was seriously injured yet he wanted to leave him behind so he asked if he had abandoned him. Suddenly, an arrow hit Yi Fan on the back of his shoulders. He was surprised. He couldn't believe that he was hit by an arrow, and he thought that he could usually dodge them. So he wondered why he couldn't dodge them at that moment. Yi Fan fell to the ground while Siduk Xuanju was already lying on the ground, cursing. King Feng smiled as he looked at them, thinking that Yi Fan must have had a hard time believing that he couldn't avoid the arrows. King Feng thought that Yi Fan didn't know that he knew about his secret skill through his memories from his previous life. So he knew that if Yi Fan used his secret skill, they might all be defeated, which was why he must find a way to defeat him in one fell swoop. King Feng recalled that launching the colorful smoke and calling out to Nangong Zukin was just a disguise because its purpose was to make Yi Fan think that he only launched out colored smoke. The smoke was taken from the misty forest, and it was bloody wood smoke. King Feng started to approach Yi Fan while thinking that although the smoke's effect was not immediate, it made Yi Fan's movement slow in the end. Upon seeing King Feng approach him, Yi Fan asked him what he wanted to do. King Feng glared at Yi Fan as he prepared to deliver a punch, and he thought that it was more than enough. King Feng punched Yi Fan, and the punch was so powerful that the ground below them shattered into pieces. All Yi Fan could do was scream in pain as he took King Feng's attack. Seeing Yi Fan on the ground, Siduk Xuanju trembled, and he questioned how that had happened. Then Gong Zukin suddenly appeared behind Siduk Xuanju, telling him that it was his turn and that he must pay the price for killing her family members. Nangong Zukin fired her arrow into Nangong Zukin's head, killing him. The enemies were all lying lifeless on the ground. Kin Zhu and Kin Tianqiang's eyes widened in surprise, and they couldn't believe that King Fen could beat Yi Fan and Siduk Xuanju. Kin Fen nonchalantly told them that it may be hard to accept, but he told them over and over again that they would just get used to it, so it was okay. King Feng said that since Yi Fan and Siduk Xuanju were both deceased, his strongest enemies were eliminated, so the next step would be to improve their rank in the competition. He announced that they needed to catch as many prey as possible, and everyone cheered in agreement. King Feng was thinking that he had eliminated his biggest problem, so he could finally get ready to hunt. Still, he was unaware of the sinister man lurking behind him, who seemed to have risen from the dead. It was Yi Fan, and he quickly impaled King Feng with his sword, which surprised King Feng. With a sinister look on his face, Yi Fan asked King Feng if he still wanted to go hunting. Nangong Zukin, along with the members of the Qin family, all looked worried as they called King Feng. Even though King Feng was still surprised and confused that Yi Fan was not really deceased, he managed to grab his dagger to try to attack Yi Fan with it. King Feng cursed in pain as he tried to look back and hit Yi Fan with his dagger. But to his surprise, another dagger hit his hand, which made him drop his dagger. It was Siduk Xuanju who threw the dagger, and he was laughing as he told King Feng that he was not deceased yet either. King Feng was extremely surprised. He screamed in pain as Yi Fan pulled out his sword from his body. Yi Fan laughed evilly as he said that things were interesting. With a twisted look on his face, 
he told King Feng that he did not expect a loser like him to force him to show his trump card. Then Gong Zukan raised her weapon and asked Yi Fan what he wanted to do, while Kin Fen looked extremely concerned for King Fang as he called for him. Yi Fan told them that they were lucky enough to see his secret skill, and unbeknownst to everyone, his dead guard started to rise. Then Gong Zukan's troops froze as they felt Yi Fan's previously dead guard stand behind them. Nangong Zukan's troops were surprised, and they were not able to react when Yi Fan's guards pierced their swords through their bodies. Both Nangong Zukan and Kin Fen were alarmed. On the other hand, King Feng was lying on the ground, wondering if he missed something without noticing, and he cursed as he realized that it could be Yi Fan's secret skill, the Summon Dead skill. King Feng thought that, as he remembered, that skill could make someone who had just died a warrior who wasn't afraid of death for an hour, and although the price was the user's lifetime, its effect was very powerful. Yi Fan laughed maniacally as he said that he would destroy them all. He charged towards Nangong Zukan and told her that it was her turn. Nangong Zukan was still composed, and she told Yi Fan that even if he were still alive, he was only at the fourth level of the body strengthening expert, so he wouldn't be able to keep up with him. But to Nangong Zukan's surprise, Yi Fan easily approached her to slash her bow in half, and she couldn't figure out how he did it. Nangong Zukan was taken aback, and she couldn't understand how Yi Fan defeated her. She fell down on the ground while Yi Fan stood in front of her, oozing with a tremendous sinister aura. Yi Fan told them that they thought that he was an incompetent prince who only relied on his army to show his strength. He revealed that, in fact, they were just troops he brought in to show weakness in front of the enemy. Yi Fan revealed his true strength, which was the 8th level of the body strengthening expert, and he said that he was actually stronger than all of them. King Feng and Nangong Zukan were both surprised when they noticed that Yi Fan was at the 8th level of the body strengthening expert. King Feng was still on the ground, coughing, and Yi Fan told him that it was time to pay back the disgrace he had caused him before. Yi Fan slashed King Feng again with his sword, and all he could do was scream as he was thrown up in the air due to the force of the attack. King Feng thought that it was impossible, admitting that Yi Fan was very strong, and he couldn't face him unless he reached the body strengthening realm. Yi Fan remembered, and he asked King Feng if he liked protecting his family. At that moment, Yi Fan's guards captured the rest of the Kin family, who were struggling to escape the guards' hold, and they demanded that the guards let them go and leave them. Yi Fan immediately approached them, and as King Feng saw it, he told him to stop and asked him what he wanted to do. Without saying a word, Yi Fan slashed all the remaining members of the Kin family with his sword, killing them. Yi Fan laughed evilly and told King Feng that he had killed his people in front of him. As the four members of the Kin family lay lifelessly on the ground, Yi Fan asked King Feng what he thought about it. While still helplessly lying on the ground, King Feng turned pale, and he trembled as he saw what had just happened. He was so mad that he dug his fingers into the ground. King Feng screamed in agony and called Yi Fan a bastard. King Feng yelled as he charged forward to attack Yi Fan, thinking that he promised his family members that they would all get out of there alive. Yi Fan easily slashed him with his sword, sending him flying backward. Yi Fan was about to pierce King Feng with his sword, declaring that it was over. Seeing the sword coming towards him, King Feng lost hope, thinking it was the end. The sword pierced, but to King Feng's surprise, it was Kin Fen who was pierced, not him. King Feng's eyes widened as he called for Kin Fen with hesitation. On the other hand, Yi Fan was amused, saying that it looked like someone didn't die from his first stab. King Feng was surprised that even when he was trembling, Kin Fen called him. With a smile on his face, Kin Fen told King Feng that he acknowledged and trusted him, so the future of the Kin family was in his hands, and he was the one who deserved to lead it. Yi Fan pulled out his sword, and Kin Fen told King Feng that he protected him from death. As Kin Fen fell to the ground, facing King Feng, he ordered him to run away quickly. King Feng hesitantly called Kin Fen as he reached out to him. He was enraged, and tears filled his eyes as he shouted Kin Fen's name. A few hours ago, King Feng asked Kin Fen who he wanted to fight for because he was reminded that when they were fighting the Panthers, he said that he didn't want to be his tool. Kin Fen proudly said that he would definitely fight for someone he trusts and supports to protect the Kin family, and when he finds such a person, he swears he will devote his life to him. King Feng laughed at Kin Fen, saying that he got scared to death when he met a panther, so he was doubting where he would get the courage to sacrifice his life for someone. Kin Fen, who was annoyed at his reaction, defended himself, saying that it was different, so if such a person was in danger, he would definitely intervene. King Feng tried to stifle his laughter as he asked Kin Fen if he thought that he was the one he was talking about, and Kin Fen told him that it was impossible because even if he dies, he won't die for him. 
Back to the present, Kin Fen's lifeless body lay on the ground with his eyes wide open. King Feng crawled towards Kin Fen and called him, all the while thinking that once again, someone had died in front of him in his current life. On the other hand, Nangong Zukan was also in tears as she lay helplessly on the ground. She called King Feng and asked him what he was doing, questioning if he wanted Kin Fen's sacrifice to be in vain and told him to run. Meanwhile, Yu Fan laughed hysterically, saying that it was a touching feeling called camaraderie, sacrificing oneself for others. Yu Fan slashed his sword towards King Feng and told him that, to be honest, he needed to catch up with Kin Fen. His sword hit King Feng with a powerful force, but the sword didn't inflict any damage on King Feng as he caught it with his hand. Yi Fan was surprised by the turn of events. King Feng started to stand up and stated that it was enough. He looked solemn as he kept his head down, about to make a pledge this time. With a fierce look in his eyes, King Feng crushed Yi Fan's sword and declared that he would never run away. Yi Fan looked extremely surprised as he saw his sword break into pieces. King Feng's eyes glimmered as he called Yi Fan a bastard and charged forward to punch him. King Feng landed his punch directly on Yi Fan's face, and Yi Fan couldn't dodge or block it. All Yi Fan could do was scream in pain. Yi Fan was puzzled, and he didn't know how King Feng's strength had increased like that. Siduk Xuanju suddenly interfered in the fight, and he came charging behind King Feng, telling him not to touch Yi Fan. But to his surprise, King Feng quickly appeared in front of him, ready to deliver another punch. King Feng punched him in the face, and just like Yi Fan, he was unable to react, and all he could do was scream in pain. Siduk Xuanju fell to the ground, and he died. Meanwhile, Nangong Zukan, who was watching King Feng, couldn't help but wonder what his cultivation level had been. On the other hand, Yi Fan was trying his best to stand up while wondering how King Feng had been able to kill Siduk Xuanju. It seemed that King Feng's strength had increased very quickly. While Yi Fan wondered if King Feng could have been stronger than Siduk Xuanju, King Feng looked so mad, and he was currently at the first level of a body strengthening expert. King Feng charged towards Yi Fan at a tremendous speed, which surprised Yi Fan. King Feng landed another punch on Yi Fan's face. The punch was so powerful that Yi Fan was blown away, and he lost some of his teeth in the process. King Feng was charging towards Yi Fan again, and as he saw it, all Yi Fan could do was curse, wondering if King Feng was going to do it again. But instead of punching him, King Feng grabbed his arm. King Feng flung Yi Fan up in the air, and all he could think about was how someone like King Feng had gained great power in the blink of an eye. Yi Fan was slammed into the ground, and he screamed in pain again. Yi Fan looked at King Feng with terrified eyes, and he cursed as he had a bad feeling. Looking at the sinister-looking King Feng, Yi Fan thought that if he kept fighting King Feng, he would die there. Yi Fan immediately ordered his guards to quickly eliminate King Feng. The guards simultaneously jumped towards King Feng to attack him, as Yi Fan told them to hurry up and help him escape. Nangong Zukan immediately told King Feng to forget Yi Fan and run away because he had just been seriously injured, so if he continued fighting, he would die. With tears in her eyes, Nangong Zukan was surprised. King Feng did not dodge or block the guard's swords, as he just stood there in front of Yi Fan, but the swords were not able to pierce or wound him. Yi Fan looked so surprised, and he asked King Feng why he did not run away even when he was surrounded and might get killed. King Feng told Yi Fan that he ran away many times when he faced strong enemies, but later, he only felt regret. He asked Yi Fan to tell him what the meaning of life was, and he said that that day, even if he died, he would drag Yi Fan with him. The guards were trying their best to damage King Feng with their swords, but to no avail. Suddenly, Yi Fan was surprised when King Feng grabbed him by the collar. And with all his might, King Feng twirled Yi Fan around and used him to hit his guards. He threw Yi Fan into one of the guards, and they both hit a tree trunk. King Feng was on a rampage. He dared Yi Fan's guards to come face him, calling them bastards and saying that he would destroy all of them. With a fierce look on his face, he asked the guards who among them could kill him. King Feng swiftly moved from one guard to another, and he defeated them one by one. Yu Fan was astounded and wondered what power King Feng had that he didn't die, even though his injury was fatal. King Feng was surging with a huge amount of aura, and Yu Fan thought that it seemed as if death were escaping him. At a different time, in the royal education room, someone called their father. It was Yi Fan when he was still nine years old, and he asked his father if it meant that he was the king of the whole world since he was from the royal family. His father laughed and told him that they were kings in name only, but the real kings were the ones who exuded an aura called the Emperor's Aura. His father explained that even if he met someone who was clearly weaker than him, as long as he saw their aura, he couldn't do anything but be afraid of that person and surrender to him. 
The young Yi Fan was amused and asked his father if he was also afraid of those people. Back in the present, as King Feng stepped on someone and ordered him to pick up his dagger, Yi Fan wondered if King Feng was really one of those people. King Feng was stepping on one of Yi Fan's guards, and he told him again to pick up his dagger. Yi Fan looked horrified when he saw that even the summoners were afraid of him, and he couldn't help but wonder if King Feng could have the Emperor's aura. On the other hand, Nangong Zukan looked concerned and thought that King Feng's body was full of wounds. So if things continued as they were, even if King Feng killed Yi Fan, King Feng would die of exhaustion. Nangong Zukan told King Feng to stop because there was no point in dying that way, and she told him that maybe there was another solution. Calling Yi Fan a bastard, King Feng told Nangong Zukan that Yi Fan killed his family members, so he had to take revenge on him. King Feng told Nangong Zukan to tell him what other solution she was talking about as he was about to punch Yi Fan. But suddenly, right before his fist hit Yi Fan, King Feng stopped, but his punch was so powerful that even if he stopped, it still created a strong gust of wind around them that blew Yi Fan's crown away. Nangong Zukan looked surprised. On the other hand, Yi Fan was trembling, and tears rolled down his face while he wondered why King Feng stopped. King Feng said that he thought there was a way, and he realized there was a way, of course. Yi Fan was surprised when King Feng told him he wouldn't kill him, but with a threatening look, King Feng told him he had to do what he was told. A few moments later, in a cave, someone told King Feng they would do whatever he said. It was Yi Fan. His life passed in front of his eyes, and he was extremely drained, trembling as he asked King Feng if he would keep him alive while swearing to him. King Feng immediately told him to go away, and Yi Fan did so immediately, which made Nangong Zukan wonder if King Feng had forgiven Yi Fan. The Qin family members were lying on straw on the ground, and Nangong Zukan seemed concerned about them. Nangong Zukan was puzzled when King Feng started moving towards the Qin family members. While King Feng was wondering if the Qin family members were still alive, Nangong Zukan asked him if his wounds were bleeding again. But King Feng did not answer her, he thanked her instead. Droplets of water fell to the ground as King Feng told Nangong Zukan that it was her words that reminded him that maybe he could use Yi Fan's method. Nangong Zukan was surprised. King Feng was crying his heart out as he said that it could only save the lives of his family members for at least one day. But that was pretty good, so he thanked her. Nangong Zukan was taken aback when she saw that King Feng was crying for his family members, and she thought that she had witnessed the deaths of many family members since childhood until she gradually became indifferent to the lives and deaths of her family members. But King Feng was different. As she watched King Feng mourn, she thought that he seemed to really care about his family members. King Feng asked Nangong Zukan if he could request her to take care of his family members for just one day. Instead of responding to him, Nangong Zukan asked King Feng what he was planning to do. King Feng then informed her that he was going to the Endless Sea of Flowers. Nangong Zukan was surprised when she heard about the Endless Sea of Flowers, and she immediately warned King Feng not to go there. She explained that the place was very dangerous because it was so forbidden that not even the royal family dared to go there. However, King Feng told Nangong Zukan that he had a reason to go there, and in any case, his friends were in her care. Nangong Zukan tried to dissuade him but to no avail. King Feng appeared resolute as he believed there were legendary medicinal materials in the endless sea of flowers that he needed to find within one day. He intended to use those materials to make medicine to treat Qin Fanjong and the others. Nangong Zukan could only watch as King Feng walked away, and King Feng believed it was the only way to save everyone. A few moments later, in another part of the wasteland, some of the royal guards found Yi Fan. They quickly approached him and, upon seeing his condition, were concerned. They inquired about how he had ended up in that state. Instead of answering their question, Yi Fan instructed them to come closer. One of the guards was surprised when Yi Fan swiftly seized him and expressed his gratitude. The guard was immediately drained of his life and turned into a completely shriveled corpse. Yi Fan's vitality was restored, and he was able to stand up again. He realized that, since he couldn't defeat King Feng directly, he had to eliminate him through cunning means. Yi Fan informed his guards that there was someone trying to implement a plan to eliminate them. He insisted they must act preemptively and eliminate him first, and the guards agreed without question. Meanwhile, in another part of the wasteland, there was an area shielded by a dome of golden aura. Another cultivator was present, engaged in battle with some thorn monsters. He retreated onto one of the tree branches, remarking that as the number one young man in the Bai family, he never imagined facing such a challenge. It was Bai Ling of the Bai family, and he mentioned that he never imagined being unable to defeat the Rosemary monster. Suddenly, Bai Ling noticed the arrival of someone. 
It was King Feng, who was striding powerfully and appeared to be in a hurry. Bai Lang recognized him and confirmed if he was the young man named King Feng whom he had seen at the auction. King Feng said nothing, and Bai Lang wondered if he came there to try to get the Rosemary Monster's heart too. Bai Lang wondered if King Feng ignored him, and he told him to back off, otherwise, the Rosemary Monsters would attack him. As the Rosemary Monsters charged towards King Feng, Bai Lang warned King Feng that he should get back before he died because even he couldn't get those monsters. But King Feng simply grabbed one of the Rosemary Monsters by its neck, and he called them monsters. Bai Lang looked so confused at what he just saw. King Feng slammed one of the Rosemary Monsters into the ground, and he asked if it didn't know that he was in a hurry. The other Rosemary Monsters froze, and they were both surprised and confused at what they just saw. King Feng grabbed two more Rosemary Monsters, and he addressed whoever would try to get in his way. He slammed the faces of the two Rosemary Monsters together fiercely. King Feng glared, and he said that it would be the end of those who would try to get in his way. The other Rosemary Monsters just stood there as King Feng killed the others and dropped them on the ground with his bloody hands. Bai Lang was surprised at what he saw, and he thought that King Feng didn't just kill three Rosemary Monsters in one move. There was also something in his aura. The rest of the Rosemary Monsters made way for King Feng with some of them even kneeling, and Bai Lang was surprised to see that King Feng scared the Rosemary Monsters. King Feng stood in front of a giant golden seal. Bai Lang was alarmed, and he told King Feng not to touch it because it was a toxic formation that was impossible to hack. As King Feng continued to stand in front of the formation with the Rosemary Monsters watching behind him, Bai Lang warned him that a level 4 alchemy master and his men once tried to break the formation but they all turned into Rosemary Monsters. As King Feng touched the formation, he was surprised that no one succeeded in breaking through that formation over 100,000 years ago. He commanded it to open. As King Feng extended his arms, the formation started to dissolve. As Bai Lang continued to watch, he was blinded by the bright light emitted by the formation, and he couldn't believe that King Feng was able to break the formation. King Feng walked inside the endless sea of flowers, and Bai Lang thought that it was something that even a level 4 alchemist couldn't do, so he wondered who King Feng really was. A few moments later, King Feng continued to walk inside the endless sea of flowers, and he thought that legend had it that at the end of the endless sea of flowers, there were rare medicinal herbs, and he thought that the end of the endless sea of flowers should be in that place. He looked hopeful as he thought that as soon as he obtained the necessary herbs, he would make a cure for Kin Fen and the others. But King Feng was horrified when he saw that there was only an empty patch at the end of the endless sea of flowers. He frantically looked around, and he couldn't believe that there was nothing. King Feng ran around in a panic as he thought about what would happen to Kin Fanjong and the others if there were no medicinal herbs there. King Feng refused to believe it, and he thought that it was impossible, so he had to find the herbs. But suddenly, his feet were caught in thorny vines. In a blink of an eye, King Feng's entire body was now wrapped in thorny vines. He was captured, and he wondered what it was. He wondered if those plants really moved and if it was the Ding Tao formation. Suddenly, a voice spoke, called him a thief, and reprimanded him for daring to break into the endless sea of flowers, which made King Feng wonder if the voice could be the voice of the endless sea of flowers. King Feng respectfully and honestly told the voice that he entered the endless sea of flowers to find medicinal herbs to save his friends. The voice laughed, calling King Feng brave, and the voice told him that if he said that his greed prompted him to enter there, he would have believed him, but using a lame excuse like saving people was ridiculous. But King Feng told the voice that he really wanted to save his friends, so if he gave him the necessary medicinal herbs, he would do anything he wanted, and the voice was amused, questioning if he really wanted to do anything to save his friends. The voice asked King Feng if he were willing to sacrifice his life and die for them, and King Feng was surprised that the voice wanted him to sacrifice his life. King Feng hesitated, and he said that it couldn't be. The voice laughed and said that he sure would like to save people, but he didn't dare to sacrifice himself, so it seemed that all he wanted to offer was empty talk to his friends. The thorny vines placed King Feng on the ground and let him go as the voice said that aside from the topic of the medicinal herbs and the endless sea of flowers, he thought that King Feng was very talented since he was able to enter that place, so he wouldn't kill him, and he told King Feng to go back. But to the voice's surprise, King Feng grabbed one of the thorny vines and said that he wouldn't go back. He explained that what he said did not mean that he wouldn't sacrifice his life for his friends, but rather, he meant that if he died, no one else would be able to save them. King Feng seemed to resemble his old self before he died with his determined eyes, and he said that he was the only one in that world who could save them, so his survival was important. 
He told the voice that if he didn't believe him, he could put his poison into his body, but he would have to wait until he finished treating his comrades. He could kill him as he wished. The voice was taken aback, the thorny vines froze, and the voice asked King Feng if he really thought that he couldn't cure his friends. The thorny vines charged towards King Feng, and the voice said that in order to verify whether King Feng was truly willing to die for his family members, he would inject him with a combination of cedar and animal poison, and if King Feng had no regrets about injecting the poison, he would give him the medicinal herbs to save his friends. The thorny vines wrapped around King Feng's neck, and the voice warned King Feng about finding an ounce of regret about the situation in him. King Feng was completely wrapped in the thorny vine at the moment, and the voice told him that he would kill him if that were the case. King Feng smiled bitterly as he thought that he didn't expect that it would happen after being reborn into that life. As the thorny vine was about to inject the poison into him, King Feng wondered if he would end up turning into the rosemary monster. He accepted his fate, and he thought that at least he could cure everyone before he became a rosemary monster. As the thorny vine that was about to inject poison into him got closer, King Feng smiled as he thought that it was what made him satisfied. Suddenly, the thorny vines disappeared, and everything turned white. The thorny vines were gone, and King Feng was now surrounded by an endless sea of flowers. King Feng was surprised, and he wondered why the rosemary vines and the barren land disappeared. Suddenly, the voice laughed with a lighter tone than before. He called King Feng his dear friend as he congratulated him for passing the test, and he told King Feng that, in fact, everything he saw before was just illusions, and what he was currently seeing was the true endless sea of flowers. The voice told King Feng that he did not expect him to actually accept death for his friends, and he did not see a trace of remorse in his heart, so he truly admired him. The voice revealed that he was the spirit of the owner of the endless sea of flowers, and in order to prevent evil people from taking over the endless sea of flowers, he had been performing that test for a hundred thousand years. King Feng was surprised when the voice told him that the one who successfully passed the test and entered the endless sea of flowers finally came so he could take whatever he wanted. King Feng thanked the voice, and he wondered if he had fallen into the delusion without realizing it, which made him hallucinate, so he realized that it seemed that the power of the endless sea of flowers' owner could not be underestimated. King Feng started picking up herbs, and he was amazed as high-level medicinal herbs were everywhere there. He said that he had obtained the herbs needed to make an antidote for Qin Fanjiang and the others, so all he needed to do was build a simple stove to prepare it. King Feng was suddenly surprised when something started to emerge from the ground behind him, and the voice laughed, calling King Feng his little friend and saying that he could help him. A stove emerged from the ground, and the voice told King Feng to take it with him. King Feng was amazed as he asked if it was a ground-level chemical stove. King Feng thought that the chemistry stoves were divided into four levels, sky, earth, black, and yellow, and the highest level stove in the Qin family had never exceeded the yellow level. So by using that ground stove, the quality of the antidote would be greatly improved, so he would definitely be able to cure Qin Fanjiang and the others. King Feng immediately showed his respects to the voice and thanked him, saying that he would never forget his kindness. The voice laughed and told King Feng to never mind it, he said that he would let him finish his work and that he would see him later. Meanwhile, Bai Leng was still stuck on the tree branch. He thought that King Feng hadn't come out yet, so he thought he was probably dead and let out a sigh, thinking about how young men didn't listen to advice. Suddenly, Bai Leng was startled by something, and he wondered what it was. He looked terrified as he started to recognize what he saw. Bai Leng recognized that it was a tide of monsters. On the other hand, on the border of the Westland, someone was excited and wondered who would win the competition. It was the head of the Yi family, and the head of the Sidhu family immediately told him that it must be the Yi family that would win. But the head of the Yi family said that, in his opinion, it didn't matter who got first place, as he just hoped that everyone could come back safely while Qin Jan stood silently beside them. Suddenly, someone rushed toward the carriages and exclaimed that something was happening in the wastelands. Qin Jan was alarmed. It was one of the royal guards, and he said that there was a tide of monsters in the wetland, and all the members of the families died there. Qin Jan was surprised, along with the heads of the Yi family and the Sidhu family. Meanwhile, out of the endless sea of flowers, the tide of monsters was still on a rampage, and Bai Leng cursed as he pointed out that there was a huge tide of monsters, and he wondered if he was going to die there. Suddenly, King Feng came out of the formation that had protected the endless sea of flowers, and Bai Leng was surprised. Bai Leng immediately warned King Feng to stop and not go out because there was a very large tide of monsters, so if he went out, he would be eliminated. But King Feng told him that he could not stop. He charged forward with his fist and said that his friends were waiting for him. 
King Feng released a powerful aura from his fist, and it cleared a path in front of him. The monsters screamed as they were sent flying in the air. Bai Lang was greatly surprised. He saw King Feng move from one monster to another, quickly eliminating them, and he thought that it seemed that King Feng was actually the true monster tide. As King Feng continued to move forward, Bai Lang couldn't believe that King Feng fought his way through the monsters. 